Harper Audio presents Warriors of the Storm by Bernard Cornwell, read by Matt Bates. Part One, Flames on the River. Chapter One. There was fire in the night, fire that seared the sky and paled the stars, fire that churned thick smoke across the land between the rivers. Finnan woke me. Trouble, was all he said. Edith stirred, and I pushed her away from me. Stay there, I told her, and rolled out from under the fleeces. I fumbled for a bearskin cloak and pulled it around my shoulders before following Finnan into the street. There was no moon, just the flames reflecting from the great pall of smoke that drifted inland on the night wind. We need more men on the walls, I said. Done it, Finnan said. So all that was left for me to do was curse. I cursed. It's Brunnenburg, Finnan said bleakly, and I cursed again. Folk were gathering in Chester's main street. Edith had come from the house, wrapped in a great cloak and with her red hair shining in the light of the lanterns that burned at the church door. What is it? She asked sleepily. Brunnenburg, Finnan said grimly. Edith made the sign of the cross. I had a glimpse of her naked body as her hand slipped from beneath the cloak to touch her forehead. Then she clutched the heavy woolen cloth tight to her belly again. Loki. I spoke the name aloud. He is the god of fire, whatever the Christians might tell you. And Loki is the most slippery of all the gods, a trickster who deceives, charms, betrays, and hurts us. Fire is his two-edged weapon that can warm us, cook for us, scorch us, or kill us. I touched Thor's hammer that hung from my neck. Ethel stands there, I said. If he lives, Finnan said. There was nothing to be done in the darkness. The journey to Brunnenburg took at least two hours on horseback and would take longer in this dark night when we would be stumbling through woods and possibly riding into an ambush set by the men who had fired the distant burr. All I could do was watch from Chester's walls in case an attack burst from the dawn. I did not fear such an attack. Chester had been built by the Romans, and it was as tough a fortress as any in Britain. The Northmen would need to cross a flooded ditch and put ladders against the high stone walls, and Northmen have ever been reluctant to attack fortresses. But Brunnenburg was aflame, so who knew what unlikely things the dawn might bring? Brunnenburg was our newest burr, built by Ethelfled who ruled over Mercia, and it guarded the river Mercy, which offered the Northmen's boats an easy route into central Britain. In years past, the Mercy had been busy, the oars dipping and pulling, and the dragon-headed boats surging against the river's current to bring new warriors to the unending struggle between the Northmen and the Saxons, but Brunnenburg had stopped that traffic. We kept a fleet of twelve ships there, their crews protected by Brunnenburg's thick timber walls, and the Northmen had learned to fear those ships. Now, if they landed on Britain's west coast, they went to Wales, or else to Cumberland, which was the fierce, wild country north of the Mercy. Except tonight. Tonight... There were flames by the mercy. Get dressed, I told Edith. There would be no more sleep this night. She touched the emerald-encrusted cross at her neck. Ethelston, she said softly as if she prayed for him while fingering the cross. She had become fond of Ethelston. He either lives or is dead, I said curtly, and we won't know till the dawn. We rode just before the dawn, rode north in the wolf-light, following the paved road through the shadowed cemetery of Roman dead. I took sixty men, all mounted on fast light horses, 
so that if we ran into an army of howling Northmen we could flee. I sent scouts ahead, but we were in a hurry, so there was no time for our normal precaution, which was to wait for the scouts' reports before we rode on. Our warning this time would be the death of the scouts. We left the Roman road to follow the track we had made through the woods. Cloud had come from the west, and a drizzle was falling, but still the smoke rose ahead of us. Rain might extinguish Loki's fire, but not drizzle, and the smoke mocked and beckoned us. Then we came from the woods to where the fields turned into mudflats, and the mudflats merged with the river, and there, far to our west on that wide stretch of silver-grey water, was a fleet. Twenty, thirty ships, maybe more. It was impossible to tell, because they were moored so close together. But even from far away I could see that their prows were decorated with the Northmen's beasts, with eagles, dragons, serpents, and wolves. Sweet God! Finnan said, appalled. We hurried now, following a cattle track that meandered along higher ground on the river's southern bank. The wind was in our faces, gusting suddenly to send ripples scurrying across the Mercy. We still could not see Brunnenburg because the fort lay beyond a wooded rise, but a sudden movement at the wood's edge betrayed the presence of men, and my two scouts turned their horses and galloped back towards us, Whoever had alarmed them had vanished into the thick spring leaves, and a moment later a horn sounded, the noise mournful in the grey, damp dawn. "'It's not the fort burning,' Finnan said uncertainly. Instead of answering, I swerved inland off the track onto the lush pasture. The two scouts came close, their horses' hooves hurling up clods of damp earth. "'The remain in the trees, Lord!' one shouted, at least a score, probably more, and ready for a fight, the other reported. Ready for a fight? Fennan asked. Shields, helmets, weapons, the second man explained. I led my sixty men southwards. The belt of young woodland stood like a barrier between us and Brunnenburg, and if an enemy waited, then they would surely be barring the track. If we followed the track, we could ride straight into their shield wall hidden among the trees, but by cutting inland, I would force them to move, to lose their order, and so I quickened the pace, kicking my horse into a canter. My son rode up on my left side. It's not the fort burning, he shouted. The smoke was thinning. It still rose beyond the trees, a smear of grey that melted into the low clouds, it seemed to be coming from the river, and I suspected Finnan and my son were right, that it was not the fort burning, but rather the ships. Our ships. But how had an enemy reached those ships? If they had come by daylight, they would have been seen, and the fort's defenders would have manned the boats and challenged the enemy, while coming by night seemed impossible. The Mercy was shallow and barred with mudbanks, and no shipmaster could hope to bring a vessel this far inland in the dark of a moonless night. It's not the fort, Uhtred called to me again. He made it sound like good news, but my fear was that the fort had fallen, and its stout timber walls now protected a horde of Northmen. Why should they burn what they could easily defend? The ground was rising. I could see no enemy in the trees. That did not mean they were not there. How many enemy? Thirty ships? That could easily be a thousand men, and those men must have known that we would ride from Chester. If I had been the enemy's leader, I would be waiting just beyond the trees, and that suggested I should slow our advance and send the scouts ahead again. But instead I kicked the horse. My shield was on my back, and I left it there, just loosening serpent breath in her scabbard. I was angry and I was careless, but instinct told me that no enemy waited just beyond the woodland. They might have been waiting on the track, but by swerving inland I had given them little time to reform a shield wall on the higher ground. 
The belt of trees still hid what lay beyond, and I turned the horse and rode west again. I plunged into the leaves, ducked under a branch, let the horse pick its own way through the wood, and then I was through the trees, and I hauled on the reins, slowing, watching, stopping. No enemy. My men crashed through the undergrowth and stopped behind me. Thank Christ, Benin said. The fort had not been taken. The white horse of Mercia still flew above the ramparts, and with it was Ethelfled's goose flag. A third banner hung from the walls, a new banner I had ordered made by the women of Chester. It showed the dragon of Wessex, and the dragon was holding a lightning bolt in one raised claw. It was Prince Ethelston's symbol. The boy had asked to have a Christian cross on his flag, but I had ordered the lightning bolt embroidered there instead. I called Ethelston a boy, but he was a man now, fourteen or fifteen years old. He had grown tall, and his boyish mischief had been tempered by experience. There were men who wanted Ethelston dead, and he knew it, and so his eyes had become watchful. He was handsome, too, or so Edith told me, those watchful grey eyes set in a strong-boned face beneath hair black as a raven's wing. I called him Prince Ethelston, while those men who wanted him dead called him a bastard. And many folk believed their lies, Ethelston had been born to a pretty Kentish girl who had died whelping him, but his father was Edward, son of King Alfred and now King of Wessex himself. Edward had since married a West Saxon girl and fathered another son, which made Ethelston an inconvenience, especially as it was rumoured that in truth he was not a bastard at all because Edward had secretly married the girl from Kent. True or not, and I had good cause to know the story of the first marriage was entirely true, it did not matter because to many in his father's kingdom, Ethelstan was the unwanted son. He had not been raised in Winchester like Edward's other children, but sent to Mercia. Edward professed to like the boy, but ignored him, and in truth, Ethelstan was an embarrassment. He was the king's eldest son, an Etheling, but he had a younger half-brother whose vengeful mother wanted Ethelston dead because he stood between her son and the throne of Wessex. But I liked Ethelston. I liked him enough to want him to reach the throne that was his birthright, but to be king, he first needed to learn a man's responsibilities, and so I had given him command of the fort and of the fleet at Brunnenburg. And now the fleet was gone. It was burned. The hulls were smoking beside the charred remnants of the pier we had spent a year building. We had driven elm pilings deep into the foreshore and thrust the walkway out past the low water mark to make a wharf where a battle fleet could be ever ready. Now the wharf was gone, along with the sleek, high prowed ships. Four of those ships had been stranded above the tide mark and were still smouldering. The rest were just blackened ribs in the shallow water, while, at the pier's end, three dragon-headed ships lay moored against the scorched pilings. Five more ships lay just beyond, using their oars to hold the hulls against the river's current and the ebbing tide. The rest of the enemy fleet was a half-mile upriver. And ashore... Between us and the burned wharf were men, men in mail, men with shields and helmets, men with spears and swords. There were perhaps two hundred of them, and they had herded what few cattle they could find and were pushing the beasts towards the river bank, where they were being slaughtered so the flesh could be carried away. I glanced at the fort. Ethelston commanded a hundred and fifty men there, and I could see them thick on the ramparts, but he was making no attempt to impede the enemy's retreat. Let's kill some of the bastards, I said. Lord? 
Finnan asked, wary of the enemy's greater number. They'll run, I said. They want the safety of their ships, they don't want a fight on land. I drew serpent breath. The Norsemen who had come ashore were all on foot, and they were scattered. Most were close to the burned wharf's landward end where they could quickly form a shield wall, but dozens of others were struggling with the cattle. I aimed for those men. And I was angry. I commanded the garrison at Chester, and Brunnenburg was a part of that garrison. It was an outlying fort, and it had been surprised, and its ships had been burned, and I was angry. I wanted blood in the dawn. I kissed Serpent Breath's hilt, then struck back with my spurs, and we went down that shallow slope at the full gallop, our swords drawn and spears reaching. I wished I'd brought a spear, but it was too late for regrets. The cattle herders saw us and tried to run, but they were on the mudflats and the cattle were panicking and our hooves were loud on the dew-wet turf. The largest group of enemy was making a shield wall where the charred remains of the pier reached dry land, but I had no intention of fighting them. I want prisoners, I bellowed at my men. I want prisoners! One of the Northmen's ships started for the beach, either to reinforce the men ashore or to offer them an escape. A thousand white birds rose from the grey water, calling and shrieking, circling above the pasture where the shield wall had formed. I saw a banner raised above the locked shields, but I had no time to look at that standard because my horse thundered across the track, down the bank, and onto the foreshore. Prisoners! I shouted again. I passed a slaughtered bullock, its blood thick and black on the mud. The men had started to butcher it but had fled, and then I was among those fugitives and I used the flat of Serpent Breath's blade to knock one man down. I turned. My horse slipped in the mud, reared, and as he came down I used his weight to drive Serpent Breath into a second man's chest. The blade pierced his shoulder, drove deep. Blood bubbled at his mouth and I kicked the stallion so he would drag the heavy blade free of the dying man. Finnan went past me, then my son galloped by, holding his sword Ravenbeak low and bending from the saddle to plunge it into a running man's back. A wild-eyed Norseman swung an axe at me, which I avoided easily. Then Berg Scalagrimison's spear blade went through the man's spine, through his guts, and showed bright and blood-streaked at his belly. Berg was riding bareheaded, his fair hair, long as a woman's, was hung with knuckle-bones and ribbons. He grinned at me as he let go of the spear's ash pole and drew his sword. I ruined his mail, lord. I want prisoners, Berg. I kill some bastards first, yes? He spurred away, still grinning. He was a Norse warrior, maybe eighteen or nineteen summers old, but he had already rowed a ship to Horn on the island of fire and ice that lay far off in the Atlantic, and he had fought in Ireland, in Scotland and in Wales, and he had stories of rowing inland through forests of birch trees, which he claimed grew east of the Norseman's land. There were frost giants there, he told me, and wolves the size of stallions. I should have died a thousand times, Lord, he told me. But he was only alive now because I had saved his life. He had become my man, sworn to me, and in my service he took the head from a fugitive with one swing of his sword. Ya! Yeah! he bellowed back to me. I sharpen the blade good! Finnan was close to the water's edge close enough that a man on the approaching ship hurled a spear at him. The weapon stuck in the mud, and Finnan contemptuously bent from the saddle to seize the shaft, and spurred to where a man lay fallen and bleeding in the mud. He looked back to the ship, making sure he was being watched, then raised the spear ready to plunge the blade into the wounded man's belly. Then he paused, and, to my surprise, tossed the spear away. He dismounted and knelt by the wounded man, 
talked for a moment, and then stood. Prisoners, he shouted. We need prisoners. A horn sounded from the fort, and I turned to see men pouring out of Brunnenburg's gate. They came with shields, spears, and swords, ready to make a wall that would drive the enemy's shield wall into the river. But those invaders were already leaving and needed no help from us. They were wading past the charred pilings and edging around the smoking boats to clamber aboard the nearest ships. The approaching ship paused, churning the shallows with its oars, reluctant to face my men, who called insults to them and waited at the river's edge with drawn swords and bloodied spears. More of the enemy waded out towards the dragon-headed boats. Let them be, I shouted. I had wanted blood in the dawn, but there was no advantage in slaughtering a handful of men in the mercy shallows and losing maybe a dozen myself. The enemy's main fleet, which had to contain hundreds more men, was already rowing upriver. To weaken it, I needed to kill those hundreds, not just a few. The crews of the nearer ships were jeering at us. I watched as men were hauled aboard, and I wondered where this fleet had come from. It had been years since I had seen so many northern ships. I kicked my horse to the water's edge. A man held a spear, but it fell short, and I deliberately sheathed serpent breath to show the enemy I accepted that the fight was over, and I saw a grey-bearded man strike the elbow of a youth who wanted to throw another spear. I nodded to the grey beard, who raised a hand in acknowledgement. So who were they? The prisoners would tell us soon enough, and we had taken almost a score of men who were now being stripped of their mail, helmets and valuables. Finnan was kneeling by the wounded man again, talking to him, and I kicked my horse towards him, then stopped, astonished, because Finnan had stood and was now pissing on the man who struck feebly at his tormentor with a gloved hand. Finnan, I called. He ignored me. He spoke to his prisoner in his own Irish tongue, and the man answered angrily in the same language. Finnan laughed, then seemed to curse the man, chanting words brutally and distinctly, and holding his outspread fingers towards the piss-soaked face as though casting a spell. I reckoned that whatever happened was none of my business, and I looked back to the ships at the end of the ruined wharf just in time to see the enemy's standard-bearer climb aboard the last remaining high-proud vessel. The man was in mail, and had a hard time pulling himself over the ship's side until he handed up his banner and held up both arms so he could be hauled aboard by two other warriors. And I recognised the banner, and I hardly dared believe what I saw. Haston. Haston. If this world ever contained one worthless, treacherous, slime-coated piece of human dung, then it was Haston. I had known him for a lifetime. Indeed, I had saved his miserable life, and he had sworn loyalty to me, clasping his hands about mine, which, in turn, were clasped about Serpent Breath's hilt and he had wept tears of gratitude as he vowed to be my man, to defend me, to serve me, and in return to receive my gold, my loyalty, and within months he had broken the oath and was fighting against me. He had sworn peace with Alfred, and had broken that oath too. He had led armies to ravage Wessex and Mercia, until finally, at Beamfliot, I had cornered his men and turned the creeks and marshes dark with their blood. We had filled ditches with his dead. The ravens had gorged themselves that day. But Haston had escaped. He always escaped. He had lost his army, but not his cunning. And he had come again. This time in the service of Sigurd Thorson and Knut Ranulfsson and they had died in another slaughter, 
But once again, Haston had slipped away. Now he was back, and his banner was a bleached skull mounted on a pole. It mocked me from the nearest ship, which was now rowing away. The men aboard called insults, and the standard bearer waved the skull from side to side. Beyond that ship was a larger one, proud with a great dragon that reared its fanged mouth high, and at the ship's stern I could see a cloaked man wearing a silver helmet, crowned with black raven's wings. He took the helmet off and gave me a mocking bow, and I saw that it was Haston. He was laughing. He had burned my boats and had stolen a few cattle, and for Haston that was victory enough. It was not revenge for Biemflot. He would need to kill me and all my men to balance that bloody scale, but he had made us look fools, and he had opened the mercy to a great fleet of Northmen who now rode upriver. A fleet of enemies who came to take our land, led by Haston. How can a bastard like Haston leads so many men? I asked aloud. He doesn't. My son had walked his horse into the shallows and reined in beside me. He doesn't. Ranyal Iverson leads them. I said nothing, but felt a chill pass through me. Ranyal Iverson was a name I knew, a name we all knew, a name that had spread fear up and down the Irish Sea, he was a Norseman who called himself the Sea King, for his lands were scattered wherever the wild waves beat on rock or sand. He ruled where the seals swam and the puffins flew, where the winds howled and where ships were wrecked, where the cold bit like a knife and the souls of drowned men moaned in the darkness. His men had captured the wild islands off Scotland, had bitten land from the coast of Ireland, and enslaved folk in Wales and on the Isle of Man. It was a kingdom without borders, for whenever an enemy became too strong, Raniel's men took to their longships and sailed to another wild coast. They had raided the shores of Wessex, taking away slaves and cattle, and had even rowed up the Severn to threaten Gloucester, though the walls of that fortress had daunted them. Raniel Everson. I had never met him, but I knew him. I knew his reputation. No man sailed a ship better. No man fought more fiercely. No man was held in more fear. He was a savage, a pirate, a wild king of nowhere. And my daughter, Stiora, had married his brother. And Haston has sworn loyalty to Raniel, my son went on. He watched the ships pull away. Raniel Everson, he still gazed at the fleet as he spoke, has given up his Irish land. He's told his men that fate has granted him Britain instead. Aston was a nothing, I thought. He was a rat allied to a wolf, a ragged sparrow perched on an eagle's shoulder. Raniel has abandoned his Irish land. I asked. So the man said. My son gestured to where the prisoners stood. I grunted. I knew little of what happened in Ireland, but over the last few years there had come news of Northmen being harried out of that land. Ships had crossed the sea with survivors of grim fights, and men who had thought to take land in Ireland now sought it in Cumberland or on the Welsh coast, and some went even further to Neustria or Frankia. Raniel's powerful, I said. Why would he just abandon Ireland? Because the Irish persuaded him to leave. Persuaded? My son shrugged. They have sorcerers, Christian sorcerers who see the future. They said Raniel will be king of all Britain if he leaves Ireland, and they gave him warriors to help. He nodded at the fleet. There are one hundred Irish warriors on those ships. King of all Britain. That's what the prisoner said. I spat. 
Raniel was not the first man to dream of ruling the whole island. How many men does he have? Twelve hundred. You're sure of that? My son smiled. You taught me well, father. What did I teach you? That a spear point in a prisoner's liver is a very persuasive thing. I watched the last boats row eastwards. They would be lost to sight soon. Bead wolf! I shouted. He was a small, wiry man, whose face was decorated with inked lines in Danish fashion, though Beardwolf himself was a Saxon. He was one of my best scouts, a man who could cross open grassland like a ghost. I nodded at the disappearing ships. Take a dozen men, I told Beardwolf, and follow the bastards. I want to know where they land. Lord, he said, and started to turn away. And Beardwolf, I called, and he looked back. Try to see what banners are on the ships, I told him, and look for a red axe. If you see a red axe, I want to know fast. The red axe, Lord, he repeated, and sped away. The red axe was the symbol of C. Trigger Everson, my daughter's husband. Men now called him Seatrigger One Eye because I had taken his right eye with a tip of serpent breath. He had attacked Chester and been beaten away, but in his defeat he had taken Stiora with him. She had not gone as a captive, but as a lover, and once in a while I would hear news of her. She and Seatrigger possessed land in Ireland, and she wrote letters to me because I had made her learn writing and reading. We ride horses on the sand, she had written, and across the hills. It is beautiful here. They hate us. She had a daughter, my first grandchild, and she had called the daughter Gisela after her own mother. Gisela is beautiful, she wrote, and the Irish priests curse us. At night they scream their curses and sound like wild birds dying. I love this place. My husband sends you greetings. Men had always reckoned that Trigger was the more dangerous of the two brothers. He was said to be cleverer than Raniel, and his skill with a sword was legendary, but the loss of his eye, or perhaps his marriage to Stiora, had calmed him. Rumour said that Trigger was content to farm his fields, fish his seas, and defend his lands. But would he stay content? if his older brother was capturing Britain. That was why I had told Beardwolf to look for the red axe. I wanted to know if my daughter's husband had become my enemy. Prince Ethelstan found me as the last of the enemy ships vanished from sight. He came with a half-dozen companions, all of them mounted on big stallions. Lord, he called, I'm sorry. I waved him to silence, my attention with Finnan again. He was chanting in fury at the man who lay wounded at his feet, and the wounded man was shouting back, and I did not need to speak any of the strange Irish tongue to know that they exchanged curses. I had rarely seen Finnan so angry. He was spitting, ranting, chanting, his rhythmic words heavy as hammer blows. Those words beat down his opponent, who already wounded, seemed to weaken under the assault of insults. Men stared at the two, awed by their anger. Then Finnan turned and snatched up the spear he had thrown aside. He stalked back to his victim, spoke more words, then touched the crucifix about his neck. Then, as if he were a priest raising the host, he lifted the spear in both hands, the blade pointing downwards, and held it high. He paused, then spoke in English. May God forgive me, he said. Then he rammed the spear down hard, screaming with the effort to thrust the blade through the mail and bone to the heart within. And the man leapt under the spear's blow, and blood welled from his mouth, and his arms and legs flailed for a few dying heartbeats, 
and then there were no more heartbeats, and he was dead, open-mouthed, pinned to the shore's edge with a spear that had gone clean through his heart into the soil beneath. Finnan was weeping. I urged my horse near him and stooped to touch his shoulder. He was my friend, my oldest friend, my companion of a hundred shield walls. Finnan? I asked, but he did not look at me. Finnan, I said again. And this time he did look up at me, and there were tears on his cheeks and misery in his eyes. I think he was my son, he said. He was what? I asked, aghast. Son or nephew? I don't know. Christ help me, I don't know. But I killed him. He walked away. I'm sorry, Ethelston said again, sounding as miserable as Finnan. He stared at the smoke drifting slow above the river. They came in the night, he said, and we didn't know until we saw the flames. I'm sorry, I failed you. Don't be a fool, I snarled. You couldn't stop that fleet. I waved towards the bend in the river where the last of the Sea King's ships had disappeared behind a stand of trees. One of our burning ships gave a lurch, and there was a hiss as steam thickened the smoke. I wanted to fight them, Ethelston said. Then you're a damned fool, I retorted. He frowned, then gestured towards the burning ships and at the butchered carcass of a bullock. I wanted to stop this, he said. Choose your battles, I said harshly. You were safe behind your walls, so why lose men? You couldn't stop the fleet. Besides, they wanted you to come out and fight them, and it isn't sensible to do what the enemy wants. That's what I told him, Lord, Radwald put in. Radwald was an older Mercian, a cautious man who I had posted in Brunnenburg to advise Ethelston. The prince commanded the garrison, but he was young, and so I had given him a half-dozen older and wiser men to keep him from making youth's mistakes. They wanted us to come out, Ethelston asked, puzzled. Where would they rather fight you? I asked. With you behind walls, or out in the open, shield wall to shield wall? I told him that, Lord, Radwald said. I ignored him. Choose your battles, I snarled at Ethelston. That space between your ears was given so that you can think. If you just charge wherever you see an enemy, you'll earn yourself an early grave. That's, Radwald began, that's what you told him. I know, now be quiet. I gazed upstream at the empty river. Raniel had brought an army to Britain, but what would he do with that army? He needed land to feed his men. He needed fortresses to protect them. He had passed Brunnenburg, but was he planning to double back and attack Chester? The Roman walls made that city a fine base, but also a formidable obstacle. So where was he going? But that's what you did! Ethelston interrupted my thoughts. Did what? You charged the enemy! He looked indignant. Just now! You charged down the hill even though they outnumbered you! I needed prisoners, you miserable excuse for a man. I wanted to know how Raniel had come upriver in the darkness. It had either been an incredible stroke of fortune that his great fleet had negotiated the Mercy's mud banks without any ship going aground, or else he was an even greater ship handler than his reputation suggested. It had been an impressive feat of seamanship, but it had also been unnecessary. His fleet was huge, and we had only a dozen boats. He could have brushed us aside without missing an oar stroke. Yet he had decided to attack in the night. Why risk that? He didn't want us to block the channel, my son suggested. And that was probably the truth. If we had been given just a few hours' warning, we could have sunk our ships into the river's main channel. 
Raniel would still have got past eventually, but he would have been forced to wait for a high tide, and his heavier ships would have had a difficult passage, and meanwhile we would have sent messengers upriver to make sure more barricades blocked the Mercy and more men waited to greet his ships. Instead, he had slipped past us, he had wounded us, and he was already rowing inland. It was the Frisians, Ethelston said unhappily. Frisians? Three merchant ships arrived last night, Lord. They moored in the river. They were carrying pelts from Difflin. You inspected them? He shook his head. They said they carried the plague, Lord. So you didn't board them? Not with the plague, Lord, no. The garrison at Brunnenburg had the duty of inspecting every ship that entered the river, mainly to levy a tax on whatever cargo the ship carried, but no one would board a ship that had sickness aboard. They said they were carrying pelts, Lord, Ethelston explained, and they paid us their fees. And you left them alone. He nodded miserably. The prisoners told me the rest. The three merchant ships had anchored where the Mercy's channel was narrowest, the place where a fleet faced the greatest danger of running aground, and they had burned lanterns that had guided Raniel's ships past the peril. The tide had done the rest. Let a vessel drift, and it will usually follow the swiftest current in the deepest channel, and once past the three merchant ships, Raniel had simply let the flood carry him to our wharf. There he had burned both wharf and ships, so that his own vessels could now use the river safely. Reinforcements could now come from his sea kingdom. He had ripped apart our defence of the Mercy, and he was loose in Britain with an army. I let Ethelston decide what to do with the prisoners. There were fourteen of them, and Ethelston chose to have them executed. Wait for low tide, he ordered Radwald. Then tie them to the stakes. He nodded at the charred pilings that jutted at awkward angles from the swirling river. Let them drown in the rising tide. I had already sent Beardwolf eastwards, but would not expect to hear his news for at least a day. I ordered Cetric to send men south. They're to ride fast, I said, and tell the Lady Ethelfled what's happening. Tell her I want men, a lot of men, all her men. At Chester? Cetric asked. I shook my head, thinking. Tell her to send them to Licklefeld, and tell her I'm going there. I turned and pointed to Ethelston. And you're coming with me, Lord Prince, and bringing most of Brunnenburg's garrison with you, and you, I looked at Radwald, will stay here. Defend what's left. You can have fifty men. Fifty? That's not enough. Forty, I snarled, and if you lose the fort, I'll cut your kidneys out and eat them. We were at war. Finnan was at the water's edge, sitting on a great driftwood log. I sat beside him. So, tell me about that, I said, nodding at the corpse that was still fixed by the spear. What do you want to know? Whatever you choose to tell me. We sat in silence. Geese flew above us, their wings beating the morning. A flurry of rain spat past. One of the corpses farted. We're going to Licklefeld, I said. Finnan nodded. Why Licklefeld? He asked after a moment. The question was dutiful. He was not thinking about Raniel or the Norsemen or anything except the spear-pierced corpse at the river's brink. Because I don't know where Raniel's going, I said, but from Licklefeld we can go north or south easily. North or south, he repeated dully. The bastard needs land, I said, and he'll either try to take it in northern Mercia or from southern Northumbria. 
We have to stop him fast. He'll go north, Finnan said, though he still spoke carelessly. He shrugged. Why would he pick a fight with Mercia? I suspected he was right. Mercia had become powerful, its frontiers protected by burrs, fortified towns, while to the north were the troubled lands of Northumbria. That was Danish land, but the Danish lords were squabbling and fighting amongst themselves. A strong man like Raniel could unite them. I had repeatedly told Ethelfled that we should march north and take land from the fractious Danes, but she would not invade Northumbria until her brother Edward brought his West Saxon army to help. Whether Raniel goes north or comes south, I said, now is the time to fight him. He's just arrived here. He doesn't know the land. Haston does, of course, but how far does Raniel trust that piece of weasel shit? And from what the prisoners said, Raniel's army has never fought together, so we hit him hard now before he has a chance to find a refuge and before he feels safe. We do to him what the Irish did. We make him feel unwanted. Silence again. I watched the geese, looking for an omen in their numbers, but there were too many birds to count. Yet the goose was Ethelfled's symbol, so their presence was surely a good sign. I touched the hammer that hung at my neck. Fennan saw the gesture and frowned. Then he grasped the crucifix that hung at his neck, and with a sudden grimace, tugged it hard enough to break the leather cord. He looked at the silver bauble for a moment, then flung it into the water. I'm going to hell, he said. For a moment, I did not know what to say. At least we'll still be together, I finally spoke. I, he said, unsmiling. A man who kills his own blood is doomed. The Christian priests tell you that? No. Then how do you know? I just know. That was why my brother didn't kill me so long ago. He sold me to that bastard slaver instead. That was how Finnan and I had first met, chained as slaves to a bench and pulling on long oars. We still carried the slaver's brand on our skin, though the slaver himself was long dead, slaughtered by Finnan in an orgy of revenge. Why would your brother want to kill you? I asked, knowing I trod on dangerous ground. In all the long years of our friendship, I had never discovered why Finnan was an exile from his native island. He grimaced. A woman. Surprise me, I said wryly. I was married, he went on as though I had not spoken. A good woman she was, a royal daughter of the Ewing Neil, and I was a prince of my people. My brother was too. Prince Conal. Conal, I said after a few heartbeats of silence. There are small kingdoms in Ireland, he said bleakly, staring across the water. Small kingdoms and great kings, and we fight. Christ, how we love the fight. The we kneel, of course, are the great ones, at least in the north. We were their clients. We gave them tribute. We fought for them when they demanded it. We drank with them, and we married their good women. And you married a we kneel woman, I prompted him. Connell's younger than me, he said, ignoring my question. I should have been the next king, but Connell met a maid from the old Domnal. God, Lord, but she was beautiful. She was nothing by birth. She was no chieftain's daughter, but a dairy girl. And she was lovely. He spoke wistfully, his eyes gleaming wet. She had hair dark as night and eyes like stars, 
and a body as graceful as an angel in flight. And she was called? I asked. He shook his head abruptly, rejecting the question. And God help us, we fell in love. We ran away. We took horses and we rode south. Just Conal's wife and me. We thought we'd ride, we'd hide, and we'd never be found. And Conal pursued you, I guessed. The wee Neil pursued us. God knows it was a hunt. Every Christian in Ireland knew of us, knew of the gold they would make if they found us, and yes, Conal rode with the men of the wee Neil. I said nothing. I waited. Nothing is hidden in Ireland, Finnan went on. You can't hide. The little people see you. Folk see you. Find an island in a lake and they know you're there. Go to a mountain top, and they'll find you. Hide in a cave and they'll hunt you down. We should have taken ship, but we were young. We didn't know. They found you. They found us, and Conal promised he would make my life worse than death. By selling you to Sverry. Sverry was the slaver who had branded us. He nodded. I was stripped of my gold, whipped, made to crawl through Huy Neil's shit, and then sold to Sverry. I am the king that never was. And the girl? And Conal took my Huy Neil wife as his own. The priests allowed it, they encouraged it, and he raised my sons as his own. They cursed me, Lord. My own sons cursed me. That one, he nodded at the corpse, cursed me just now. I am the betrayer, the cursed. And he's your son? I asked gently. He wouldn't say. He could be. Or Conal's boy. He's my blood anyway. I walked to the dead man, put my right foot on his belly, and tugged the spear free. It was a struggle, and the corpse made an obscene sucking noise as I wrenched the wide blade out. A bloody cross lay on the dead man's chest. The priests will bury him, I said. They'll say prayers over him. I hurled the spear into the shallows and turned back to Finnan. What happened to the girl? He stared empty-eyed across the river that was smeared dark with the ash of our ships. For one day, he said, they let the warriors of the Hui Neil do as they wished with her. They made me watch. And then they were merciful, Lord. They killed her. And your brother, I said, has sent men to help Raniel. The Hui Neil sent men to help Raniel. And, yes, my brother leads them. And why would they do that? I asked. Because the Hui Neil would be kings of all the north. Of Ireland and of Scotland too. Of all the north. Raniel can have the Saxon lands. That's the agreement. He helps them. They help him. And he begins with Northumbria. Or oh, Mercia, Finnan suggested with a shrug. But they won't rest there, he went on, because they want everything. It was the ancient dream, the dream that had haunted my whole life, the dream of the Northmen to conquer all Britain. They had tried so often, and they had come so close to success, Yet still we Saxons lived, and still we fought back so that now half the island was ours again. Yet we should have lost. The Northmen were savage. They came with fury and anger, and their armies darkened the land, but they had one fatal weakness. 
they were like dogs that fought each other. And only when one dog was strongest and could snarl and bite and force the others to his bidding were the invasions dangerous. But one defeat shattered their armies. They followed a man so long as he was successful, but if that man showed weakness, they deserted in droves to find other, easier prey. And Raniel had led an army here. An army of Norsemen and Danes and Irish, and that meant Raniel had united our enemies. That made him dangerous. Except he had not whipped all the dogs to his bidding. I learned one other thing from our prisoners. See, Trigger, my daughter's husband, had refused to sail with his brother. He was still in Ireland. Beardwolf would think otherwise because he would see the flag of the Red Axe, and he would think it belonged to see Trigger, but two of the prisoners told me that the brothers shared the symbol. It was their dead father's flag, the bloody Red Axe of Eva. But see Trigger's axe, at least for the moment, was resting. Raniel's axe had chopped a bloody hole in our defences, but my son-in-law was still in Ireland. I touched my hammer and prayed he stayed there. We must go, I told Finnan, because we had to whip Raniel into defeat. And I thought we would ride east. Chapter 2 The priests came to me early next morning. There were four of them, led by the Mercian twins Cholnoth and Chilbert, who hated me. I had known them since boyhood, and had no more love for them than they had for me, but at least I could now tell them apart. For years I had never known which twin I spoke to, they were as alike as two eggs, but one of our arguments had ended with me kicking out Chulbert's teeth, so now I knew that he was the one who hissed when he spoke. He dribbled, too. "'Will you be back by Easter, Lord?' he asked me. He was being very respectful, perhaps because he still had one or two teeth left and wanted to keep them. "'No,' I said, then urged my horse forward a pace. "'Godwin, put the fish in sacks.' Yes, Lord, Godwin called back. Godwin was my servant, and he and three other men had been rolling barrels from one of Chester's storehouses. The barrels were filled with smoked fish, and the men were trying to make rope slings that would let each packhorse carry two barrels. Godwin frowned. Do we have sacks, Lord? There are twenty-two sacks of fleeces in my storeroom, I told him. Tell my steward to empty them. I looked back to Father Chilbert. We won't get all the wool out of the sacks, I told him, and some of the wool will stick to the fish and then get caught in our teeth. I smiled at him. If we have teeth. How many men will be left to defend Chester? His brother asked sternly. Eighty, I said. Eighty? And half of those are sick, I added, so you'll have forty fit men and the rest will be cripples. It isn't enough, he protested. Of course it isn't enough, I snarled, but I need an army to finish off Raniel. Chester will have to take its chances. But if the heathens come, Father Wissian suggested nervously. The heathens won't know how big the garrison is, I said, but they will know how strong the walls are. Leaving so few men here is a risk, but it's a risk I'm taking. And you'll have men from the feared... Godwin, use the sacks for the bread, too. I was taking just over three hundred men, leaving behind barely enough troops to defend the ramparts of Chester and Brunnenburg. It might sound simple to say I was leading three hundred men, as if all we had to do was mount our horses, leave Chester and ride eastwards, but it takes time to organise an army. We had to carry our own food. We would be riding into country where food could be bought but never enough for all of us. The Northmen would steal what they wanted, but we paid because we rode in our own country. And so I had a pack-horse laden with silver coins and guarded by two of my warriors. 
and we would number well over three hundred, because many men would take servants, some would take the women they could not bear to leave behind, and then there were the boys to lead the spare horses and the herd of pack horses laden with armour, weapons, and the sacks of salted meat, smoked fish, hard baked bread, and thick rinded cheese. You do know what happens at Easter? Cholnuth demanded sternly. Of course I know, I said. We make babies. That is the most ridiculous. Cholbert began to protest, then went silent when his brother glared at him. It's my favourite feast, I continued happily. Easter is baby-making day. It is the most solemn and joyous feast of the Christian year, Cholnuth lectured me. Solemn because we remember the agony of our Saviour's death and joyous because of his resurrection. Amen, Father Wissian said. Wissian was another Mercian, a young man with a shock of prematurely white hair. I rather liked Wissian, but he was cowed by the twins. Father Cuthbert stood beside him, blind and smiling. He had heard this argument before and was enjoying it. I glowered at the priests. Why is it called Easter? I demanded. Because our Lord died and was resurrected in the East, of course, Cholnoth answered. Oh, shit, I said. It's called Easter because it's Yostra's feast and you know it. It is not, Cholbert began indignantly. Yostra, I overrode him. Goddess of the spring, goddess of baby-making. You Christians stole both her name and her feast. Ignore him, Cholnoth said but he knew I was right. Yostra is the goddess of the spring, and a merry goddess she is too, which means many babies are born in January. The Christians, of course, try to stop the merriment, claiming that the name Easter is all about the East, but as usual the Christians are spouting nonsense. Easter is Yostra's feast, and despite all the sermons that insisted the feast was solemn and sacred, most folk had a half-memory of their duties towards Yostra, and so the babies duly arrived every winter. In the three years I had lived at Chester, I had always insisted on a fair to celebrate Yostra's feast. There were firewalkers and jugglers, musicians and acrobats, wrestling matches and horse races. There were booths selling everything from pottery to jewellery, and there was dancing. The priests disapproved of the dancing, but folk danced anyway, and the dances ensured that the babies came on time. But this year was going to be different. The Christians had decided to create a bishop of Chester, and had set Easter as the date of his enthronement. The new bishop was called Leofston, and I had never met the man and knew little of him except that he came from Wessex and had an exaggerated reputation for piety. He was a scholar, I had been told, and was married, but on being named as the new bishop, he had famously sworn to fast three days in every week and to stay celibate. Blind Father Cuthbert, who revelled in nonsense, had told me of the new bishop's oath, knowing it would amuse me. He did what? I asked. He vowed to give up pleasuring his wife, Lord. Maybe she's old and ugly. Men say she's comely, Father Cuthbert said dubiously, but our bishop-to-be says that our Lord gave up his life for us, and the very least we can do is to give up our carnal pleasures for him. The man's an idiot, I had said. I can't agree with you, Cuthbert said slyly, but, yes, Lord, Leofstan's an idiot. The idiot's consecration was what had brought Cholnoth and Cholbert to Chester. They were planning the ceremonies, and had invited abbots, bishops, and priests from all across Mercia, from Wessex, and from even further afield in Francia. We need to ensure their safety, Cholnoth insisted now. We have promised them the city will be defended against any attack. Eighty men isn't enough, he said scornfully. I pretended to be worried. You mean 
your churchmen might all be slaughtered if the Danes come. Of course! Then he saw my smile, and that only increased his fury. We need five hundred men. King Edward might come. The Lady Ethelfled will certainly be here. She won't, I said. She'll be with me fighting Raniel. If the Northmen come, you'd better just pray. Your god is supposed to work miracles, isn't he? Ethelfled, I knew, would come north as soon as my messengers reached Gloucester. Those same messengers would then order new ships from the boat builders along the Siphon. I would have preferred to buy ships from London, where the yards employed skilled Frisian boat builders, but for now we would buy three vessels from the shipwrights on the Seven. Tell them I want their smaller ships, I told the messengers, no more than thirty oars on each side. The Seven men built heavy ships, wide and deep, which could ride the rough seas to Ireland, but such vessels would be cumbersome in a shallow river. There was no hurry. The men who had manned those ships were riding east with me, and in our absence I ordered Radwald to start rebuilding the wharf. He would do the job well, though slowly. I had sent my son ahead with fifty men, all mounted on light, fast horses. They had left the day before, and their job was to pursue the enemy, attack their forage parties, and ambush their scouts. Beard Wolf was already following Raniel's men, but his task was simply to report back to me where the army went ashore, and that must happen soon because the river became unnavigable after a few miles. Once ashore, Raniel's army would spread out to find horses, food and slaves, and my son had been sent to slow them, annoy them, and, if he was sensible, avoid a major fight with them. What if Raniel goes north? Finnan asked me. I told Uhtred not to leave Saxon land, I said. I knew what Finnan was asking. If Raniel chose to take his men north, he would be entering Northumbria, a land ruled by the Danes, and if my son and his war band followed, they would find themselves in enemy land, outnumbered and surrounded. And you think he'll obey you? Finnan asked. He's no fool. Finnan half smiled. He's like you. Meaning? Meaning he's like you, so as like or not, he'll chase Raniel halfway to Scotland before he comes to his senses. He stooped to tighten his saddle's girth. Besides, how can you tell where Mercia ends and Northumbria begins? He'll be careful, I said. He'd better be, Lord. He put his foot in the stirrup and swung up into the saddle where he settled himself, collected the reins, and turned to look at the four priests. They were talking to each other, heads bowed, hands gesticulating. What did they want? For me to leave an army here to protect their damned bishops? Finnan sneered at that, then turned and stared northwards. Life's a crock of shit, isn't it? He said bitterly. I said nothing, just watched as Finnan loosened his sword, Soul Stealer, in its scabbard. He had buried his son or nephew beside the river, digging the grave himself and marking it with a stone. Families, he said bitterly. Now, let's go and kill more of the bastards. I pulled myself up into the saddle. The sun was up now but still low in the east where it was shrouded by grey clouds. A chill wind blew from the Irish Sea. Men were mounting and the last spears were being tied to pack horses when a horn sounded from the northern gate. That horn only sounded if the centuries had seen something worth my attention, and so I kicked my horse up the main street and my men, thinking we were leaving, followed. The horn sounded again, as I cantered past Chester's great hall, then a third time as I slid from the saddle and climbed the stone steps that led to the rampart above the gate arch. A dozen horsemen were approaching, spurring their stallions across the Roman cemetery, coming as fast as they could ride. I recognised my son's grey horse, 
then saw Beardwolf was with him. They slewed to a stop just beyond the ditch, and my son looked up. There it eats, Byrig, he called. A thousand of the bastards, Beardwolf added. I instinctively looked eastwards. Even though I knew Eads Byrig was not visible from the gateway. But it was close. It lay no further to the east than Brunnenburg did to the west. They're digging in, my son shouted. What is it? Finnan had joined me on the rampart. Raniel's not going north, I said, and he's not going south. Then where? He's here. I said, still staring east. He's coming here. To Chester. Eads Byrig lay on a low ridge that ran north and south. The hill was simply a higher part of the ridge, a grassy hump rising like an island above the oaks and sycamores that grew thick about its base. The slopes were mostly shallow, an easy stroll, except that the ancient people who had lived in Britain long before my ancestors had crossed the sea, indeed, before even the Romans came, had ringed the hill with walls and ditches. They were not stone walls as the Romans had made at London and Chester, nor wooden palisades as we build, but walls made of earth. They had dug a deep ditch all around the hill's long crest and thrown the soil up to make a steep embankment inside the ditch, then made a second ditch and wall inside the first, and though the long years and the hard rain had eroded the double walls and half-filled the two ditches, the defences were still formidable. The hill's name meant Ede's Stronghold, and doubtless some Saxon called Ede had once lived there and used the walls to defend his herds and home, but the stronghold was much older than its name suggested. There were such grassy forts on high hills throughout Britain, proof that men have fought for this land as long as men have lived here, and I sometimes wonder whether a thousand years from now folk will still be making walls in Britain and setting sentries in the night to watch for enemies in the dawn. It was difficult to approach Ede's stronghold. The woods were dense, and an ambush among the trees was all too easy. My son's men had managed to get close to the ridge before Raniel's numbers forced them away. They had retreated to the open pasture land to the west of the forest, where I found them watching the thick woods. They're deepening the ditches, one of Beardwolf's men greeted my arrival. We could see the bastards shoveling away, Lord. Cutting trees too, Lord, Beardwolf added. I could hear the axes working. They sounded far off, muffled by the spring foliage. He's making a burr, I said. Raniel's troops would be deepening the old ditches and raising the earth walls, on top of which they would build a wooden palisade. Where did the ships land? I asked Beardwolf. By the fish traps, Lord. He nodded to the north, showing where he meant then turned as a distant crash announced a tree's fall. They went to ground before that. They took a fair time to get their ships off the mud. The ships are still there? He shrugged. They were at dawn. They'll be guarded, Finnan warned me. He suspected I was thinking of attacking Raniel's ships and burning them, but that was the last thing I had in mind. I'd rather he went back to Ireland, I said. So leave his ships alone. I don't want to trap the bastard here, I grimaced. It looks as if the priests will get what they want. Which is? my son asked. If Raniel stays here, I said, then so must we. I had thought to take my three hundred men eastwards to Licklefeld, where I could meet the forces Ethelfled would send from Gloucester. But if Raniel was staying at Eads Byrig, then I must stay to protect Chester. I sent all the pack horses back to the city, and sent more messengers south to tell the reinforcements to abandon their march on Licklefeld and to come to Chester instead. And then I waited. 
I was waiting for Ethelfled and her army of Mercia. I had three hundred men, and Raniel had over a thousand, and more were joining him every day. It was frustrating. It was maddening. The garrison at Brunnenburg could only watch as the beast-proud ships rode up the Mercy. There were two ships the first day, and three the second, and still more every following day. Ships heavy with men who had come from Raniel's furthest islands. Other men came by land, travelling from the Danish steadings in Northumbria, lured to Eads by rig by the promise of Saxon silver, Saxon land, and Saxon slaves. Raniel's army grew larger, and I could do nothing. He outnumbered me by at least three to one, and to attack him, I needed to take men through the forest that surrounded Eads Byrig, and that forest was a death trap. An old Roman road ran just south of the hill, but the trees had invaded the road, and once among their thick foliage, we would not be able to see more than thirty or forty paces. I sent a party of scouts into the trees, and only three of those four men returned. The fourth was beheaded, and his naked body thrown out onto the pasture land. My son wanted to take all our men and crash through the woodland in search of a fight. What good will that do? I asked him. They must have men guarding their ships, he said, and others building their new wall. So? So we won't have to fight all his men, maybe just half of them? You're an idiot, I said because that's exactly what he wants us to do. He wants to attack Chester, my son insisted. No, that's what I want him to do. And that was the mutual trap Raniel and I had set each other. He might outnumber me, but even so he would be reluctant to assault Chester. His younger brother had attempted to take the city and had lost his right eye and the best part of his army in the attempt, just as walls were formidable. Raniel's men needed to cross a deep, flooded ditch spiked with elm stakes, then climb a wall twice the height of a man, while we rained spears, axes, boulders, and buckets of shit on them. He would lose. His men would die under our ramparts. I wanted him to come to the city. I wanted him to attack our walls. I wanted to kill his men at Chester's defences, and he knew I wanted that, which is why he did not come. But we could not assault him either. Even if I could lead every fit man through the forest unscathed, I would still have to climb Eads Byrig and cross the high ditch and clamber up the earthen bank where a new wall was being made, and Raniel's Northmen and Irishmen would outnumber us and have a great killing that their poets would turn into a triumphant battle song. What would they call it? The Song of Raniel the Mighty? It would tell of blades falling, foemen dying, of a ditch filled with blood, and of Uhtred, great Uhtred, cut down in his battle glory. Raniel wanted that song. He wanted me to attack him, and I knew he wanted it, which is why I did not oblige him. I waited. We were not idle. I had men driving new sharpened stakes into the ditch around Chester, and other men riding south and east to raise the feared, that army of farmers and free men who could man a burr wall even if they could not fight a Norse shield wall in open battle. And each day... I sent a hundred horsemen to circle Eads Byrig, riding well south of the great forest, and then curling northwards. I led that patrol on the third day, the same day that four more ships rode up the Mercy, each holding at least forty warriors. We wore mail and carried weapons, though we left our heavy shields behind. I wore a rusted coat of mail and an old undecorated helmet. I carried serpent breath, but left my standard bearer behind in Chester. I did not ride in my full war glory because I did not seek a fight. We were scouting, looking for Raniel's forage parties and for his patrolling scouts. 
he had sent no men towards Chester, which was puzzling. So what was he doing? We crossed the ridge four or five miles south of Raniel's Hill. Once, on the low crest, I spurred my horse to the top of a knoll and stared northwards, though I could see almost nothing of what happened on that distant hilltop. I knew the palisade was being built there, that men were pounding oak trunks into the summit of the earthen bank, and just as surely Raniel knew I would not waste my men's lives by attacking that wall. So what was he hoping for? That I would be a fool, lose patience and attack anyway? Lord, Cetric interrupted my thoughts. He was pointing northeast, and I saw, perhaps a mile away, a dozen horsemen. More riders were further off, perhaps a score of them, all of them heading eastwards. So they've found horses, I said. From what we had seen, and from our questioning of the prisoners we had taken, the enemy had brought very few horses on their ships, but the forage parties, I assumed that was what the horsemen were, proved that they had managed to capture a few, and those few, in turn, could ride further afield to find more, though by now the countryside was alerted to their presence. There were few steadings here because this was border country, land that belonged neither to the Danes of Northumbria nor to the Saxons of Mercia, and what folk lived here would already have left their homes and driven their livestock south to the nearest burr. Fear ruled this land now. We rode on eastwards, dropping from the ridge into wooded country, where we followed an overgrown drover's path. I sent no scouts ahead, reckoning that Raniel's men did not have enough horses to send a war band large enough to confront us. Nor did we see the enemy, not even when we turned north and rode into the pasture land where we had glimpsed the horsemen earlier. They're staying out of our way. Cetric said, sounding disappointed. Wouldn't you? The more he kills of us, Lord, the fewer to fight on Chester's walls. I ignored that foolish answer. Raniel had no intention of killing his men beneath Chester's ramparts. Not yet, anyway. So what did he plan? I looked back in puzzlement. It was a dry morning, or at least it was not raining though the air felt damp and the wind was chill, but it had rained hard in the night and the ground was sopping wet, yet I had seen no hoof marks crossing the drover's path. If Raniel wanted horses and food, then he would find the richer steadings to our south, deep inside Mercia, yet it seemed he had sent no men that way. Perhaps I had missed the tracks, but I doubted I could have overlooked something so obvious and Raniel was no fool. He knew reinforcements must join us from the south, yet it seemed he had no patrols searching for those new enemies. Why? Because, I thought, he did not care about our reinforcements. I was staring northwards, seeing nothing there except thick woods and damp fields, and I was thinking what Raniel had achieved. He had taken away our small fleet, which meant we could not cross the Mercy easily, not unless we rowed even further eastwards to find an unguarded crossing. He was making a fortress on Eads Byrig, a stronghold that was virtually impregnable until we had sufficient men to overwhelm his army. And there was only one reason to fortify Eads Byrig, and that was to threaten Chester. Yet he was sending no patrols towards the city, nor was he trying to stop any reinforcements reaching the garrison. Is there water on Eads Byrig? I asked Cetric. There's a spring to the southeast of the hill, he said, sounding dubious. But it's just a trickle, Lord, not enough for a whole army. He's not strong enough to attack Chester, I said, thinking aloud and he knows we're not going to waste men against Eads Byrig's walls. He just wants a fight, Cedric said dismissively. No, I said, he doesn't, not with us. 
there was an idea in my head. I could not say it aloud because I did not understand it yet, but I sensed what Raniel was doing. Ede's Byrig was a deception, I thought, and we were not the enemy. Not yet. We would be, in time, but not yet. I turned on Cetric. Take the men back to Chester, I told him. Go back by the same path we came on. Let the bastards see you, and tell Finnan to patrol to the edge of the forest tomorrow. Lord? he asked again. Tell Finnan it should be a big patrol, a hundred and fifty men at least. Let Raniel see them. Tell him to patrol from the road to the river. Make him think we're planning an attack from the west. An attack from the... he began. Just do it, I snarled. Berg, you come with me. Raniel had stopped us from crossing the river, and he was making us concentrate all our attention on Ede's Byrig. He seemed to be behaving cautiously, making a great fortress and deliberately not provoking us by sending war bands to the south, yet everything I knew about Raniel suggested he was anything but a cautious man. He was a warrior. He moved fast, struck hard, and called himself a king. He was a gold-giver, a lord, a patron of warriors. Men would follow him, so long as his swords and spears took captives and captured farmland, and no man became rich by building a fortress in a forest and inviting attack. Tell Finnan I'll be back tomorrow or the day after, I told Cedric, then beckoned to Berg and rode eastwards. Tomorrow or the day after, I shouted back to Cedric. Berg Scala Grimison was a Norseman who had sworn loyalty to me a loyalty he had proved in the three years since I had saved his life on a beach in Wales. He could have ridden north any time to the kingdom of Northumbria, and there found a Dane or a fellow Norseman who would welcome a young, strong warrior. But Berg had stayed true. He was a thin-faced, blue-eyed young man, serious and thoughtful. He wore his hair long in Norse fashion, and had persuaded Cetric's daughter to make a scribble on his left cheek with oak gall ink and a needle. What is it? I had asked him as the scars were still healing. It's a wolf's head, Lord, he had said, sounding indignant. The wolf's head was my symbol, and the inked device was his way of showing loyalty, but even when it healed, it looked more like a smeared pig's head. Now the two of us rode eastwards. I still did not fear any enemy warband, because I had a suspicion of what Raniel really wanted, and it was that suspicion that kept us riding into the afternoon, by which time we had turned north and were following a Roman road that led to Northumbria. We were still well to the east of Ede's Byrig, but as the afternoon waned we climbed a low hill, and I saw where a bridge carried the road across the river and there, clustered close to two cottages that had been built on the Mercy's north bank, were men in mail. Men with spears. How many? I asked Berg, whose eyes were younger than mine. At least forty, Lord. He doesn't want us to cross the river, does he? I suggested. Which means we need to get across. We rode east for an hour, keeping a cautious eye for enemies, and at dusk we turned north and came to where the Mercy slid slow between pastureland. Can your horse swim? I asked Berg. We'll find out, Lord. The river was wide here, at least fifty paces, and its banks were earthen bluffs. The water was murky, but I sensed it was deep, and so, rather than risk swimming the beasts over, we turned back upstream until we discovered a place where a muddy track led into the river from the south, and another climbed the northern bank, suggesting this was a ford. It was certainly no major crossing place, but rather a spot where some farmer had discovered he could cross with his cattle, but I suspected the river was usually lower. Rain had swollen it. "'We have to cross,' I said, and spurred my horse into the water." The river came up to my boots, then above them, 
and I could feel the horse struggling against the current. He slipped once and I lurked sideways, thought I must be thrown into the water, but somehow the stallion found his footing and surged ahead, driven more by fear than by my urging. Berg came behind and kicked his horse faster, so that he passed me and left the river before I did, his horse flailing up the far bank in a flurry of water and mud. I hate crossing rivers, I growled as I joined him. We found a spinney of ash trees a mile beyond the river, and we spent the night there, the horses tethered while we tried to sleep. Berg, being young, slept like the dead, but I was awake much of the night, listening to the wind in the leaves. I had not dared light a fire. This land, like the country south of the Mercy, appeared deserted, but that did not mean no enemy was near, and so I shivered through the darkness. I slept fitfully as the dawn approached, waking to see Berg carefully cutting a lump of bread into two pieces. For you, Lord, he said, holding out the larger piece. I took the smaller, then stood, aching in every bone. I walked to the edge of the trees and gazed out at greyness. Grey sky, grey land, grey mist. It was the wolf light of dawn. I heard Berg moving behind me. Shall I settle the horses, Lord? he asked. Not yet. He came and stood beside me. Where are we, Lord? Northumbria, I said. Everything north of the Mercy is Northumbria. Your country, Lord. My country, I agreed. I was born in Northumbria, and I hoped to die in Northumbria, though my birth had been on the eastern coast, far from these mistrouded fields by the Mercy. My land is Bebenberg, the fortress by the sea, which had been treacherously stolen by my uncle, and, though he was long dead, the great stronghold was still held by his son. One day, I promised myself, I would slaughter my cousin and take back my birthright. It was a promise I made every day of my life. Berg gazed into the grey dampness. Who rules here? he asked. I half smiled at the question. Tell me, I said, have you heard of Sigfrithir? No, Lord. Knut Wanand? No, Lord. Halfdan Othirson? No, Lord. Eols the Strong? No, Lord. Eols wasn't that strong, I said wryly, because he was killed by Ingvar Brightsword. Have you heard of Ingvar? No, Lord. Sigfrithir, Knut, Halfdan, Eols and Ingvar. I repeated the names, and in the last ten years each of those men has called himself King of Jorvik, and only one of them, Ingvar, is still alive today. You know where Jorvik is? To the north, Lord, a city. It was a great city once, I said bleakly. The Romans made it. Like Chester, Lord, he asked earnestly. Berg knew little of Britain. He had served Ronald, a Norseman who had died in a welter of bloodshed on a Welsh beach. Since then, Berg had served me, living in Chester and fighting the cattle raiders who came from Northumbria or the Welsh kingdoms. He was eager to learn, though. Jorvik is like Chester, I said, and like Chester its strength lies in its walls. It guards a river, but the man who rules in Jorvik can claim to rule Northumbria. Ingvar Brightsword is king of Jorvik, but he calls himself king of Northumbria. And is he? He pretends he is, I said, but in truth he's just a chieftain in Jorvik. But no one else can call himself king of Northumbria unless he holds Jorvik. But it's not strong. Berg asked. 
Jorvik's walls are strong, I said, using the Saxon name for Jorvik. They're very strong. They're formidable. My father died attacking those walls. And the city lies in rich country. The man who rules Jorvik can be a gold giver. He can buy men. He can give estates. He can breed horses. He can command an army. And this is what King Ingvar does? Ingvar couldn't command a dog to piss, I sneered. He has maybe two hundred warriors. And outside the walls? He has nothing. Other men rule beyond the walls. And one day one of those men will kill Ingvar as Ingvar killed the oils, and the new man will call himself king. Sigfrothir, Knut, Halfdan, and the oils, they all called themselves King of Northumbria, and they were all killed by a rival. Northumbria isn't a kingdom, it's a pit of rats and terriers. Like Ireland, Berg said. Like Ireland? A country of little kings, he said. He frowned for a moment. Sometimes one calls himself the High King, and maybe he is, but there are still many little kings, and they squabble like dogs, and you think such dogs will be easy to kill, but when you attack them, they come together. There's no High King in Northumbria, I said. Not yet. There will be. Raniel, I said. Ah, he said, understanding. And one day we must take this land. One day, I said. And I wanted that day to be soon. But Ethelfled, who ruled Mercia, insisted that first we drive the Danes from her country. She wanted to restore the ancient frontier of Mercia, and only then lead an army into Northumbria, and even then she would not invade unless she had her brother's blessing. But now Raniel had come and threatened to make the conquest of the north even more difficult. We saddled the horses and rode slowly westwards. The Mercy made great lazy loops to our left, twisting through overgrown water meadows. No one farmed these lands. There had been Danes and Norsemen settled here once, their steadings fat in a fat land, but we had driven them northwards away from Chester, and thistles now grew tall where cattle had grazed. Two heron flew down river. A light rain blew from the distant sea. The Lady Ethelfled is coming, Lord, Berg asked me as we pushed the horses through a gap in a ragged hedge, then across a flooded ditch. The mist had lifted, though there were still patches above the river's wide bends. She's coming, I said, and surprised myself by feeling a distinct pang of pleasure at the thought of seeing Ethel fled again. She was coming anyway for this nonsense with a new bishop. The enthronement was the sort of ceremony she enjoyed, though how anyone could endure three or four hours of chanting monks and ranting priests was beyond my understanding, just as it was beyond my understanding to know why bishops needed thrones. They would be demanding crowns next. Now she'll be bringing a whole army as well, I said. And we'll fight Raniel. She'll want to drive him out of Mercia, I said. And if he stays behind his new walls, that will be a bloody business. I had turned north towards a low hill that I remembered from raids we had made across the river. The hill was crowned with a stand of pine trees, and from its summit we could see Chester on a clear day. There was no chance of seeing the city on this grey day, but I could see Eads Byrig rising green from the trees on the river's far side and I could see the raw timber of the new wall atop the fort's embankment, and, much closer, I could see Raniel's fleet clustered at a great bend of the Mercy. And I saw a bridge. At first I was not sure what I was seeing, but I asked Berg, whose eyes were so much younger than mine. He gazed for a while, frowned, and finally nodded. 
They make a bridge with their boats, Lord. It was a crude bridge made by mooring ships hull to hull so that they stretched across the river and carried a crude plank roadway on their decks. So many horses and men had already used the makeshift bridge that they had worn a new road in the fields on this side of the river, a muddy streak that showed dark against the pale pasture and then fanned out into lesser streaks that all led northwards. There were men riding the tracks now, three small groups spurring away from the Mercy and going deeper into Northumbria, and one large band of horsemen travelling south towards the river. And on the river's southern bank, where the trees grew dense, there was smoke. At first I took it for a thickening of the river mist, but the longer I looked, the more I became convinced that there were campfires in the woodland. A lot of fires, sifting their smoke above the leaves, and that smoke told me that Raniel was keeping many of his men beside the Mercy. There was a garrison at Eads Byrig, a garrison busy making a palisade, but not enough water there for the whole army. And that army, instead of making tracks south into Mercia, was trampling new paths northwards. We can go home now, I said. Already? Berg sounded surprised. Already, I said, because I knew what Raniel was doing. We went back the way we had come. We rode slowly, sparing the horses. A small rain blew from behind us, carried by a cold morning wind from the Irish Sea, and that made me remember Finnan's words that Raniel had made a pact with the Hui Neil. The Irish rarely crossed the sea except to trade, and once in a while to look for slaves along Britain's western coast. I knew there were Irish settlements in Scotland, and even some on the wild western shore of Northumbria, but I had never seen Irish warriors in Mercia or Wessex. We had enough trouble with the Danes and the Norse, let alone dealing with the Irish. It was true that Raniel only had one crew of Irishmen, but Finnan boasted that one crew of his countrymen was worth three from any other tribe. We fight like mad dogs, he had told me proudly. If it comes to a battle, then Raniel will have his Irish at the front. He'll let them loose on us. I had seen Finnan fight often enough, and I believed him. Lord! Berg startled me. Behind us, Lord! I turned to see three riders following us. We were in open country with nowhere to hide, but I cursed myself for carelessness. I had been daydreaming, trying to decide what Raniel would do, and I had not looked behind. If we had seen the three men earlier, we might have turned away into a copse or thicket, but now there was no avoiding the horsemen, who were coming fast. I'll talk to them, I told Berg, then turned my horse and waited. The three were young no more than twenty years old. Their horses were good, spirited and brisk. All three wore mail, though none had a shield or helmet. They spread out as they approached, and then curbed their horses some ten paces away. They wore their hair long and had the inked patterns on their faces that told me they were Northmen. But what else did I expect on this side of the river? "'I wish you good morning,' I said politely. The young man in the centre of the three kicked his horse forward. His mail was good, his sword scabbard was decorated with silver panels, while the hammer about his neck glinted with gold. He had long black hair, oiled and smoothed, then gathered with a black ribbon at the nape of his neck. He looked at my horse, then up at me, then gazed at Serpent Breath. That's a good sword, Grandad. It's a good sword, I said mildly. Old men don't need swords, he said, and his two companions laughed. My name, I still spoke softly, is Heffering Fennison, and this is my son, Berg Heffringson. Tell me, Heffring Fennison, the young man said, why you ride eastwards? 
Why not? Because Yar Rangno is calling men to his side and you ride away from him. Yarl Ranyol has no need of old men, I said. True, but he has need of young men. He looked at Berg. My son has no skill with a sword, I said. In truth, Berg was lethally fast with a blade, but there was an innocence to his face that suggested he might have no love for fighting. And who, I asked respectfully, are you? He hesitated, plainly reluctant to give me his name, then shrugged, as if to suggest it did not matter. Arthur Hardgerson, he said. You came with the ships from Ireland? I asked. Where we are from is none of your concern, he said. Did you swear loyalty to Jarl Ranyol? I swear loyalty to no man, I said, and that was true. Ethelfled had my oath. Othra sneered at that. You are a Jarl, perhaps? I am a farmer. A farmer, he said derisively, has no need of a fine horse. He has no need of a sword. He has no need of a coat of mail, even that rusty coat, and does for your son. He kicked his horse past mine to stare at Berg. If he cannot fight, then he too has no need of mail, sword, or horse. You wish to buy them? I asked. Buy them? Othera laughed at that suggestion. I will give you a choice, old man, he said, turning back to me. You can ride with us and swear loyalty to Jarl Ranyol, or you can give us your horses, weapons and mail and go on your way. Which is it to be? I knew Othera's kind. He was a young warrior, raised to fight, and taught to despise any man who did not earn a living with a sword. He was bored. He had come across the sea on the promise of land and plunder, and though Ranyol's present caution was doubtless justified, it had left Othera frustrated. He was being forced to wait while Ranyol gathered more men, and those men were evidently being recruited from Northumbria, from the Danes and Norsemen who had settled that riven country. Othera, ordered to the dull business of patrolling the river's northern bank to guard against any Saxon incursion across the Mersey, wanted to start the conquest of Britain, and if Ranyol would not lead him into battle, then he would seek a fight of his own. Besides, Othera was an overconfident young bully, and what did he have to fear from an old man? I suppose I was old. My beard had turned grey, and my face showed the years, but even so, Othera and his two companions should have been more cautious. What farmer would ride a swift horse, or carry a great sword? Or wear mail. I give you a choice, Othera Hardgerson, I said. You can either ride away and thank whatever gods you worship that I let you live, or you can take the sword from me. Your choice, boy. He gazed at me for a heartbeat, looking for that moment as if he did not believe what he had just heard. Then he laughed. On horse or on foot, old man? Your choice, boy, I said again, and this time invested the word boy with pure scorn. Oh, you're dead, old man, he retorted. On foot, you old bastard. He swung easily from the saddle and dropped lithely to the damp grass. I assumed he had chosen to fight on foot because his horse was not battle-trained, but that suited me. I also dismounted, but did it slowly, as though my old bones and aching muscles hampered me. My sword, Othera said, is called Blood Drinker. A man should know what weapon sends him to his grave. My sword? Why do I need to know the name of your sword? He interrupted me, then laughed again as he pulled Blood Drinker from her scabbard. He was right-handed. I shall make it quick, old man. Are you ready? 
The last question was mocking. He did not care if I was ready. Instead, he was sneering because I had unsheathed serpent breath and was holding her clumsily, as if she felt unfamiliar in my hand. I even tried holding her in my left hand before putting her back in my right, all to suggest to him that I was unpractised. I was so convincing that he lowered his blade and shook his head. You're being stupid, old man. I don't want to kill you. Just give me the sword. Gladly, I said, and moved towards him. He held out his left hand and I sliced serpent breath up with a twist of my wrist and knocked that hand away, brought the blade back hard to beat blood drinker aside, then lunged once to drive serpent breath's tip against his breast. She struck the male above his breastbone, driving him back, and he half stumbled and roared in anger as he swept his sword around in a haymaking slice that should have sheared my head from my body, but I already had serpent breath lifted in the parry. The blades struck, and I took one more step forward and slammed her hilt into his face. He managed to half turn away so that the blow landed on his jawbone rather than his nose. He tried to cut my neck, but had no room for the stroke, and I stepped back, flicking serpent breath up so that her tip cut through his chin, though not with any great force. She drew blood, and the sight of it must have prompted one of his companions to draw his sword, and I heard but did not see a clash of blades, and knew Berg was fighting. There was a gasp behind me, another ringing clash of steel on steel, and Othra's eyes widened as he stared at whatever happened. Come, boy, I said, you're fighting me, not Berg. Then to the grave, old man, he snarled and stepped forward, sword swinging, but that was easy to parry. He had no great swordcraft. He was probably faster than I was. He was, after all, younger. But I had a lifetime of sword knowledge. He pressed me, cutting again and again, and I parried every stroke. And only after six or seven of his savage swings did I suddenly step back, lowering my blade, and his sword hissed past me, unbalancing him, and I rammed Serpent Breath forward, skewering his sword shoulder, piercing the mail and mangling the flesh beneath. And I saw his arm drop, and I backswung my blade onto his neck and held it there, blood welling along Serpent Breath's edge. My name, boy, is Uhtred of Bebenberg, and this sword is called Serpent Breath. Lord! He dropped to his knees. Unable to lift his arm. Lord, he said again, I didn't know. Do you always bully old men? I didn't know, he pleaded. Hold your sword tight, boy, I said, and look for me in Valhalla. And I grimaced as I dragged the blade back, soaring at his neck, then thrust it forward, still soaring, and he made a whimpering noise as his blood spurted far across the damp pasture. He made a choking sound. Hold on to blood drinker, I snarled at him. He seemed to nod. Then the light went from his eyes, and he fell forward. The sword was still in his hand, so I would meet him again across the ale board of the gods. Berg had disarmed one of the remaining horsemen, while the other was already two hundred paces away and spurring his horse frantically. Should I kill this one, Lord? Berg asked me. I shook my head. He can take a message. I walked to the young man's horse and hauled him downwards. He fell from the saddle and sprawled on the turf. Who are you? I demanded. He gave me a name. I forget what it was now. He was a boy, younger than Berg, and he answered our questions willingly enough. Raniel was making a great wall at Eadsbyrig, but he had also made an encampment beside the river where the boats bridged the water. He was collecting men there, making a new army. And where will the army go? I asked the boy. To take the Saxon town he said. Chester? He shrugged. He did not know the name. The town nearby, Lord. 
Are you making ladders? Ladders? No, Lord. We stripped Uthra's corpse of its mail, took his sword and horse, then did the same to the boy Berg had disarmed. He was not badly wounded, more frightened than hurt, and he shivered as he watched us remount. Tell Raniel, I told him, that the Saxons of Mercia are coming. Tell him that his dead will number in the thousands. Tell him that his own death is just days away. Tell him that promise comes from Uhtred of Bebenberg. He nodded, too frightened to speak. Say the name aloud, boy, I ordered him, so I know you can repeat it to Raniel. Uhtred of Bebenberg, he stammered. Good boy, I said, and then we rode home. Chapter 3 Bishop Leofstan arrived the next day. Of course, he was not the bishop yet. For the time being, he was just Father Leofstan, but everyone excitedly called him Bishop Leofstan and kept telling each other that he was a living saint and a scholar. The living saint's arrival was announced by Edgar, one of my men who was with a work party in the quarry south of the River Dee, where they were loading rocks onto a cart, rocks that would eventually be piled onto Chester's ramparts as a greeting to any Northman who tried to clamber over our walls. I was fairly certain Raniel planned no such assault, but if he lost his mind and did try, I wanted him to enjoy a proper welcome. There's at least eighty of the bastards, Edgar told me. Priests? There are plenty enough priests, he said dourly, but the rest of them? He made the sign of the cross. God knows what they are, Lord, but at least eighty of them, and they're coming. I walked to the southern ramparts and gazed at the road beyond the Roman bridge, but saw nothing there. The city gate was closed again. All Chester's gates would stay closed until Raniel's men had left the district, but the news of the bishop's approach was spreading through the town, and Father Cholnuth came running down the main street, clutching the skirt of his long robe up to his waist. "'We should open the gates!' he shouted. "'He is come unto the gate of my people, even unto Jerusalem!' I looked at Edgar, who shrugged. "'Sounds like the scripture, Lord.' Open the gates, Cholnath shouted breathlessly. Why? I called down from the fighting platform above the arch. Cholnath came to an abrupt halt. He had not seen me on the ramparts. He scowled. Bishop Leofston is coming. The gates stay closed, I said, then turned to look across the river. I could hear singing now. Finnan and my son joined me. The Irishman stared south, frowning. Father Leofston is coming, I explained the excitement. A crowd was gathering in the street, all of them watching the big, closed gates. So I heard, Finnan said curtly. I hesitated. I wanted to say something comforting, but what do you say to a man who has killed his own kin? Finnan must have sensed my gaze because he growled, Stop your worrying about me, Lord. Who said I was worried? He half smiled. I'll kill some of Raniel's men, then I'll kill Conal. That'll cure whatever ails me. Sweet Jesus, what is that? His question was prompted by the appearance of children. They were on the road south of the bridge, and so far as I could tell, all were dressed in white robes. There must have been a score of them, and they were singing as they walked. Some of them were waving small branches in time to their song. Behind them was a group of dark-robed priests, and, last of all, a shambling crowd. Father Cholnath had been joined by his twin brother, and the pair had climbed to the ramparts from where they stared south with ecstatic looks on their ugly faces. What a holy man! Jolnath said. The gates must be open, Gilbert insisted. Why aren't the gates open? 
because I haven't ordered them opened, I growled. That's why. The gates stayed closed. The strange procession crossed the river and approached the walls. The children were waving ragged willow fronds in time to their singing, but the fronds drooped and the singing faltered when they reached the flooded ditch and realised they could go no further. Then the voices died away altogether, as a young priest pushed his way through the white-robed choir and called up to us, The gates! Open the gates! Who are you? I called back. The priest looked outraged. Father Leofston has come! Praise God, Father Chilnath said. He is come! Who? I asked. Oh, dear Jesus! Cholbert exclaimed behind me. Father Leofston, the young priest called. Father Leofston is your... Quiet, hush. A skinny priest mounted on an ass called the command. He was so tall and the ass was so small that his feet almost dragged on the roadway. The gates must be closed, he called to the angry young priest, because there are heathens close by. He half fell off the ass then limped across the ditch's wooden bridge. He looked up at us, smiling. Greetings in the name of the living God. Father Leofston, Cholnerth called and waved. Who are you? I demanded. I am Leofston, a humble servant of God, the skinny priest answered. And you must be the Lord Uhtred? I nodded for answer and I humbly ask your permission to enter the city, Lord Uhtred, Leofston went on. I looked at the grubby-robed choir, then at the shambolic crowd, and shuddered. Leofston waited patiently. He was younger than I had expected, with a broad, pale face, thick lips and dark eyes. He smiled. I had the impression that he always smiled. He waited patiently, still smiling, just staring at me. Who are those people? I demanded, pointing to the shambles who followed him. They were a shambles, too. I had never seen so many people in rags. There must have been almost a hundred of them, cripples, hunchbacks, the blind, and a group of evidently moon-crazed men and women who shook and gibbered and dribbled. These little ones... Leofston placed his hands on the heads of two of the children, or orphans, Lord Uhtred, who have been placed under my humble care. And the others? I demanded, jerking my head at the gibbering crowd. God's children, Leofston said happily. They are the halt, the lame and the blind. They are beggars and outcasts. They are the hungry, the naked and the friendless. They are all God's children. And what are they doing here? I asked. Leofston chuckled as though my question was too easy to answer. Our dear Lord commands us to look after the helpless, Lord Uhtred. What does the blessed Matthew tell us? That when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you gave me shelter. When I was naked, you clothed me, and when I was sick, you visited me. To clothe the naked and to give help to the poor, Lord Uhtred, is to obey God. These dear people, he swept an arm at the hopeless crowd, are my family. Sweet suffering Jesus, Finnan murmured, sounding amused for the first time in days. Praise be to God, Cholnath said though without much enthusiasm. You do know, I called down to Leofston, that there's an army of Northmen not a half day's march away. The heathen pursue us, he said. They rage all about us. Yet God shall preserve us. And this city might be under siege soon, I persevered. The Lord is my strength. And if we are besieged, I demanded angrily, how am I supposed to feed your family? 
The Lord will provide. You'll not win this one, Finnan said softly. And where do they live? I asked harshly. The church has property here, I am told, Leifston answered gently. So the church will house them. They shall not come nigh thee. I growled. Finnan grinned, and Leifston still smiled. Open the damn gates, I said, then went down the stone steps. I reached the street just as the new bishop limped through the long gate arch, and once inside, he dropped to his knees and kissed the roadway. Blessed be this place, he intoned, and blessed be the folk who live here. He struggled to his feet and smiled at me. I am honoured to meet you, Lord Uhtred. I fingered the hammer hanging at my neck, but even that symbol of paganism could not wipe the smile from his face. One of these priests, I gestured at the twins, will show you where you live. There is a fine house waiting for you, father, Jolnath said. I need no fine house, Leifston exclaimed. Our lord dwelt in no mansion. The foxes have holes and the birds of the sky have their nests, but something humble will suffice for us. Us? I asked. All of you? You're cripples as well? For my dear wife and I, Leifston said, and gestured for a woman to step forward from among his accompanying priests. At least, I assumed she was a woman, because she was so swathed in cloaks and robes that it was hard to tell what she was. Her face was invisible under the shadow of a deep hood. This is my dear wife, Gomer, he introduced her, and the bundle of robes nodded towards me. Gomer? I thought I had misheard because it was a name I'd never heard before. A name from the scriptures, Leifston said brightly. And you should know, Lord, that my dear wife and I have taken vows of poverty and chastity. A hovel will suffice us. Isn't that so, dearest? Dearest nodded, and there was the hint of a squeak from beneath the swathe of hoods, robes, and cloak. I've taken neither vow, I said with too much vehemence. You're both welcome, I added those words grudgingly because they were not true, but keep your damned family out of the way of my soldiers. We have work to do. We shall pray for you, he turned. Sing, children, sing! Wave your fronds merrily, make a joyful noise unto the Lord as we enter his city. And so Bishop Leofston came to Chester. I hate the bastard, I said. No, you don't, Fennan said. You just don't like the fact that you like him. He's a smiling, oily bastard, I said. He's a famous scholar, a living saint, and a very fine priest. I hope he gets worms and dies. They say he speaks Latin and Greek. Have you ever met a Roman, I demanded, or a Greek? What's the point of speaking their damned languages? Venon laughed. Leofston's arrival and my splenetic hatred of the man seemed to have cheered him, and now the two of us led a hundred and thirty men on fast horses to patrol the edge of the forest that surrounded and protected Eads Byrig. So far, we had ridden the southern and eastern boundaries of the trees, because those were the directions Raniel's men would take if they wanted to raid deep into Mercia. But not one of our scouts had seen any evidence of such raids. Today, the morning after Leofston's arrival, we were close to the forest's western edge, and riding north towards the Mercy. We could see no enemy, but I was certain they could see us. There would be men standing guard at the margin of the thick woodland. Do you think it's true that he's celibate? Finnan asked. How would I know? His wife probably looks like a shriveled turnip, poor man. He slapped at a horsefly on his stallion's neck. What is her name? Gomer. 
Ugly name, ugly woman, he said, grinning. It was a windy day with high clouds scudding fast inland. Heavier clouds were gathering above the distant sea, but now an early morning shaft of sunlight glinted off the Mercy's water that lay a mile ahead of us. Two more dragon boats had rowed up river the previous day, one with more than forty men aboard, the other smaller but still crammed with warriors. The heavy weather threatening to the west would probably mean no boats arriving today, but still Raniel's strength grew. What would he do with that strength? To find the answer to that question, we had brought a score of riderless horses with us. All were saddled. Anyone watching from the forest would assume they were spare mounts, but their purpose was quite different. I let my horse slow so that Beardwolf could catch up with me. You don't have to do this, I told him. It will be easy, Lord. You're sure? I asked him. It will be easy, Lord, he said again. We'll be back this time tomorrow, I promised him. Same place? Same place. So, let's do it, Lord, he suggested with a grin. I wanted to know what happened both at Eads Byrig and at the river crossing to the north of the hill. I had seen the bridge of boats across the Mercy, and the density of the smoke rising from the woods on the river's southern bank had suggested Raniel's main camp was there. If it was, how was it protected? And how complete were the new walls at Eads Byrig? We could have assembled a war band and followed the Roman track that led through the forest, and then turned north up the spine of the ridge, and I did not doubt we could reach Eads Byrig's low summit, but Raniel would be waiting for just such an incursion. His scouts would give warning of our approach, and his men would flood the woodland, and our withdrawal would be a desperate fight in thick trees against an outnumbering enemy. Beardwolf, though, could scout the hill and the riverside camp like a phantom, and the enemy would never know he was there. The problem was to get Beardwolf into the forest without the enemy seeing his arrival, and that was the reason we had bought the riderless horses. Draw swords, I called to my men as I pulled Serpent Breath free of her scabbard. Now, I shouted. We spurred our horses, turning them directly eastwards, and galloping for the trees as though we planned to ride clean through the forest to the distant hill. We plunged into the wood, but instead of riding straight on towards Eads Byrig, we suddenly swung the horses southwards, so we were riding among the trees at the edge of the woods. A horn sounded behind us. It sounded three times, and that had to be one of Raniel's sentinels sending a warning that we had entered the great forest. But in truth, we were merely thundering along its margin. A man ran from a thicket to our left, and Finnan swerved, chopped down once, and there was a bright red splash among the spring green leaves. Our horses galloped into sunlight as we crossed a clearing dense with bracken, then we were back among the thick trunks, ducking under the low branches, and another of Raniel's scouts broke cover, and my son rode him down, spearing his sword into the man's back. I galloped through a thicket of young hazel trees and elderberries. He's gone, Citric called from behind me, and I saw Beardwolf's riderless horse off to my right. We kept going for another half mile, but saw no more sentries. The horn still called, answered by a distant one presumably on the hill. Raniel's men would be pulling on mail and buckling sword belts. But long before any could reach us, we had swerved back to the open pasture and onto the cattle tracks that would lead us back to Chester. We paused in a fitful patch of sunlight, collected the riderless horses and waited, but no enemy showed at the woodland's edge. Birds that had panicked to fly above the woods as we rode through the trees went back to their roosts. The horns had gone silent, and the forest was quiet again. Raniel's scouts would have seen a war band go into the forest and then leave the forest. If Beardwolf had simply dropped from his saddle to find a hiding place, 
then that enemy might have noticed that one horse had lost its rider among the trees. But I was certain no sentry would have bothered to count our riderless stallions. One more would not be noticed. Beardwolf, I reckoned, was safely hidden among our enemies. Cloud Shadow raced to engulf us, and a heavy drop of rain spattered on my helmet. Time to go home, I said, and so we rode back to Chester. Ethelfled arrived that same afternoon. She was leading over eight hundred men, and was in a thoroughly bad temper that was not improved when she saw Edith. The day had turned stormy, and the long tail and mane of Ethelfled's mare, Gast, lifted to the gusting wind, as did Edith's long red hair. Why, Ethelfled demanded of me with no other form of greeting, does she wear her hair unbound? Because she's a virgin, I said, and watched Edith hurry through the spatter of rain towards the house we shared on Chester's main street. Ethelfled scowled. She's no maid. She's... She bit back whatever she was about to say. A whore, I suggested. Tell her to bind her hair properly. Is there a proper way for a whore to bind her hair? I asked. Most of the ones I've enjoyed prefer to leave it loose. But there was a black-haired girl in Gloucester who Bishop Wolford liked to hump when his wife wasn't in the city, and he made her coil her hair around her head like ropes. He made her plait her hair first, and then insisted that she... Enough! she snapped. Tell your woman she can at least try to look respectable. You can tell her that yourself, my lady, and welcome to Chester. She scowled again then swung down from Gast. She hated Edith, whose brother had tried to kill her, and that was doubtless reason enough to dislike the girl, but most of the hatred stemmed from the simple fact that Edith shared my bed. Ethelfled had also disliked Sigyn, who had been my lover for many years but had succumbed to a fever two winters before. I had wept for her. Ethelfled had also been my lover and perhaps still was, though in the mood that soured her arrival she was more likely to be my foe. "'All our ships lost!' she exclaimed. "'And a thousand Northmen not a half-day's march away!' Two thousand by now,' I said, "'and at least a hundred battle-crazed Irish warriors with them.' "'And this garrison is here to stop that happening!' she spat. The priests who accompanied her looked at me accusingly. Ethelfled was almost always escorted by priests, but there seemed to be more than usual, and then I remembered that Eostra's feast was just days away, and we were to enjoy the thrill of consecrating the humble, ever-smiling Leofston. So what do we do about it? Ethelfled demanded. I've no idea, I said. I'm not a Christian. I suppose you shove the poor man into the church, stick him onto a throne, and have the usual caterwauling? What are you talking about? I honestly don't see why we need a bishop anyway. We already have enough useless mouths to feed, and this wretched creature, Leofston, has brought off the cripples of Mercia with him. What do we do about Raniel? she snapped. Oh, him, I said, pretending surprise. Why, nothing, of course. She stared at me. Nothing. Unless you can think of something, I suggested. I can't. Good God! She spat the words at me, then shivered as a blast of wind brought a slap of cold rain to the street. We'll talk in the great hall, she said, and bring Finnan. Finnan's patrolling, I said. Thank God someone's doing something here, she snarled and strode towards the great hall, which was a monstrous Roman building at the centre of the town. The priests scuttled after her, leaving me with two close friends who had accompanied Ethel fled north. One was Osforth, her half-brother and illegitimate son of King Alfred. He had been my liegeman for years, one of my better commanders, 
but he had joined Ethelfled's household as a counsellor. You shouldn't tease her, he reproved me sternly. Why not? Because she's in a bad mood, Mirwala said, climbing down from his horse and grinning at me. He was the commander of her household warriors and was as reliable a man as any I've ever known. He stamped his feet, stretched his arms, then patted his horse's neck. She's in a downright filthy mood, he said. Why, because of Raniel? Because at least half the guests for Father Leofston's enthronement have said they're not coming, Osforth said gloomily. The idiots are frightened. They're not idiots, he said patiently, but respected churchmen. We promised them a sacred Easter celebration, a chance for joyful fellowship, and instead there's a war here. You can't expect the likes of Bishop Wolfherd to risk capture. Braniel Everson is known for his bestial cruelty. The girls at the Wheat Chief will be pleased Wolfherd's staying in Gloucester, I said. Osforth sighed heavily and set off after Ethelfled. The Wheat Chief was a fine tavern in Gloucester that employed some equally fine whores, most of whom had shared the bishop's bed whenever his wife was absent. Mirwala grinned at me again. You shouldn't tease Osforth either. He looks more like his father every day, I said. He's a good man. He is, I agreed. I liked Osforth, even though he was a solemn and censorious man. He felt cursed by his bastardy and had struggled to overcome the curse by living a blameless life. He had been a good soldier, brave and prudent, and I did not doubt he was a good counsellor to his half-sister, with whom he shared not just a father but a deep piety. So, Ethel fled, I started walking with Mirwala towards the great hall, is upset because a pack of bishops and monks can't come to see Leofston made a bishop. She's upset, Mirwala said, because Chester and Brunnenburg are close to her heart. She regards them as her conquest and she isn't happy that the pagans are threatening them. He stopped abruptly and frowned. The frown was not for me, but rather for a young, dark-haired man who galloped past, his stallion's hooves splashing mud and rainwater. The man slewed the tall horse to an extravagant stop and leapt from the saddle, leaving a servant to catch the sweat-stained stallion. The young man swirled a black cloak, nodded a casual acknowledgement towards Mirwala, then strode towards the great hall. "'Who's that?' I asked. Kinlaf Haraldson, Mirwala said shortly. One of yours? One of hers. Ethelfled's lover? I asked, astonished. Christ, no. Her daughter's lover, probably, but she pretends not to know. Elfwyn's lover? I still sounded surprised, but in truth I would have been more surprised if Elfwyn had not taken a lover. She was a pretty and flighty girl who should have been married three or four years by now, but for whatever reason, her mother had not found a suitable husband. For a time, everyone had assumed Elfwyn would marry my son, but that marriage had raised no enthusiasm, and Mirwala's next words suggested it never would. Don't be surprised if they marry soon, he said sourly. Kinlaf's stallion snorted as it was led past me, and I saw the beast had a big C and H branded on its rump. Does he do that to all his horses? His dogs, too. Poor Elfwyn will probably end up with his name burned onto her buttocks. I watched Kinlaf, who had paused between the big pillars that fronted the hall and was giving orders to two servants. He was a good-looking young man, long-faced and dark-eyed, with an expensive mail coat and a gaudy sword belt from which hung a scabbard of red leather studded with gold. I recognised the scabbard. It had belonged to the Lord Ethelred, Ethelfled's husband. A generous gift, I thought. Kinlaf saw me looking at him and bowed, before turning away and disappearing through the big Roman doors. Where did he come from? I asked. He's a West Saxon, he was one of King Edward's warriors, but 
after he met Elf when he moved to Gloucester. He paused and half smiled. Edward didn't seem to mind losing him. Noble? A thang's son, he said dismissively, but she thinks the sun shines out of his arse. I laughed. You don't like him. He's a useless lump of self-important gristle, Miruella said. But the lady Ethelfled thinks otherwise. Can he fight? Well enough, Miruella sounded grudging. He's no coward, and he's ambitious. Not a bad thing, I said. It is when he wants my job. She won't replace you, I said confidently. Don't be so sure, he said gloomily. We followed Kinlaf into the hall. Ethelfled had settled into a chair behind the high table, and Kinlaf had taken the stool to her right. Osforth was on her left, and she now indicated that Merwala and I should join them. The fire in the central hearth was smoky, and the brisk wind gusting through the hole in the Roman roof was swirling the smoke thick about the big chamber. The hall filled slowly. Many of my men, those who were not riding with Finnan or standing guard on the high stone walls, came to hear whatever news Ethelfled had brought. I sent for Ethelston, and he was ordered to join us at the high table where the twin priests Cholnoth and Cholbert also took seats. Ethelfled's warriors filled the rest of the hall as servants brought water and cloths so the newly arrived guests at the high table could wash their hands. Other servants brought ale, bread and cheese. So what, Ethelfled demanded as the ale was poured, is happening here? I let Ethelston tell the story of the burning of Brunnenburr's boats. He was embarrassed by the telling, certain he had let his aunt down by his lack of vigilance, but he still told the tale clearly and did not try to shrink from the responsibility. I was proud of him, and Ethelfled treated him gently, saying that no one could have expected ships to sail up the Mercy at night. But why, she asked harshly, did we have no warning of Randall's coming? No one answered. Father Cholnoth began to say something, glancing at me as he spoke, but then decided to be silent. Ethelfled understood what he had wanted to say and looked at me. Your daughter, she sounded disapproving, is married to Raniel's brother. See, Trigger isn't supporting his brother, I said, and I assume he doesn't approve of what Raniel is doing. But he must have known what Raniel planned. I hesitated. Yes, I finally admitted. It was unthinkable that Citrigger and Stura had not known, and I could only presume they had not wanted to send me any warning. Perhaps my daughter now wanted a pagan Briton. But if that was the case, why had Citrigger not joined the invasion? And your son-in-law sent you no warning? Ethelfled asked. Perhaps he did, I said. But the Irish Sea is treacherous. Perhaps his messenger drowned. That feeble explanation was greeted with a snort of derision from Father Chilneth. Perhaps your daughter preferred, he began, but Ethelfled cut him short before he could say more. We mostly rely on the church for our news from Ireland, she said acidly. Have you stopped corresponding with the clerics and monasteries of that land? I watched as she listened to the churchman's limping excuses. She was King Alfred's eldest daughter, the brightest of his large brood, and as a child she had been quick, happy and full of laughter. She had grown to be a beauty with pale gold hair and bright eyes, but marriage to Ethelred, Lord of Mercia, had etched harsh lines on her face. His death had taken away much of her unhappiness, but she was now the ruler of Mercia and the care of that kingdom had added streaks of grey to her hair. She was handsome rather than beautiful now, stern-faced and thin, ever watchful. Watchful because there were still men who believed no woman should rule, 
though most men in Mercia loved her and followed her willingly. She had her father's intelligence as well as his piety. I knew her to be passionate, but as she aged she had become ever more dependent on priests for the reassurance that the Christian's nailed God was on her side. And perhaps he was, for her rule had been successful. We had been pushing the Danes back, taking from them the ancient lands they had stolen from Mercia, but now Raniel had arrived to threaten all she had achieved. It's no accident, Father Cholmoth insisted, that he has come at Easter. I did not see the significance, and nor, apparently, did Ethelfled. Why Easter, Father? she asked. We reconquer land, Cholmoth explained, and we build birds to protect the land, and we rely on warriors to keep the birds safe. That last statement was accompanied by a quick and spiteful glance in my direction. But the land is not truly safe until the church has placed God's guardian hand over the new pastures. The psalmist said as much, God is my shepherd, and I shall lack for nothing. Bah, I said, and was rewarded by a savage look from Ethelfled. So you think, she said, pointedly ignoring me, that Raniel wants to stop the consecration? It is why he has come now, Cholmoth said, and why we must thwart his evil intent by enthroning Leofstone. You believe he will attack Chester? Ethelfled asked. Why else is he here? Cholmoth said heatedly. He has brought over a thousand pagans to destroy us. Two thousand by now, I corrected him, and some Christians too. Christians? Ethelfled asked sharply. He has Irish in his army, I reminded her. Two thousand pagans? Kinlaf spoke for the first time. I ignored him. If he wanted me to respond, then he needed to use more courtesy, but he had asked a sensible question, and Ethelfled also wanted the answer. Two thousand? You're certain he has that many? she demanded of me. I stood and walked around the table so that I was at the front of the dais. Raniel brought over a thousand warriors, I said and he used those to occupy Eads Byrig. At least another thousand have joined him since, coming either by sea or on the road south through Northumbria. He grows strong, but despite his strength he has not sent a single man southwards. Not one cow has been stolen from Mercia, not one child taken as a slave. He hasn't even burned a village church. He hasn't sent scouts to look at Chester. He's ignored us. Two thousand? Ethelfled again echoed Kinlaf's question. Instead, I said, he's made a bridge across the Mercy, and his men have been going north. What lies to the north? I let the question hang in the smoky hall. Northumbria? Someone said helpfully. Men, I said. Danes, Northmen, men who hold land and fear that will take it from them. Men who have no king unless you count that weakling in Yofowick. Men, my lady, who are looking for a leader who will make them safe. He's recruiting men from Northumbria, so yes, his army grows every day. All at Eads Byrick? Ethelfled asked. Maybe three, four hundred men there, I said. There isn't enough water for more, but the rest are camped by the Mercy where Raniel's made a bridge of boats. I think that's where he's gathering his army, and by next week he'll have three thousand men. The priests crossed themselves. How in God's name, Jolbert asked quietly, do we fight a horde like that? Raniel, I went on remorselessly, talking directly to Ethelfled now, leads the largest enemy army to be seen in Britain since the days of your father, and every day that army gets bigger. We shall trust in the Lord our God, Father Leiston spoke for the first time, and in the Lord Uhtred, too, he added slyly. 
The bishop-elect had been invited to join Ethelfled on the high dais, but had preferred to sit at one of the lower tables. He beamed his smile at me, then wagged a disapproving finger. You're trying to frighten us, Lord Uhtred? Jarl Raniel, I said, is a frightening man. But we have you, and you smite the heathen. I am a heathen. He chuckled at that. The Lord will provide. Then perhaps someone can tell me, I turn back to the high table, how the Lord will provide for us to defeat Raniel. What has been done so far? Ethelfled asked. I've summoned the feared, I said, and sent all the folk who wanted refuge to the burrs. We've deepened the ditch here, we've sharpened the stakes in the ditch, we've stacked missiles on the walls, we've filled the storerooms. And we have a scout in the woods now, exploring the new camp as well as Eads Byrig. So, now is the time to smite Raniel, Father Cholneth said enthusiastically. I spat towards him. Will someone please tell that drivelling idiot why we cannot fight Raniel? The silence was finally broken by Cetric. Because he's protected by the walls of Eads Byrick. Not the men by the river, Cholneth pointed out. They're not protected. We don't know that, I said, which is why my scout is in the woods. But even if they don't have a palisade, they do have the forest. Lead an army into a forest and it will be ambushed. You could cross the river to the east. Father Cholnoth decided to offer military advice and attack the bridge from the north. And why would I do that, you spavined idiot? I demanded. I want the bridge there. If I destroy the bridge, then I've trapped three thousand Northmen inside Mercia. I want them out of Mercia. I want the bastards across the river. I paused, then decided to speak what my instinct told me was the truth. A truth I confidently expected Beardwolf to confirm. And that's what they want too. Ethelfled frowned at me, puzzled. They want to be across the river. Cholnoth muttered something about the idea being a nonsense, but Kinlaf had understood what I was suggesting. The Lord Uhtred, he said, investing my name with respect, believes that what Raniel really means to do is invade Northumbria. He wants to be king there. Then why is he here? Jolbert asked plaintively. To make the Northumbrians believe his ambitions are here, Kinlaf explained. He is misleading his pagan enemies. Raniel doesn't want to invade Mercia. Yet, I intervened strongly, he wants to be king of the north, Kinlaf finished. Ethelfled looked at me. Is he right? I think he is, I said. So Raniel isn't coming to Chester? He knows what I did to his brother here, I said. Leofston looked puzzled. His brother? Sea Trigger attacked Chester. I told the priest, and we slaughtered his men and I took his right eye. And he took your daughter to wife, Father Chilnoth could not resist saying. At least she gets humped, I said, still looking at Leofston. I turned back to Ethelfled. Raniel's not interested in attacking Chester, I assured her. Not for a year or two, anyway. One day? Yes, if he can, but not yet. So no. I spoke firmly to reassure her. He's not coming here. And he came next morning. The Northmen came from the forest's edge in six great streams. They still lacked sufficient horses, so many of them came on foot. But they all came in mail and helmeted, carrying shields and weapons, emerging from the far trees beneath their banners that showed eagles and axes, Dragons and ravens, ships and thunderbolts. Some flags showed the Christian cross, and those, I assumed, were Colonel's Irishmen, while one banner was Haston's simple emblem of a human skull held aloft on a pole. The biggest flag was Raniel's blood-red axe, 
that flew in the strong wind above a group of mounted men who advanced ahead of the great horde, which slowly shook itself into a massive battle line that faced Chester's eastern ramparts. A horn sounded three times from the enemy ranks, as if they thought we had somehow not noticed their coming. Finnan had returned ahead of the enemy, warning me that he had seen movement in the forest, and now he joined me and my son on the ramparts and looked at the vast army which had emerged from the distant trees and faced us across half a mile of open land. No ladders, he said. Not that I can see. The heathen are mighty, Father Leifston had also come to the ramparts and called to us from some paces away. Yet shall we prevail? Is that not right, Lord Uhtred? I ignored him. No ladders, I said to Finnan, so this isn't an attack. It's impressive, though, my son said, staring at the vast army. He turned as a small voice squeaked from the steps leading up to the ramparts. It was Father Leofston's wife, or at least it was a bundle of cloaks, robes and hoods that resembled the bundle he had arrived with. Gomer, dearest! Father Leofston cried and hurried to help the bundle up the steep stairs. Careful, my cherub, careful! He married a gnome, my son said. I laughed. Father Leofston was so tall, and the bundle was so small and swathed in robes as she was, she did resemble a plump little gnome. She reached out a hand and her husband helped her up the last of the worn steps. She squeaked in relief when she reached the top then gasped as she saw Raniel's army that was now advancing through the Roman cemetery. She stood close beside her husband, her head scarcely reaching his waist, and she clutched his priestly robe as if fearing she might topple off the wall's top. I tried to see her face, but it was too deeply shadowed by her big hood. Are they the pagans? she asked in a small voice. Have faith, my darling. Father Leiston said cheerfully. God has sent us Lord Uhtred, and God will vouchsafe us victory. He raised his broad face to the sky and lifted his hands. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen, O Lord, he prayed. Vex them with thy wrath and smite them with thy anger. Amen, his wife squeaked. Poor little thing. Finnan said quietly as he looked at her. She's got to be ugly as a toad under all those clothes. He's probably relieved he doesn't have to plough her. Maybe she's relieved, I said. Or maybe she's a beauty, my son said wistfully. Two silver shillings says she's a toad, Finnan said. Done. My son held out his hand to seal the wager. Don't be such damned fools, I snarled. I have enough trouble with your damned church without either of you plugging the bishop's wife. His gnome, you mean, my son said. Just keep your dirty hands to yourself, I ordered him, then turned to see eleven riders spurring ahead of the massive shield wall. They came under three banners and were riding towards our ramparts. It's time to go, I said. Time to meet the enemy. Chapter 4 Our horses were waiting in the street to where Godric, my servant, carried my fine wolf-crested helmet, a newly painted shield and my bearskin cloak. My standard-bearer shook out the great banner of the wolf's head as I heaved myself into the saddle. I was riding Tintrig, a new night-black stallion, huge and savage, his name meant Torment, and he had been a gift from my old friend Steeper, who had been commander of King Edward's household troops until he had retired to his lands in Wiltonshire. Tintrig, like Steeper, was battle-trained and bad-tempered. I liked him. Ethelfled was already waiting at the north gate. She was mounted on Gast, her white mare, and wearing her polished mail beneath a snow-white cloak. Mirawala, Osforth and Kinlaf were with her, as well as Father Freomar, her confessor and chaplain. 
How many men are coming from the pagans? Ethelfled asked me. Eleven. Bring one more, she ordered Mirwala. That added man, with her standard bearer and mine, and with my son and Finnan as my companions, would make the same number as Raniel brought towards us. Bring Prince Ethelston, I told Mirwala. Mirwala looked at Ethelfled, who nodded assent. But tell him to hurry, she added curtly. Make the bastards wait, I growled, a comment Ethelfled ignored. Ethelston was already dressed for battle in mail and helmet, so the only delay was as his horse was saddled. He grinned at me as he mounted, then gave his aunt a respectful bow. Thank you, my lady. Just keep silent, Ethelfled ordered him, then raised her voice. Open the gates. The huge gates creaked and squealed and scraped as they were pushed outwards. Men were still pounding up the stone steps to the ramparts as our two standard bearers led the way through the arch's long tunnel. Ethelfled's cross-holding goose and my wolf's head were the two banners that were lifted to a weak spring sunlight as we clattered over the bridge that crossed the flooded ditch. Then we spurred towards Raniel and his men, who had reined in some three hundred yards away. You don't need to be here, I told Ethelfled. Why not? Because it will be nothing but insults. You think I'm afraid of words? I think he'll insult you and try to offend you, and his victory will be your anger. Our scripture teaches us that a fool is full of words, Father Freyamar said. He was a pleasant enough young man and intensely loyal to Ethelfled. So let the wretch speak and betray his foolishness. I turned in my saddle to look at Chester's walls. They were thick with men, the sun glinting from spear points along the whole length of the ramparts. The ditch had been cleared and newly planted with sharpened spikes, and the walls were hung with banners, most of them showing Christian saints. The defences, I thought, looked formidable. If he tries to attack the city, I said, then he is a fool. Then why is he here? Ethelfled asked. This morning? To scare us, insult us and provoke us. I want to see him, she said. I want to see what kind of man he is. He's a dangerous one, I said and I wondered how many times I had ridden in my war glory to meet an enemy before battle. It was a ritual. To my mind, the ritual meant nothing, and it changed nothing, and it decided nothing. But Ethelfled was evidently curious about her enemy, and so we indulged Raniel by riding to endure his insults. We halted a few paces from the Northmen. They carried three standards— Raniel's red axe was the largest, and it was flanked by a banner showing a ship sailing through a sea of blood, and by Haston's bare skull on its tall pole. Haston sat on his horse beneath the skull, and he grinned at me as if we were old friends. He looked old, but I suppose I did too. His helmet was decorated with silver, and had a pair of raven's wings mounted on its crown. He was plainly enjoying himself, unlike the man whose banner showed a ship in a sea of blood. He was also an older man, thin-faced and grey-bearded, with a scar slashing across one cheek. He wore a fine helmet that framed his face, and was crested with a long black horse's tail which cascaded down his back. The helmet was circled by a ring of gold, a king's helmet. He wore a cross above his mail, a gold cross studded with amber, showing that he was the only Christian among the enemies who faced us. But what distinguished him that morning was the murderous gaze directed at Finnan. I glanced at Finnan, and saw the Irishman's face was also taut with anger. So, the man in the gold-ringed horsetail helmet, I thought, had to be Connell, Finnan's brother. You could feel the mutual hatred. One word from either, I reckoned, and swords would be drawn. 
Dwarves! The silence was broken by the hulking man beneath the flag of the Red Axe, who kicked his big stallion one pace forward. So this was Raniel Everson, the Sea King, Lord of the Islands and would-be King of Britain. He wore leather trues tucked into tall boots that were plated with gold badges, the same golden plaques that studded his sword belt from which hung a monstrous blade. He wore neither mail nor helmet. Instead, his bare chest was crossed by two leather straps beneath which his muscles bulged. His chest was hairy, and under the hair were ink marks, eagles, serpents, dragons, and axes that writhed from his belly to his neck, around which was twisted a chain of gold. His arms were thick with the silver and gold rings of conquest, while his long hair, dark brown, was threaded with gold rings. His face was broad, hard, and grim, and across his forehead was an inked eagle, its wings spread and its talons needle-written onto his cheekbones. Dwarves, he sneered again. Have you come to surrender your city? You have something to tell us? Ethelfled asked in Danish. Is that a woman in mail? Raniel addressed the question to me, perhaps because I was the biggest man in our party, or else because my battle finery was the most elaborate. I have seen many things, he told me in conversational tone. I have seen the strange lights glitter in the northern sky. I have seen ships swallowed by whirlpools. I have seen ice the size of mountains floating in the sea. I have watched whales break a ship in two, and seen fire spill from a hillside like vomit, but I have never seen a woman in mail. Is that the creature who is said to rule Mercia? The Lady Ethelfled asked you a question, I said. Raniel stared at her, lifted himself a hand's breadth from the saddle, and let out a loud and long thought. She's answered, he said, evidently amused as he settled back. Ethelfled must have shown some distaste because he laughed at her. They told us, he looked back at me, that the ruler of Mercia was a pretty woman. Is that her grandmother? She's the woman who will grant you a grave's length of her land, I said. It was a feeble answer, but I did not want to match insult with insult. I was too aware of the hatred between Finnan and Connell, and feared that it could break into a fight. So it is the woman ruler, Raniel sneered. He shuddered, pretending horror, and so ugly. I hear that no pig, goat, or dog is safe from you, I said, provoked to anger. So what would you know of beauty? He ignored that. Ugly, he said again. But I command men who don't care what a woman looks like, and they tell me that an old worn boot is more comfortable than a new one. He nodded at Ethelfled. And she looks old and worn, so think how they'll enjoy using her. Maybe she'll enjoy it too. He looked at me as if expecting an answer. You made more sense when you farted, I said. And you must be the Lord Uhtred, he said. The fabled Lord Uhtred. He shuddered suddenly. You killed one of my men, Lord Uhtred. The first of many. Althra Hardgerson, he said the name slowly. I shall revenge him. You'll follow him to a grave, I said. He shook his head, making the gold rings in his hair clink softly together. I liked Othara Hardgerson. He played dice well and could hold his drink. He had no swordcraft, I said. Maybe he learned from you. A month from now, Lord Uhtred, 
I shall be drinking mercy and ale from a cup fashioned from your skull. My wives will use your long bones to stir their stew, and my babes will play knuckle bones with your toes. Your brother made the same kind of boasts, I responded, and the blood of his men still stains our streets. I fed his right eye to my dogs, and the taste of it made them vomit. But he still took your daughter, Raniel said slyly. Even the pigs won't eat your rancid flesh, I said. And a pretty daughter she is too, he said musingly. Too good for Sitriga. We shall burn your body, I said, what's left of it, and the stench of the smoke will make the gods turn away in disgust. He laughed at that. The gods love my stench, he said. They revel in it. The gods love me, and the gods have given me this land. So, he nodded towards the walls of Chester, who commands in that place? The Lady Ethelfled commands, I said. Raniel looked left and right at his followers. Lord Uhtred amuses us. He claims that a woman commands warriors. His men dutifully laughed all except for Connell, who still stared malevolently at his brother. Raniel looked back to me. Do you all squat when you piss? If he has nothing useful to say, Ethelfled's voice was filled with anger, then we shall return to the city. She wrenched Gast's reins unnecessarily hard. Running away, Raniel jeered, and I brought you a gift, lady. A gift and a promise. A promise, I asked. Ethelfled had turned her mare back and was listening. Leave the city by dusk tomorrow, Raniel said, and I shall be merciful. I shall spare your miserable lives. And if we don't? Ethelston asked the question. His voice was defiant and earned him an angry glance from Ethelfled. The puppy barks, Raniel said. If you don't leave the city, little boy, then my men will cross your walls like a storm-driven wave. Your young women will be my pleasure, your children shall be my slaves, and your weapons my playthings. Your corpses will rot, your churches will burn, and your widows weep. He paused and gestured at his standard. You can take that flag, he was talking to me, and display it above the city. Then I shall know you're leaving. I shall take your banner anyway, I said, and use it to wipe my ass. It will be easier. He spoke to me now as if he addressed a small child. If you just leave. Go to another town. I shall find you there anyway. Worry not, but you'll live a little longer. Come to us tomorrow, I said in the same tone of voice. Try to cross our walls, be our guests, and your lives will be a little shorter. He chuckled. I shall take a delight in killing you, Lord Uhtred. <laughs> My poets will sing of it. How Rania, lord of the sea and king of all Britain, made the great Lord Uhtred whimper like a child. How Uhtred died begging for mercy, how he cried as I gutted him. The last few words were spoken with sudden vehemence, but then he smiled again. I almost forgot the gift, he beckoned to one of his men and pointed to the grass between our horses. Put it there. The man dismounted and brought a wooden chest that he laid on the grass. The chest was square, about the size of a cooking cauldron, and decorated with painted carvings. The lid was a picture of the crucifixion, while the sides showed men with halos about their heads, and I recognised the chest as one that had probably held a Christian gospel book, or else one of the relics that Christians so revered. That is my gift to you, Raniel said. 
and it comes with my promise that if you are not gone by tomorrow's dusk, then you will stay here forever as ashes, as bones, and as raven food. He turned his horse abruptly and savaged it with his spurs. I felt relief as Connell, grey-bearded, dark-eyed King Connell, turned and followed. Haston paused a moment. He had said nothing. He looked so old to me, but then he was old. His hair was grey, his beard was grey, but his face still held a sly humour. I had known him since he was a young man, and I had trusted him at first, only to discover that he broke oaths as easily as a child breaks eggs. He had tried to make himself a king in Britain, and I had thwarted every attempt until, at Biemfliot, I had destroyed his last army. He looked prosperous now, gold hung, his mail bright, his bridle studded with gold and his brown cloak edged with thick fur, but he had become a client to Raniel. And where he had once led thousands, he now commanded only scores of men. He had to hate me, yet he smiled at me as though he believed I would be glad to see him. I glared at him, despising him, and he seemed surprised by that. I thought, for a heartbeat, that he would speak, but then he pulled on his reins and spurred after Raniel's horsemen. Open it, Ethelfled commanded Kinlaf, who slid from his horse and walked to the gospel box. He stooped, lifted the lid, and recoiled. The box held Beardwolf's head. I gazed down at it. His eyes had been gouged out, his tongue torn from his mouth, and his ears cut off. The bastard, my son hissed. Raniel reached his shield wall. He must have shouted an order because the tight ranks dissolved and the spearmen went back towards the trees. Tomorrow... I announced loudly. We ride to Eads Byrig. And die in the forest? Mirwella asked anxiously. But you said, Ethelfled began. Tomorrow, I cut her off harshly. We ride to Eads Byrig. Tomorrow. The night was calm and moonlit. Silver touched the land. The rainy weather had gone eastwards and the sky was bright with stars. A small wind came from the far sea, but it had no malice. I was on Chester's ramparts, gazing north and east, and praying that my gods would tell me what Raniel was doing. I thought I knew, but doubts always creep in, and so I looked for an omen. The sentinels had edged aside to give me space, all was quiet in the town behind me, though earlier I had heard a fight break out in one of the streets. It had not lasted long. It had doubtless been two drunks fighting and then being pulled apart before either could kill the other. Now Chester was quiet, and I heard nothing except the small wind across the roofs, a cry of a child in its sleep, a dog whining, the scrape of feet on the ramparts and a spear butt knocking on stone. None of those was a sign from the gods. I wanted to see a star die, blazing in its bright death across the darkness high overhead. But the stars stayed stubbornly alive. And Raniel, I thought, would be listening and watching for a sign too. I prayed that the owl would call to his ears and let him know the fear of that sound that foretells death. I listened and heard nothing except the night's small noises. Then I heard the clapping sound, quick and soft. It started and stopped. It had come from the fields to the north, from the rough pasture that lay between Chester's ditch and the Roman cemetery. Some of my men wanted to dig up the cemetery and throw the dead onto a fire, but I had forbidden it. They feared the dead, 
reckoning that ancient ghosts in bronze armor would come to haunt their sleep. But the ghosts had built this city. They had made the strong walls that protected us, and we owed them our protection now. The clapping sounded again. I should have told Raniel of the ghosts. His insults had been better than mine. He had won that ritual of abuse, but if I had thought of the Roman graves with their mysterious stones, I could have told him of an invisible army of the dead that rose in the night with sharpened swords and vicious spears. He would have mocked the idea, of course, but it would have lodged in his fears. In the morning, I thought, we should pour wine on the graves as thanks to the protecting dead. The clapping started again, followed by a whirring noise. It was not harsh, but neither was it tuneful. Early in the year for a nightjar, Finnan said behind me. I didn't hear you, I said, surprised. I move like a ghost, he sounded amused. He came and stood beside me and listened to the sudden clapping sound. It was the noise made by the long wings of the bird beating together in the dark. He wants a mate, Finnan said. It's that time of year. Yostra's feast. We stood in companionable silence for a while. So are we really going to Eadsbyrig tomorrow? Finnan finally asked. We are. Through the forest. Through the forest to Eads Byrig, I said, then north to the river. He nodded. For a while he said nothing, just gazed at the distant shine of moonlight on the Mercy. No one else is to kill him, he broke the silence fiercely. Connell, he's mine. He's yours, I agreed. I paused, listening to the nightjar. I thought you were going to kill him this morning. I would have done. I wish I had. I will. He touched his breast where the crucifix had hung. I prayed for this. Prayed God would send Connell back to me. He paused and smiled. It was not a pleasant smile. Tomorrow, then. Tomorrow, I said. He slapped the wall in front of him, then laughed. The boys need a fight, by Christ they do. They were trying to kill each other earlier. I heard it. What happened? Young Godric got in a fight with Hirgul. Godric? He was my servant. He's an idiot. Hirgul was too drunk. He was punching air. Even so... I said, one of his punches could kill young Godric. Hirgul was one of Ethelfled's household warriors, a great brute of a man who reveled in the close work of a shield wall. I pulled the bastard off before he could do any harm, and then I smacked Godric, told him to grow up. He shrugged. No harm done. What were they fighting over? There's a new girl at the piss pot. The piss pot was a tavern. Its proper name was the Plother, and that bird was painted on its sign, but for some reason it was always called the Pisspot, and it was a place that sold good ale and bad women. The holy twins Cholnoth and Cholbert had tried to close the tavern, calling it a den of iniquity, and so it was, which is why I wanted it left open. I commanded a garrison of young warriors, and they needed everything the Pisspot provided. Muss, Finnan said. Moss. That's her name. Mouse. You should go see her, Fennin said, grinning. Sweet God in his heaven, Lord, but she's worth seeing. Moss, I said. You won't regret it. He won't regret what? A woman's voice asked, and I turned to see Ethelfled had come to the ramparts. He won't regret cutting the big willows downstream of Brunnenburg, my lady, Finnan said. We need new shield wood. He gave her a respectful bow. And you need your sleep, Ethelfled said, 
If you're to ride to Eads Byrig tomorrow. She laid a stress on the word if. Finnan knew when he was being dismissed. He bowed again. I bid you both good night, he said. Look out for mice, I said. He grinned. We assemble at dawn? All of us, I said. Mail, shields, weapons. It's time we killed a few of the bastards, Finnan said. He hesitated, wanting an invitation to stay, but none came, and he walked away. Ethelfled took his place and gazed at the moon-silvered land for a moment. Are you really going to Eadsbyrig? Yes, and you should send Mirwala and six hundred men with me. So they can die in the forest? They won't, I said, and hoped I did not lie. Had the nightjar been the omen I had wanted? I did not know how to interpret the clapping sound. The direction that a bird flies has meaning, as does the stoop of a falcon or the hollow call of an owl, but a drumming noise in the darkness. Then I heard it again, and something about the sound made me think of the clatter of shields as men made a shield wall. It was the omen I sought. You told us, Ethelfled was insistent, you said that once you are among the trees you can't see where the enemy is, that they could get behind you, that you'll be ambushed, so what's changed? She paused, and when I did not answer grew angry. Or is this stupidity? You let Runyal insult us, so now you have to attack him? He won't be there, I said. She frowned at me. He won't be there, she repeated. Why did he give us a full day to leave the city? I asked. Why not tell us to leave at dawn? Why not tell us to leave immediately? She thought about the questions but found no answer. Tell me, she demanded. He knows we're not going to leave, I said. But he wants us to think we have a whole day before he attacks us. He needs that day because he's leaving. He's going north across his bridge of boats and he doesn't want us interfering with that. He's no intention of attacking Chester. He's got a brand new army and he doesn't want to lose two or three hundred men trying to cross these walls. He wants to take the army to Yofawick because he needs to be king of Northumbria before he attacks Mercia. How do you know? A nightjar told me. You can't be sure. I'm not sure, I admitted, and perhaps it's a ruse to persuade us to go into the forest tomorrow and be killed, but I don't think so. He wants us to leave him in peace so he can withdraw, and if that's what he wants, then we shouldn't give it to him. She put her arm through mine, a gesture that told me she had accepted both my argument and my plan. She was silent a long time. I suppose she said at last, her voice low and small, that we should attack him in Northumbria? I've been saying we should invade Northumbria for months. So you can retake Bebenberg? So we can drive the Danes out? My brother says we shouldn't. Your brother, I said, doesn't want you to be the champion of the Saxons. He wants to be that himself. He's a good man. He's cautious, I said, and so he was. Edward of Wessex had wanted to be king of Mercia too, but he had bowed to Mercian wishes when they had chosen his sister Ethelfled to rule instead of him. Perhaps he had expected her to fail, but in that he had been disappointed. Now his armies were busy in East Anglia, driving the Danes north out of that land and he had insisted that his sister do no more than reconquer the old Mercian lands. To conquer the north, he said, we would need both the armies of Wessex and of Mercia, and perhaps he was right. I thought we should invade anyway and take back a slew of towns in southern Northumbria, but Ethelfled had accepted her brother's wishes. She needed his support, she told me. She needed the gold that Wessex gave Mercia and she needed the West Saxon warriors who manned the burrs in eastern Mercia. In a year or two, I said, 
Edward will have secured East Anglia and then he'll come here with his army. That's good, she said. She sounded cautious, not because she did not want her brother to join his forces to hers, but because she knew I believed she should strike north long before her brother was ready. And he'll lead your army and his into Northumbria. Good, she insisted. And that invasion would make the dream real. It was the dream of Ethelfled's father, King Alfred, that all the folk who spoke the English language would live in one kingdom under one king. There would be a new kingdom, Englerland, and Edward wanted to be the first man to carry the title of King of Englerland. There's only one problem, I said bleakly. Right now Northumbria is weak. It has no strong king and it can be taken piece by piece. But a year from now, Raniel will be king and he's strong. Conquering Northumbria will be far more difficult once Raniel rules there. We're not strong enough to invade Northumbria on our own, Ethelfled insisted. We need my brother's army. Give me Mirwalla and six hundred men, I said, and I'll be in Yothawick in three weeks. A month from now I'll see you crowned Queen of Northumbria, and I'll bring you Raniel's head in a gospel box. She laughed at that, thinking that I joked. I did not. She squeezed my arm. I'd like his head as a gift, she said, but for now you need your sleep, and so do I. And I hoped the message of the night jar was true. I would find out tomorrow. The sun had risen into a sky of ragged clouds and scudding wind by the time we left Chester. Seven hundred men rode to Eads Byrig. The horsemen streamed through Chester's northern gate, a torrent of mail and weapons, hooves clattering on the gate tunnel's stone, the bright spear points raised to the fitful sun as we followed the Roman road north and east. Ethelfled insisted on coming herself. She was mounted on Gast, her white mare, and followed by her standard bearer, by a bodyguard of ten picked warriors, and by five priests, one of whom was Bishop Leaston. He was not formally the bishop yet, but would be soon. He was mounted on a roan gelding, a placid horse. I don't like riding when I can walk, he told me. You can walk if you prefer, father, I said. I limp, I noticed. I was kicked by a yearling when I was ten, he explained. It was a gift from God. Your God gives strange gifts. He laughed at that. The gift, Lord Uhtred, was the pain. It lets me understand the crippled. It permits me to share a little in their agony. It is a lesson from God. But today I must ride or else I won't see your victory. He was riding beside me, just in front of my great wolf's head banner. What makes you think it will be a victory? I asked. God will grant you the victory. We prayed for that this morning. He smiled at me. Do you pray to my God or your God? He laughed, then suddenly winced. I saw a look of pain cross his face, a grimace as he bent forward in the saddle. What is it? I asked. Nothing, he said. God afflicts me with pain sometimes. It comes and it goes. He straightened and smiled at me. There! Gone already. A strange god, I said viciously, who gives his worshippers pain. He gave his own son a cruel death. Why should we not suffer a little pain? He laughed again. Bishop Wolford warned me against you. He calls you the spawn of Satan. He said you would oppose everything I try to achieve. Is that true, Lord Uhtred? You leave me alone, father, I said sourly and I'll leave you alone. I shall pray for you. You can't object to that. He looked at me as if expecting a response, but I said nothing. I'm not your enemy, Lord Uhtred, he said gently. Count yourself fortunate in that, I said, knowing that I was being boorish. I do. 
he had taken no offence. My mission here is to be like Christ, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, and to be a father to the fatherless. Your task, if I understand it right, is to protect us. God gave us different missions. You do yours and I will do mine. I am not Bishop Wolford, he said with a surprising slyness. I shall not interfere with you. I know nothing of war. I made a grunting sound that he could take as grateful acceptance of his words. Do you think I wanted this burden? He asked me. To become a bishop? You don't? Dear Lord, no. I was happy, Lord Utford. I laboured in King Edward's household as a humble priest. My duty was to draw up charters and write the king's letters, but my joy was translating St. Augustine's City of God. It is all I ever wanted from life. A pot of ink, a sheaf of quills, and a church father to guide my thoughts. I'm a scholar, not a bishop. Then why... I began. God called me. He answered my question before I finished it. I walked the streets of Winchester and saw men kicking beggars, saw children forced into slavery, saw women degraded, saw cruelty, saw cripples dying in the ditches. That was not the city of God. For those people it was hell, and the church was doing nothing. Well, a little. There were convents and monasteries that tended the sick, but not enough of them. So I began to preach, and tried to feed the hungry and help the helpless. I preached that the church should spend less on silver and gold, and more on food for the hungry and on clothes for the naked. I half smiled. I can't think that made you popular. Of course it didn't. Why do you think they sent me here? To be the bishop, I said. It's a promotion. No, it's a punishment he said, laughing. Let that fool Leofston deal with the Lord Uhtred. Is that the punishment? I asked, curious. Good Lord, yes. They're all terrified of you. And you're not? I asked, amused. My tutor in Christ was Father Bioker. Ah, I said. Bjorker had been my tutor too. Poor Father Bjorker, crippled and ugly, but a better man never walked this earth. He was fond of you, Leifston said, and proud of you too. He was, and he told me often that you are a kind man who tries to hide his kindness. I grunted again. Bjorker, I said, was full of wisdom. Leofstan interrupted me firmly. So, no, I'm not frightened of you, and I will pray for you. And I'll keep the Northmen from slaughtering you, I said. Why do you think I pray for you? <laughs> he asked, laughing. Now, go. I'm certain you have more pressing duties than talking to me. And God be with you. I kicked back my heels, riding hard to the front of the column. Damn it, I thought, but now I liked Leofston. He would join that small group of priests like Bioka, Willibald, Cuthbert and Peerlig, whom I admired and liked, a group hugely outnumbered by the corrupt, venal and ambitious cleric who governed the church so jealously. Whatever you do, I told Berg, who was the leading horseman, never believe Christians when they tell you to love your enemies. He looked puzzled. Why would I want to love them? I don't know. Just Christian shit. Have you seen any enemy? Nothing, he said. I had sent no scouts ahead. Raniel would learn soon enough that we were coming, and he would either gather his men to oppose us, or, if I was right, he would refuse battle. I would learn which soon enough. Ethel fled, even though she had decided to trust my instinct feared I was being impetuous, and I was not so sure that she was wrong, and so had attempted to persuade her to stay in Chester. And what will men think of me? she had asked, 
If I cower behind stone walls while they ride to fight Mercia's enemies, they'll think you're a sensible woman. I am the ruler of Mercia, she said. Men won't follow unless I lead. We followed the Roman road, which would eventually lead to a crossroads where ruined stone buildings stood above deep shafts dug into the layers of salt that had once made this region rich. Old men remembered clambering down the long ladders to reach the white rock, but the shafts now lay in the uncertain land between the Saxons and the Danes, and so the buildings which the Romans had made decayed. If we garrison Eads Byrig, I told Ethelfled as we rode, we can reopen the mines. A burr on the hill would protect the country for miles around. Salt from a mine is much cheaper than salt from firepans. Let's capture Eads Byrig first, she said grimly. We did not go as far as the old shafts, turning north a few miles short of the crossroads and plunging into the forest. Raniel would know we were coming by now, and we'd made no attempt to hide our progress. We rode on the ridge's crest, following an ancient track from where I could see the green slopes of Eads Byrig rising above the sea of trees, and I could see the bright raw wood of the newly made palisade. Then the track plunged leftwards into trees, and I lost sight of the hill until we burst out into the great space that Raniel had cleared around the ancient fort. The trees had been cut down, leaving stumps, wood chips, and sheared branches. Our appearance in that wasteland prompted the defenders of the fort to jeer at us. One even hurled a spear that fell a hundred paces short of our nearest horsemen. Bright banners flew above the ramparts, the largest showing Raniel's red axe. Mirwalla, I shouted. Lord? Keep a hundred men here. Just watch the fort. Don't start a fight. If they leave the fort to follow us, then ride ahead of them and join us. Lord? He called questioningly. Just watch them. Don't fight them, I shouted and rode on, skirting the hill's western flank. Kinlaf? The West Saxon caught up with me. Lord? The expensive red scabbard with the gold plaques bounced at his side. Keep Lady Ethelfled at the back. She won't just do it, I snarled. Hold her bridle if you must, but don't let her get caught up in the fighting. I quickened the pace and drew serpent breath, and the sight of that long blade prompted my men to unsheathe their own swords. Raniel had not faced us at Eads Byrig. True, there were men on the fort's ramparts, but not his full army. The spear points had been spaced apart, not crowded together, and that told me most of Raniel's men were to the north. He had landed his ships on the banks of the Mercy and then fortified Eads Byrig to deceive his real enemy, to persuade the feeble king in Yorfawick that his ambitions lay in Mercia, but Northumbria was much easier prey. Dozens of Northumbrian jarls had already joined Raniel, some no doubt believing he would lead them south, but by now he would have fired them with enthusiasm for the attack northwards. They would be lured by promises of gold, of land taken from King Ingver and his supporters, and, doubtless, of the prospect of a renewed assault on Mercia once Northumbria was secure. Or so I believed. Perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps Raniel was marching on Chester, or waiting at the river with a shield wall. His banner had flown over Eads Byrig, but that, I thought, was a deception intended to make us think he was inside the new palisade. The prickle of instinct told me he was crossing the river. Why, then, had he left men at Eads Byrig? That was a question that must wait. And then I forgot it altogether, because I suddenly saw a group of men running ahead of me. They were not in mail. We had been following a newly made track through the trees, a track that must lead from Eads Byrig to the bridge of boats, and the men ahead were carrying sacks and barrels. I suspected they were servants, but whoever they were, they scattered into the undergrowth when they saw us. 
We pounded on, ducking under branches, and more men were running away from us, and suddenly the green shadows under the trees lightened and I saw open land ahead, land scattered with makeshift shelters and the remnants of campfires, and I knew we had come to the place beside the river where Raniel had made his temporary encampment. I spurred Tintrig out into the sunlight. The river was now a hundred paces away, and a crowd was waiting to cross the bridge of boats. The far bank was already thick with men and horses, a horde, most of whom were already marching north, but on this side of the river were more men with their horses, livestock, families and servants. My instinct had been right. Raniel was going north. And then we struck. Raniel would have known we were coming, but he must have assumed we would ride straight into Ede's Byrig and stay there, lured by his great banner into the belief that he was inside the walls, and our sudden and fast ride northwards took his rearguard by surprise. It was kind to call it a rearguard. What was left on the Mercy's southern bank was a couple of hundred warriors, their servants, some women and children, and a scattering of pigs, goats, and sheep. This way, I shouted, swerving left. I did not want to charge straight into the panicking crowd who were now struggling to reach the bridge. Instead, I wanted to cut them off, and so I skirted them and then spurred Tintrug along the riverbank towards the bridge. At least a dozen men stayed close behind me. A child screamed. One man tried to stop us, hurling a heavy spear that flew past my helmet. I ignored him, but one of my men must have struck because I heard the butcher's sound of sword on bone. Tintrig snapped his teeth as he ploughed into the folk closest to the bridge. They were trying to escape, some scrambling onto the closest boat, some jumping into the river or else pushing desperately back towards the forest. And then I hauled on the reins and swung out of the saddle. No! A woman was trying to shelter two small children, but I ignored her, instead going to where the planks of the bridge stretched down to the muddy bank, and I stood there, and one by one, my men joined me, and we unslung our shields and clashed the iron rims together. Put your weapons down, I shouted at the panicked crowd. They had no escape now. Hundreds of my horsemen had come from the trees, and I had a shield wall barring their path across the Mercy. I had hoped to trap more than this ragged handful, but Raniel must have marched early, and we had left Chester too late. They're burning the boats, Finnan called to me. He had joined me, but was still on horseback. Women were shrieking, children screaming, and my men bellowing at the trapped enemy to put down their weapons. I turned and saw that Raniel's huge fleet was either beached or moored on the Mercy's far bank, and that men were hurling firebrands into the hulls. Other men were setting fire to the ships that supported the crude plank roadway. The boats had been readied for burning, their hulls filled with tinder and soaked in pitch. A handful of vessels were upstream of the others, tied with long lines to poles driven into the shelving mud, and I guess those were the few ships that were being saved from the flames. God in his heaven, Finnan said as he dismounted, but that's a huge fortune going up in flames. Worth losing a fleet to gain a kingdom, I said. Northumbria, Finnan said. Northumbria, Yofferwick, Cumberland, he'll take it all, I said, and he'll take the whole north country between here and Scotland. All of it under a strong king. The smoke was churning now as the strong flames leapt from ship to ship. I had thought to try to rescue one of the vessels, but the roadway was firmly lashed to the ships, which, in turn, were lashed to each other. There was no time to cut the lashings and prise the nailed planks apart. The bridge would soon be ash. But as I stared at it, I saw a single horseman come through the smoke, he was a bare-chested, long-haired, tall rider on a great black stallion. It was Raniel who rode the burning road. He came within thirty paces of us, the smoke whipping around horse and man. He drew his sword, and the long blade reflected the flames that surrounded him. "'I will be back, Lord Uhtred,' 
he shouted. He paused as if waiting for an answer. A ship's mast collapsed behind him, spewing sparks and a burst of darker smoke. Still he waited, but when I said nothing, he turned the horse and vanished into the fire. I hope you burn, I growled. But why did he leave man at Eads Boyrick? Fennin asked. The sorry rear guard at the river put up no fight. They were hugely outnumbered, and the women screamed at their men to drop their weapons. Behind me, the bridge broke and burning ships drifted downstream. I slid Serpent Breath back into her scabbard, remounted and forced Tintrig into the mass of frightened enemy. Most of my men were now on foot, collecting swords, spears and shields, though young Ethelston was still on horseback and, like me, was pushing his way through the defeated crowd. "'What do we do with them, Lord?' he called to me. "'You're a prince,' I said, "'so you tell me.' He shrugged and looked about him at the frightened women, crying children and sullen men, and I thought as I watched him how he had grown from a mischievous child into a strong and handsome youth. He should be king, I thought. He was his father's eldest child, son of Wessex's king, a man who should be king himself. Kill the men, he suggested. Enslave the children, put the women to work? That's the usual, I said, but this is your aunt's land. She decides. I could see Ethelston was staring at a girl, and I moved my horse to get a better view. She was a pretty little thing with a mass of unruly fair hair, very blue eyes, and a clear, unblemished skin. She was clutching an older woman's skirts, presumably her mother. "'What's your name?' I asked the girl in Danish. Her mother began screaming and begging, then went to her knees and turned a tear-stained face to me. "'She's all I have, Lord, all I have!' Quiet woman, I snarled. You don't know how lucky your daughter is. What's her name? Frigga, Lord. How old is she? The mother hesitated, perhaps tempted to lie, but I snarled and she blurted out her answer. She'll be fourteen at Baldur's Day, Lord. Baldur's feast was the midsummer, so the girl was more than old enough to wed. Bring her here, I commanded. Ethelston frowned, thinking I was taking Frigga for myself, and I confess I was tempted, but I called to Ethelston's servant instead. Tie the girl to your horse's tail, I ordered him. She's not to be touched. She's not to be hurt. You protect her, understand? Yes, Lord. And you, I looked back to the mother, can you cook? Yes, Lord. So? Of course, Lord. Then stay with your daughter. I turned to Ethelston. Your household just increased by two, I told him. And as I glanced back at Frigga, thought what a lucky bastard he was. Except he was not a bastard, but the true-born son of a king. A cheer sounded from the horsemen watching from the south. I thrust Tintreg through the prisoners and saw that Father Freyamar, Ethelfled's confessor had made some announcement. He was mounted on a grey mare, the horse's colour matching Father Freyamar's white hair. He was close to Ethelfled, who smiled as I drew near. Good news, she called. What news? God be praised, Father Freyamar said happily, but the men at Eads Byrig have surrendered. I felt disappointed. I had been looking forward to a fight. Raniel seemed to have left a substantial part of his army behind the walls of Eads Byrig, presumably because he wanted to hold on to the newly constructed fort, and I had wanted that garrison's death to be a warning to the rest of his followers. They surrendered. God be praised, they did. So, Mirwala is inside the fort? Not yet. What do you mean, not yet? They've surrendered. Freymar smiled. They're Christians, Lord Uhtred. The garrison is Christian. I frowned. I don't care if they worship weevils, I said. 
But if they've surrendered, then our forces should be inside the fort. Are they? They will be, Father Freymar said. It's all agreed. What's agreed? I demanded. Ethelfled looked troubled. They've agreed to surrender, she said, looking to her confessor for confirmation. Freyamar nodded. And we don't fight Christians, Ethelfled finished. I do, I said savagely, then called for my servant. Godric, sound the horn. Godric glanced at Ethelfled as if seeking her approval, and I lashed out and struck his left arm. The horn, sound it! He blew it hurriedly, and my men, who had been disarming the enemy, ran to mount their horses. Lord Uhtred, Ethelfled protested. If they've surrendered, I said, then the fort is ours. If the fort is not ours, then they haven't surrendered. I looked from her to Freymar. So which is it? Neither answered. Finnan, bring the men, I shouted and ignoring Ethelfled and Freymar, spurred back southwards, back to Eads Byrig. Chapter 5 I should have guessed. It was Haston. He had a tongue that could turn turds into gold, and he was using it on Mirwala. I found the two men, each attended by a dozen companions, a hundred paces outside the fort on the western side, where the slope was gentler. The two sides stood a few paces apart beneath their respective banners. Mirwala, of course, had Ethelfled's flag, showing the goose of St. Werber, while Haston, instead of his usual skull on a pole, was flaunting a new standard, this one a grey flag, on which was sewn a white cross. "'He's shameless!' I called to Finnan, as I spurred Tintreg up the slope. Finnan laughed. He's a slippery bastard, Lord. The slippery bastard had been talking animatedly as we came from the trees, but as soon as he saw me, he fell silent and stepped back into the protective company of his men. He greeted me by name as I arrived, but I ignored him, turning Tintreg in the space between the two sides and then sliding from the saddle. Why haven't you occupied the fort? I demanded of Mirwala as I threw the stallion's reins to Godric. I, he began, then looked past me. Ethelfled and her entourage were approaching fast and he plainly preferred to await their arrival before answering. Has the bastard surrendered? I asked. <laughs> the Yol Aston, Mirwala began again, then shrugged as if he neither knew what to say nor understood what was happening. It's an easy question, I said threateningly. Mirwala was a good man and a stalwart fighter, but he looked desperately uncomfortable, his eyes flicking towards the half-dozen priests who stood around him. Father Cholnoth and his toothless twin Cholbert were there, as was Leofston, all of them looking extremely discomforted by my sudden arrival. Has he surrendered? I asked again, slowly and loudly. Mirwala was saved from the question by Ethelfled's arrival. She pushed her mare through the priests. If you have things to say, Lord Uhtred, she spoke icily from her saddle, then say them to me. I just want to know whether this piece of shit has surrendered, I said, pointing at Haston. It was Father Cholnoth who answered. My lady, the priest said, pointedly ignoring me, the Jarl Haston has agreed to swear loyalty to you. He has done what? I asked. Quiet, Ethelfled snapped. She was still in her saddle, dominating us. Her men, at least a hundred and fifty, had followed her from the river bank and now stood their horses lower down the slope. Tell me what you have agreed, she demanded of Father Cholnoth. Cholnoth gave me a nervous glance, then looked back to Ethelfled. The Jarl Haston is a Christian, my lady, 
and he seeks your protection. At least three of us all began to speak at once, but Ethelfled clapped her hands for silence. Is this true? she demanded of Haston. Haston bowed to her, then fingered the silver cross he wore over his mail. Thank God, lady, it is true. He spoke quietly, humbly, with convincing sincerity. Lying bastard, I growled. He ignored me. I have found redemption, lady, and I come to you as a supplicant. He is redeemed, my lady, a tall man standing next to Haston spoke firmly. We are prepared, my lady, nay, we are eager to swear our loyalty, the tall man said, and as fellow Christians we beseech you for protection. He used the English tongue and spoke respectfully, bowing slightly to Ethelfled as he finished. She looked surprised, and no wonder because the tall man appeared to be a Christian priest, or at least he was wearing a long black robe, belted with rope, and had a wooden cross hanging at his breast. Who are you? Ethelfled asked. Father Harold, my lady. Danish. I was born here in Britain, he said, but my parents came across the sea. And you're a Christian? By the grace of God, yes. Harold was stern, dark-faced with flecks of grey at his temples. He was not the first Dane I had met who had converted, nor was he the first to become a Christian priest. I have been a Christian since I was a child, he told Ethelfled. He sounded grave and confident, but I noticed his fingers were compulsively clasping and unclasping. He was nervous. And you're telling me that piece of rancid lizard shit is a Christian too? I jerked my head at Haston. Lord Uhtred! Ethelfled said warningly. I baptised him myself, Harold answered me with dignity. Thank God. Amen, Cholnuth put in loudly. I stared into Aston's eyes. I had known him all his adult life. Indeed, he owed me that life because I had saved it. He had sworn loyalty to me back then, and I had believed him because he had a trustworthy face and an earnest manner, but he had broken every oath he ever swore. He was a weasel of a man, cunning and deadly. His ambitions far outreached his achievements, and for that he blamed me because fate had decreed that I would thwart him time after time. The last time had been at Beamfliot, where I had destroyed his army and burned his fleet, but Haston's fate was to escape from every disaster. And here he was again, apparently trapped to Teeds Byrig, but smiling at me as though we were the oldest of friends. He's no more a Christian than I am, I snarled. My lady, Haston looked at Athelfled, and then, astonishingly, dropped to his knees. I swear by our Saviour's sacrifice that I am a true Christian. He spoke humbly shaking with intense feeling. There were even tears in his eyes. He suddenly spread his arms wide and turned his face to the sky. May God strike me dead this very moment if I lie. I drew serpent breath, her blade scraping loud and fast on her scabbard's throat. Lord Uhtred! Ethelfled called in alarm. No! I was about to do your God's work, I said, and strike him dead. You'd stop me. God can do his own work, Ethelfled said tartly, then looked back to the Danish priest. Father Harold, are you convinced of Jarl Haston's conversion? I am, my lady. He shed tears of contrition and tears of joy at his baptism. Praise God, Father Chilnath whispered. Enough, I said. I still held serpent breath. Why aren't our men inside the fort? They will be, Cholnath said waspishly. It is agreed. Agreed? 
Ethelfled's voice was very guarded, and it was clear she suspected the priests had overstepped their authority in making any agreement without her approval. What has been agreed? she asked. The Jarl Haston, Chilnoth spoke very carefully, begged that he might swear his loyalty to you, my lady, at the Easter Mass. He desires this so that the joy of our Lord's resurrection will consecrate this act of reconciliation. I don't give a rat's turd if he waits till the Ostra's feast, I said, so long as we occupy the fort now. It will be handed over on Easter Sunday, Chilnoth said. That was agreed. Easter Day? Ethelfled asked and any man who knew her well could have detected the unhappiness in her voice. She was no fool, but nor was she ready to discard the hope that Haston truly was a Christian. It will be a cause for rejoicing, Cholnath urged her. And who are you to make that agreement? I demanded. It is a matter for Christians to decide, Cholnath insisted, looking at Ethelfled in hope of her support. Ethelfled, in turn, looked at me, then to Haston. Why, she asked, should we not occupy the fort now? I agreed, Cholnoth began weakly. My lady, Haston intervened, shuffling forward on his knees, it is my sincerest wish that all my men be baptised at Easter, but some, a few, are reluctant. I need time. Father Harold needs time. We need time to convince those reluctant few of the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Twisted bastard, I said. No one spoke for a moment. I swear this is true, Haston said humbly. Whenever he says that, I looked at Ethelfled, you can tell that he's lying. And if Father Cholnoth were to visit us, Heston went on, or better still, Father Leofston, and if they were to preach to us, that would be a help and a blessing, my lady. I would be happy to, Cholnoth began, but stopped when Ethelfled raised a hand. She said nothing for a while, but just gazed down at Heston. You propose a mass baptism? she asked. All my men, my lady, Haston said eagerly, all of them coming to Christ's mercy and to your service. How many men, you turd? I asked Haston. There's just a few, Lord Uhtred, who persist in their paganism. Twenty men, perhaps, or thirty. But with God's help, we shall convert them. How many men in the fort, you miserable bastard? He hesitated, then realised that hesitation was a mistake and smiled. Five hundred and eighty, Lord Uhtred? That many, Father Cholnoth exulted. It will be a light to lighten the Gentiles, he pleaded with Ethelfled. Imagine it, my lady, a mass conversion of pagans. We can baptise them in the river. You can drown the bastards, I muttered. And, my lady, Aston, still on his knees, clasped his hands as he gazed up at Ethelfled. His face was so trustworthy and his voice so earnest. He was the best liar I had ever met in all my life. I would invite you into the fort now. I would pray with you there, my lady. I would sing God's praises alongside you. But those few of my men are still bitter. They might resist. A little time is all I beg. A little time for God's grace to work on those bitter souls. You treacherous piece of arse slime, I snarled at him. And if it will convince you, Haston said humbly, ignoring me, I will swear loyalty to you now, my lady, this very minute. God be praised, Father Cholbert lisped. There's one small problem, I said, 
and everyone looked at me. He can't swear an oath to you, my lady. Ethelfled gave me a sharp look. Why not? Because he swore loyalty to another lord, my lady, and that lord has not yet released him from his oath. I was released from my oath to Jarl Raniel when I gave my allegiance to Almighty God, Haston said. But not from the oath you swore to me, I said. But you were also a pagan, Lord Uhtred, Haston said slyly, and Jesus Christ absolves me of all allegiance to pagans. This is true, Father Cholnath said excitedly. He has cast off the devil, my lady. He has spurned the devil and all his works. A newly converted Christian is absolved of all oaths made to pagans. The church insists on it. Ethelfled still pondered. Finally, she looked at Leofston. You haven't spoken, father? Leofston half smiled. I promised the Lord Uhtred I would not interfere with his work if he did not interfere with mine. He offered Father Cholnoth an apologetic smile. I rejoice in the conversion of pagans, my lady, but the fate of a fortress, alas, that is beyond my competence. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, my lady, and the fate of Eads by Rig is Caesar's affair, or or more strictly, yours. Ethelfled nodded abruptly and gestured at Haston. But do you believe this man? Believe him? Leofston frowned. May I question him? Do, Ethelfled commanded. Leofston limped to Haston and knelt in front of him. Give me your hands, Leofston said quietly and waited as Haston dutifully obeyed. Now, tell me, the bishop-elect still spoke softly, what you believe. Haston blinked back his tears. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, he spoke scarcely above a whisper, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son of God, Begotten of the Father, God of God, light of light. His voice had risen as he said the last few words, and then he seemed to choke. I believe, Father, he pleaded, and the tears ran down his face again. He shook his head. The Lord Uhtred is right. He is right. I have been a sinner. I have broken oaths. I have offended heaven. Yet Father Harold prayed with me. He prayed for me. And my wife prayed, and praise God, I believe. Praise God indeed, Leofston said. Does Raniel know you're a Christian? I asked harshly. It was necessary to deceive him, Haston said humbly. Why? Haston still had his hands in Leofston's grip. I was driven to take refuge on man. He was answering my question, but looking up at Ethelfled as he spoke, and it was on that island that Father Harold converted me. Yet we were surrounded by pagans who would kill us if they knew. I prayed. He looked back to Leofston. I prayed for guidance. Should I stay and convert the heathen? Yet God's answer was to bring my followers here and offer our swords to the service of Christ. To the service of Raniel, I said harshly. The Jarl Raniel did demand my service. Haston was speaking to Ethelfled again. But I saw God's will in that demand. God had offered us a way off the island. I had no ships. I only had faith in Christ Jesus and in Saint Weber. Saint Weber? Ethelfled exclaimed. My dear wife prays to her, my lady, Haston said, sounding so innocent. Somehow the slimy bastard had learned of Ethelfled's veneration of the goose frightener. 
you lying bastard, I said. His repentance is sincere, Jolnoth insisted. Father Leofston? Ethelfled asked. I want to believe him, my lady, Leofston said earnestly. I want to believe that this is a miracle to accompany my enthronement, that on Easter Day we will have the joy of bringing a pagan horde into the service of Jesus Christ. This is Christ's doing, Father Chulbert said through his toothless gums. Ethelfled still pondered, staring down at the two kneeling men. One part of her surely knew I was right, but she was also swayed by the piety she had inherited from her father, and by Leofston's eagerness to believe. Leofston was her choice. She had persuaded the Archbishop of Contwariburg to appoint him. She had written letters to bishops and abbots praising Leofston's sincerity and glowing faith, and she had sent money to shrines and churches, all to sway opinion in Leofston's favour. The church might have preferred a more worldly man who could expand the sea's land holdings and extort more cash from northern Mercia's nobles, but Ethelfled had wanted a saint. And that saint was now depicting Haston's conversion as a sign of heavenly approval of her choice. Think, my lady. Leofston at last let go of Haston's hands and still on his knees turned to Ethelfled. Think what rejoicing there will be when a pagan leads his men to Christ's throne. And that idea seduced her too. Her father had always forgiven Danes who converted, even allowing some to settle in Wessex, and Alfred had often claimed that the fight was not to establish Ingleland, but to convert the heathen to Christ, and Ethelfled saw this mass conversion of heathen Danes as a sign of God's power. She urged Gast forward a pace. You will swear loyalty to me now. With joy, my lady, Haston said, with joy. I spat towards the treacherous bastard, walked away, slammed serpent breath back into her scabbard and hauled myself into Tintrick's saddle. Lord Uhtred, Lady Ethelfled called sharply, where are you going? Back to the river, I said curtly. Finnan, see trick all of you, with me. We rode away from whatever farce was about to happen outside Eid Byrig. One hundred and twenty-three of us rode. We rode our horses through the ranks of Ethelfled's followers, then turned north and rode towards the river. But once among the trees, and well hidden from the fools who surrounded Ethelfled, I turned my men eastwards because I was determined to do the Christian God's work and strike Haston dead. We rode fast, our horses twisting through trees. Finnan spurred alongside me. What are we doing? Taking Eads by rig, I said, of course. Sweet Jesus. I said nothing as Tintreg dropped into a gully of thick ferns then pounded up the short slope beyond. How many men did Haston lead? He had claimed five hundred and eighty, but I did not believe him. He had lost his army along with his reputation at Biemfliot. He had not been present at that battle, but if he had as many as one hundred followers I would be surprised, though doubtless Raniel would have left some men inside the fortress too. How big is the fortress? I asked Finnan. It's Byrig. It's big. If you walked around the walls, how many paces? He thought about his answer. I had turned slightly northwards, setting Tintreg to a long slope that climbed through the oaks and sycamores. Nine hundred? Fernan guessed. Maybe a thousand. That's what I reckon. It's a big place, sure enough. King Alfred had tried to reduce life to rules. Most of those rules, of course, came from his Christian scriptures, but there had been others. The towns he built were measured, and each plot of land carefully surveyed. The walls of the town were also measured to discover their height, depth, and extent, and it had been that last figure, the length of the wall, which determined how many men were needed to defend the town. 
That number had been worked out by clever priests rattling wooden balls along wire strings, and their conclusion was that each burr needed four defenders for every five paces of wall. Wessex had become a garrison under Alfred, its borders studded with the newly built burrs and the walls manned by the feared. Every large town had been walled so that the Danes, piercing deep into Wessex, would be frustrated by ramparts, and those ramparts would be defended by an exact number of men corresponding to the wall's total length. It had worked, and Mercia was now the same. As Ethelfled reconquered Mercia's ancestral lands, she secured them with burrs like Chester and Brunnenburr, and ensured that the garrison could supply four men for every five paces of rampart. At the first sign of trouble, folk could retreat into the nearest burr, taking their livestock with them. A whole army was needed to capture a burr, and the Danes had never succeeded. Their way of war was to raid deep, to capture slaves and cattle, and an army that stayed still, that remained camped outside the walls of a burr, was soon struck by disease. Besides, no enemy army had ever proved big enough to surround a burr and starve it into submission. The strategy of the burrs had worked. But it worked because there were men to defend them. Every man over the age of twelve was expected to fight. They might not be trained warriors like the men I now led through the rising woodland, but they could hold a spear or throw a rock or swing an axe. That was the feared. The army of farmers and butchers and craftsmen. The feared might not be armoured with mail or carry lindenwood shields, but its men could line the walls of a burr and hack enemies to death if they tried to climb the ramparts. A woodsman's axe in the hands of a strong farmer is a fearsome weapon, as is a sharpened hoe if swung fiercely enough. Four men to every five paces, and Eads Byrig was a thousand paces, and that meant Haston would need at least seven hundred men to defend the whole length of its ramparts. I'd be surprised, I told Finnan, if he had two hundred men. Then why is he staying there? And that was a good question. Why had Ragnall left a garrison in Eads Byrig? I did not believe for a moment that Haston had decided to stay south of the Mercy in order to seek Ethelfled's protection. He was only there because Ragnall wanted him there. We had slowed now, the horses walking uphill, their hooves loud in the leaf mould. So why had Ragnall left Haston behind? Haston was not the best fighter in Ragnall's army. He might well have been the worst, but he was certainly the best liar. And suddenly I understood. I had thought Eads Byrig was a deception aimed at the weak king in Yofawick, but it was not. It was aimed at us, at me. He's staying, I told Fennan, because Raniel's coming back. He has to take Yofawick first, Fennan said dryly. I curbed Tintrig and held up my hand to stop my men. Stay mounted, I told them then slid out of the saddle and threw the reins to Godric. Keep Tintrig here, I told him. Finnan and I walked slowly uphill. Ingvar's support will crumble, I told Finnan. He's a weakling. Ranul will find himself king of Yofowick without a struggle. Jarls will already be flocking to him, bringing men, swearing allegiance. He doesn't even need to go to Yofowick. He can send three hundred men to take the city from Ingvar, turn around and come back here. He just wants us to think that he's going there. The trees were thinning, and I caught a glimpse of the raw new timbers of Eads Byrig's eastern wall. We stooped and crept forward, wary of any sentry on the high timber ramparts. And Ranyol has to reward his followers, I went on. What better than land in northern Mercia? But Eads Byrig? Finnan sounded dubious. It's a foothold in Mercia, I said, and a base to attack Chester. He needs a big victory, something to send the signal that he's a winner. 
He wants even more men to come across the sea, and to bring them, he has to strike a heavy blow. Capturing Yofawik doesn't count. It's had half a dozen kings in as many years, but if he takes Chester... If, Fennan said, still dubious, if he captures Chester, I went on, he destroys Ethelfled's reputation. He gains territory. He controls the Mercy and the Dee. He has burrs to frustrate us. He'll lose men in the assault, but he has men to lose. But to do that, he needs Eads Byrig. That's his base. Once inside Eads Byrig, we'll never get him out. But if we hold Eads Byrig, then he'll find it damned hard to besiege Chester. By now we were at the edge of the trees where we crouched in the undergrowth and stared at the newly made walls above us. They were taller than a man and protected by the outer ditch. How many men do you see there? I asked. Not one. It was true. There was not a single man or spear point visible above Eads Byrig's eastern wall. There's no fighting platform, I said. Finnan frowned. He was thinking. There, just a hundred paces from us, was a wall, but no visible defenders. There had to be sentries there, but if there was no fighting platform, then those men were looking through the chinks between the newly felled logs, and those logs were uneven, their tops not yet aligned. The wall had been built in a hurry. It's a bluff, he said. It's all a bluff. Haston's conversion is a bluff. He's just buying time till Raniel can get back here. Four days, five? That quickly? He's probably already on his way back, I said. It seemed obvious now. He had burned his bridge of boats to make us think he had abandoned Mercia, but to return, all he needed to do was march a few miles eastwards and follow the Roman road south to where it bridged the Mercy. He was coming. I was sure of it. But how many bastards are inside those walls? Finnan asked. Only one way to find out. He chuckled. <laughs> and you were always telling young Ethelston to be cautious before starting a fight. There's a time for caution, I said, and a time to just kill the bastards. He nodded. But how do we cross that wall? We don't have ladders. So I told him. Twelve of my youngest men led the assault. My son was among them. The trick was to reach the wall fast and to cross it fast. We had no ladders, and the wall was some nine or ten feet high. But we did have horses. That was how we had captured Chester. My son had stood on his horse's saddle and climbed over the gate, and that is what I told the twelve young men to do. Ride fast to the wall and use the height of the horse to reach the wall's top. The rest of us would follow hard behind. I would have liked to have led the twelve, but I was not as agile as I had been. This was a job for young men. And if there are two hundred bastards waiting for them on the other side? Vernon asked. Then they don't cross the wall, I said. And if Lady Ethelred has just agreed a truce? I ignored that question. I suspected that the happy Christians were agreeing to let Haston stay on the hilltop till Easter, but I was not part of that agreement because Haston was my man. He had sworn loyalty to me. That oath might have been a long time ago, and Haston had broken it repeatedly, but an oath was still an oath, and he owed me obedience. Christians might declare that an oath sworn to a pagan had no force, but I was under no compulsion to believe that. Haston was my man, like it or not, and he had no right to make a truce with Ethelred unless I agreed, and I wanted the bastard dead. Go, I told my son, go! The twelve men spurred their horses, crashing through undergrowth and out onto the cleared land. I let them get twenty or thirty paces ahead, then kicked Tintrig. All of you, I called, with me! My son was ahead of the rest, his horse pounding up the slope. I saw his stallion drop into the ditch and struggle up the far side where Uhtred reached with both hands for the wall's top. He scrabbled with his feet, 
swung a leg over and now the rest of the dozen were pulling themselves up onto the logs. One man fell back, rolling into the ditch. The abandoned horses just stood there in our way. And then the wall fell. I had just reached the ditch. It was shallow because Haston's men had not had time to deepen it again. There were no stakes, no obstacles, just a steep short bank climbing to the earth wall's crest where the logs had been sunk. But they had not been buried deep enough, and the weight of the men on their tops was throwing them down. Tintrig shied away from the noise, and I wrenched him back. Horsemen went past me, not bothering to dismount, just spurring the stallions up the bank and onto the fallen logs. Dismount! Fennin shouted. A horse slipped and fell on the logs. The beast was thrashing and screaming, driving other men to the edges of the gap that was not wide enough for the mass of frightened horses and scurrying men. Dismount! Fennin bellowed again. Come on foot! Shields! Shield! I want shields! That was the order to make a shield wall. Men were flinging themselves out of their saddles and flooding over the fallen wall. I led Tintreg by his reins. Keep your horse with you, I called to Berg. In front of me were the fallen logs that had tilted down into the inner ditch, beyond which was the second earth wall. Neither was a formidable obstacle. My men were clambering over the fallen wall, drawing their swords, while ahead of us were three large huts, newly built with rough timber walls and bright thatch, and beyond the huts were men, but those men were a long way off at the fort's further end. As far as I could see, there had been no sentries at this end of the fort. Shield wall! I shouted. On me! Finnan was standing just beyond the three huts, arms spread to show where he wanted the shield wall to form. Berg, help me! I called, and Berg cupped his hands and heaved me back into Tintreg's saddle. I drew serpent breath. Mount up and follow me, I snarled at Berg. I spurred around the end of our hastily forming wall. Now I could see the rest of the fort. Two hundred men. I doubted there were more than two hundred. Those men had been gathered at the fort's far end, doubtless waiting to hear what agreement had been reached with Ethelfled, and now we were behind them. But closer to us, and even more numerous, was a crowd of women and children. They were running. A handful of men were with them, all of them fleeing our sudden invasion of the fort's eastern end. We have to stop those fugitives, I told Berg. Come on! I spurred Tintrig forward. I was Uhtred, Lord of Bebenberg, in my war glory. The arm rings of fallen enemies glinted on my forearms, my shield was newly painted with the snarling wolf's head of my house, while another wolf, this one of silver, crouched on the crest of my polished helmet. My mail was tight, polished with sand, my sword belt and scabbard and bridle and saddle were studded with silver. There was a gold chain at my neck, my boots were panelled with silver, my drawn sword was grey with the whirls of its making running from the hilt to its hungry tip. I was the Lord of War, mounted on a great black horse, and together we would make panic. I charged through the fleeing people, cutting Tintrug in front of a woman running with a child in her arms. A man heard the hooves and turned to swing an axe. Too late. Serpent Breath drank her first blood of the day and the woman screamed. Berg was threading the crowd, sword low and my son had remounted his horse and was leading three other riders into the chaos. Cut them off, I yelled at him, and steered Tintreg towards the leading fugitives. I wanted to keep them between my shield wall and the larger number of enemy who were hurrying into their own shield wall at the fortress's further end. Drive them back, I called to my son. Back towards Finnan. Then I galloped Tintreg in front of the crowd, my sword low and threatening. I was causing panic, but panic with a purpose. We were herding the women and children back towards our own shield wall. Dogs howled and children screamed, but back they went, desperate to escape the thumping hooves and the light-glinting swords as our horses crossed and recrossed in front of them. Now come forward, 
I shouted at Finnan, but come slowly. I stayed close to the crowd, which, terrified of our big horses, shrank towards Finnan's advancing shield wall. I told Berg to watch my back while I looked at the rest of the fort. More huts stretched down the southern flank, but most of the interior was worn grass on which massive log piles were stacked. Haston had started constructing a hall at the further end, where his men now formed their shield wall. It was a wall of three ranks and it was wider than our wall. Wider and deeper, and above it was Haston's old banner, the bleached skull on its long pole. The shield wall looked formidable, but Haston's men were almost as panicked as their wives and children. Some were shouting and pointing at us, plainly wanting to advance and fight, but others were looking back to the far ramparts, which, as far as I could see, was the only stretch of wall that had been given fighting platforms. The men on those platforms were watching Ethelfled's troops. One man was shouting at the shield wall, but was too far away for me to hear what he said. Finnan! I bellowed. Lord! Burn those huts! I wanted Ethelfled's troops to menace that far rampart, and so keep the enemy looking both ways, and the sight of smoke should at least tell them that Haston's fortress was in trouble. And come faster! I pointed serpent breath towards the enemy line. Let's kill them! Finnan gave the command, and his shield wall doubled its pace. They began beating their swords against their shields as they advanced, driving the fugitives in front of them. Let them go, I called to my son, but keep them in the centre of the fort. He understood immediately and wheeled his horse away, taking his men to the northern side of the fortress. Berg, I summoned him, we'll manage this southern flank. What are we doing, Lord? Letting the women and children go to their men, I said, but make them go straight ahead. It is a hard and bloody task to break a shield wall. Two lines of men must clash together and try to break the other with axes, spears and swords. But for every enemy who is struck down, there is another ready to take his place. Whoever commanded Haston's men in the fort had three ranks of warriors waiting for us, while Finnan only had two ranks. Our shield wall was too thin. It was outnumbered. But if we could break their line, then we would turn the hilltop's turf dark with their blood. And that was why I shepherded the women and children straight towards the enemy's shield wall. Those fugitives would be frantic to escape the grim noise of our swords beating a rhythm on the painted shields, and they would claw their way through Haston's wall. Their panic would infect his men. Their desperate attempts to escape our blades would open gaps in Haston's wall, and we would use the gaps to split the wall into small groups that could be slaughtered. And so our few horsemen galloped out of the space between the two shield walls, and the women and children, seeing escape, ran for the refuge of their own menfolk's shields. Berg and I made sure they could not run around the end of the enemy's wall, but were forced to go straight towards Haston's shields, and Finnan, Seeing what was happening quickened his pace still further. My men were chanting, beating blades on willow, cheering. And I knew we had an easy victory. I could smell the enemy's fear and see their panic. They had been left here by Raniel and told to keep Eadsbyrig safe till his return, and Haston was relying on trickery and lies to keep the fort secure. The new wall had looked formidable, but it was a sham. The logs had not been sunk deep enough, and so it had toppled. Now we were inside the fort, and Ethelfled had scores more men outside, and Haston's troops saw annihilation coming. Their families were clawing at them, desperate to open the locked shields and get behind the wall, and Finnan saw the gaps appear and ordered the charge. Kill the men! I shouted. We are cruel. Now that I am old and the brightest sunlight is dim and the roar of the waves crashing on rocks is muted, I think of all the men I have sent to Valhalla. Bench after bench is filled by them, 
brave men, spear Danes, staunch fighters, fathers and husbands whose blood I loosed and bones I shattered. When I remember that fight on Eads Byrig's hilltop, I know I could have demanded their surrender, and the skull banner would have fallen, and the swords would have been tossed to the turf. But we were fighting Raniel the Cruel. That was the name he craved for himself, and a message had to be given to Raniel the Cruel, or rather to his men, that we were to be feared even more than Raniel. I knew we would have to fight him, that eventually our shield wall would have to meet his shield wall, and I wanted his men to have fear in their hearts when they faced us. And so we killed. The enemy's panic broke his own shield wall. Men, women and children fled for the gate behind them, and they were too many to get through the narrow entrance, and so they crowded behind it, and my men killed them there. We are cruel. We are savage. We are warriors. I let Tentrig pick his own path. Some few men tried to escape by climbing over the wall, and I slashed them off the logs with serpent breath. I wounded rather than killed. I wanted dead men, but I also wanted crippled men to stagger north and take a message to Raniel. The screams clawed at my ears. Some of the enemy tried to shelter in the half-built hall, but Finnan's shield warriors were in a slaughtering mood. Spears took men in the back. Children watched their fathers die. Women shrieked for their husbands, and still my wolf soldiers went on killing, hacking down with swords and axes, lunging with spears. Our shield wall was no more. There was no need for it because the enemy was not fighting back but trying to escape. Some few men tried to fight. I saw two turn on Finnan, and the Irishman shouted at his companions to stand back, and I watched him throw down his shield and taunt the two. He parried their clumsy attacks and used his speed to first pierce one in the waist, then plunge the blade deep, and then duck the other man's savage blow, ripped the sword free and thrust it two-handed into the second assailant's throat. He made it look easy. A spearman charged me, face contorted, shouting that I was a turd, and he aimed a spear at Tintrig's belly, knowing that if he could bring the stallion down, then I would be easy meat for his blade. He could see from my helmet, from the gold and silver that adorned my belt, bridle and boots and scabbard, that I was a warrior of renown. But to kill me at his own dying would give his name glory. A poet might even sing of him, might sing the lay of Uhtred's death. And I let him come, then touched my heels to Tintrig, and he leapt ahead and the spearman was forced to swing the blade, which, instead of opening the stallion's belly, scored a bloody cut along his flank, and I cut back with serpent breath, breaking the spear's ash shaft, and the man leapt after me, seizing my right leg and tried to haul me down from the saddle, I stabbed Serpent Breath down, the blade scraping his helmet's rim to rake his face, slashing off nose and chin, and his blood soaked my right boot as he twisted back in sudden pain, releasing me, and I gave him another blow, this time splitting his helmet. He made a gurgling sound, half crying, clutching his hands to his ruined face as I kicked Tintrig on. Men were surrendering, they were throwing down their shields, dropping their weapons and kneeling on the grass. Their women shielded them, shrieking at my killers to stop their madness, and I decided the women were right. We had killed enough. Finnan, I said. Take prisoners. And the horn sounded from beyond the gate. The fight, which had begun so suddenly, ended abruptly almost as if the horn were a signal to both sides. It sounded again urgently, and I saw the crowd at the gate push back into the fort to make way. Bishop Leofston appeared, mounted on his gelding with his legs almost dangling to the ground. A rather more impressive band of warriors followed the priest, led by Mirwala, and all of them surrounding Ethelfled. 
Haston and his men came next, while behind them were still more of Ethelfled's Mercians. You have broken the truce, Father Cholnuth accused me, more in sorrow than in anger. Lord Uhtred, you broke the solemn promise we made. He looked at the bodies sprawled on the turf, bodies that were gutted, their intestines mangled with shattered mail, bodies with brains leaking from split helmets, bodies red with blood that was already attracting flies. We made a promise before God, he said sadly. Father Harold, his face taut with anger, knelt and took the hand of a dying man. You have no honour, he spat at me. I kicked Tintrug forward and dropped Serpent Breath's bloody point so that it touched the Danish priest's neck. You know what they call me, I asked him. They call me the priest killer. Speak to me of honour again and I'll make you eat your own turds. You, he began, but I slapped his head hard with the flat of Serpent Breath's blade, knocking him to the turf. You lied, priest, I said. You lied. So don't talk to me of honour. He went silent. Finnan, I snarled. Disarm them all. Ethelfled pushed her horse to the front of the defeated Northman. Why? She asked me bitterly. Why? They are enemies. The fort would have surrendered on Easter Day. My lady, I said tiredly. Haston has never told the truth in his life. He swore an oath to me. And I never released him from his oath to me, I snapped back at her, suddenly angry. Haston is my man, sworn to me. No amount of priests or praying can change that. And you, she said, are sworn to me. So your men are my men, and I made a pact with Haston. I turned my horse. Bishop Leofston had come close, but recoiled from me. Both Tintrug and I were smeared with blood. We stank of it. My sword blade glittered with it. I stood in the stirrups and shouted at Haston's men, those who survived. All of you who are Christians, step forward. I waited. Hurry, I shouted. I want all the Christians over here. I pointed my sword towards an empty patch of turf between two of the log stacks. Haston opened his mouth to speak and I swept Serpent Breath around to point at him. One word from you, I said, and I'll cut your tongue out. He closed his mouth. Christians, I bellowed. Over here, now. Four men moved. Four men and perhaps thirty women. That was all. Now, look at the rest, I said to Ethelfled, pointing at the men who had not moved. See what's hanging at their necks, my lady? Do you see crosses or hammers? Hammers, she said the word quietly. He lied, I said. He told you that all but a few of his men were Christians that they were waiting for Eostra's feast to convert the others, but look at them. They're pagans like me, and Haston lies. He always lies. I pushed Tintrug through her men, speaking as I went. He was told to hold on to Eads Byrig until Raniel returns, and that will be soon. And so he lied because he can't speak the truth. His tongue is bent. He breaks oaths, my lady, and he swears black is white and white is black, and men believe him because he has honey on his bent tongue. But I know him, my lady, because he's my man. He's sworn to me. And with that, I leaned down from the saddle and took hold of Haston's mail coat, shirt and cloak and hauled him up. He was much heavier than I expected, but I heaved him over the saddle and then turned Tintrig back. I've known him all my life, my lady, I said, and in all that time he has never spoken one true word. He twists like a serpent, he lies like a weasel, and he has the courage of a mouse. Bruner, 
Haston's wife, began screaming at me from the back of the crowd, then pushed her way through with her big, meaty fists. She was calling me a murderer, a heathen, a creature of the devil, and she was a Christian. I knew. Haston had even encouraged her conversion because it had persuaded King Alfred to treat him leniently. He twisted on my saddle, and I thumped his arse with Serpent Breath's heavy hilt. Utrid, I shouted at my son, if that fat bitch lays a finger on me or my horse, break her damned neck. Lord Utrid? Leofston half moved to stop me, then looked at the blood on Serpent Breath and on Tintrig's flank and stepped back. What, father? I asked. He knew the creed. He spoke hesitantly. I know the creed, father. Does that make me a Christian? Leofston looked heartbroken. He's not. He's not, I said, and I'll prove it to you. Watch. I threw Haston off the horse, then dismounted. I threw the reins to Godric, then nodded at Haston. You have your sword? Draw it. No, Lord, he said. You won't fight. The bastard turned to Ethelfled. Doesn't our lord command us to love our enemies? To turn the other cheek? If I am to die, my lady, I die a Christian. I die as Christ died willingly. I die as a witness to... Whatever he was a witness to, he never managed to say because I hit him over the back of his helmet with the flat of serpent breath. The blow knocked him flat on the ground. Get up, I said. My lady, he said, looking up at Ethelfled. Get up, I shouted. Stand, Ethelfled commanded him. She was watching very closely. Haston stood. Now fight, you slime turd, I told him. I will not fight, he said. I forgive you. He made the sign of the cross, then had the gall to drop to his knees and clasp the silver cross in both his hands, which he held up in front of his face as though he was praying. Saint Weber, he called, pray for me now and at the hour of my death. I swung Serpent Breath so hard that Ethelfled gasped. The blade whistled in the air, aiming for Haston's neck. It was a wild swing, lavish and fast, and I checked it at the very last instant so that the bloodied blade stopped just short of Haston's skin. And he did what I knew he would do. His right hand, that had been clutching the cross, dropped to the hilt of his sword. He gripped it, though he made no attempt to draw it. I touched Serpent Breath's blade to his neck. Are you frightened? I asked him, that you won't go to Valhalla? Is that why you gripped your sword? Let me live, he begged, and I'll tell you what Raniel plans. I know what Raniel plans. I pressed Serpent Breath against the side of his neck and he shuddered. You're not worth fighting, I said, and I looked past Ethelfled to her nephew. Prince Ethelston, come here. Ethelston looked at his aunt, but she just nodded, and he slid from his saddle. You'll fight, Haston, I told Ethelston, because it's time you killed a Jarl, even a pathetic Jarl like this one. I took my sword from Haston's neck. Get up, I ordered him. Haston stood. He glanced at Ethelston. You'd make me fight a boy? Beat the boy, and you live, I promised him. And Ethelston was little more than a boy, slender and young, while Haston was experienced in war. Yet Haston must have known I would not risk Ethelston's life, unless I was confident that the youngster would win, and, knowing that, Haston tried to cheat. He drew his sword and ran at Ethelston, who had been waiting for my command to start the fight. Haston roared as he charged, then swung his blade, but Ethelston was fast, sidestepping the charge and ripping his own long blade free of its scabbard. 
He parried the backswing and I heard the clangor of swords and watched as Haston turned to deliver an overhead blow designed to split Ethelston's skull in two. But the young man just swayed back, let the blade pass him, then mocked his older enemy with laughter. He lowered his own sword, inviting another attack, but Haston was cautious now. He was content to circle Ethelston, who kept turning to keep his sword facing his foe. I had reason to let Ethelston fight and win. He might have been King Edward's oldest son, and therefore the Etheling of Wessex, but he had a younger half-brother, and there were powerful men in Wessex who favoured the younger boy as their next king. That was not because the younger boy was better, stronger, or wiser, but simply because he was the grandson of Wessex's most powerful elderman, and to fight the influence of those wealthy men, I would pay a poet bright gold to make a song of this fight, and it would not matter that the song bore no resemblance to the fight, only that it made Ethelston into a hero who had fought a Danish chieftain to the death in the woods of northern Mercia. Then I would send the poet south into Wessex to sing the song in firelit mead halls so that men and women would know that Ethelston was worthy. My men were jeering Haston now, shouting that he was frightened of a lad, goading him to attack, but Haston stayed cautious. Then Ethelston advanced a step and cut at the Dane, his stroke almost casual, but he was judging the swiftness of the older man's responses, and what he discovered he liked, because he began attacking with short, sharp strokes, forcing Haston back, not trying to wound him yet but simply to force Haston onto his back foot and give him no time to make his own assault. Then suddenly he stepped back, flinching as though he had pulled a muscle, and Haston lunged at him, and Ethelston stepped aside and chopped down hard, viciously hard, the stroke as fast as a swift wing beat, and the blade struck Haston's right knee with savage force, and the older man stumbled, and Ethelston hacked down hard to cut through the mail of Haston's shoulder, and so drove the Dane to the turf. I saw the battle joy on Ethelston's face, and heard Haston cry out in despair, as the young man stepped over him with his sword raised for the killing blow. Hold! I shouted. Hold! Step back! My watching men fell silent. Ethelston looked puzzled but nevertheless obeyed me and stepped back from his defeated enemy. Haston was flinching with pain, but managed to struggle to his feet. He staggered unsteadily on his wounded right leg. You will spare my life, Lord? He asked me. I will be your man. You are my man, I said, and I took hold of his right arm. He understood then what I was about to do and his face was distorted with despair. No! he shouted. I beg you, no! I gripped his wrist, then twisted the sword out of his hand. No! he wailed. No! No! I tossed the sword away and stepped back. Finish your work, I told Ethelston curtly. Give me my sword! Haston cried and limped a painful step towards the fallen blade, but I stood in his path. So you can go to Valhalla, I sneered. You think you can share ale with those good men who wait for me in the bone hall? Those brave men. And why does a Christian believe in Valhalla? He said nothing. I looked at Ethelfled, then at Chilnath. Did you hear? I demanded. This good Christian wants to go to Valhalla. You still think he's a Christian? Ethelfled nodded to me, accepting the proof, but Cholnoth would not meet my gaze. My sword, Haston said, tears on his cheeks, but I just beckoned Ethelston forward and stepped aside. No, Haston wailed. My sword, I beg you. He gazed at Ethelfled. My lady, give me my sword. Why? she asked coldly. 
and Haston had no answer. Ethelfled nodded to her nephew, and Ethelston skewered Haston with his blade, lunging the steel straight into Haston's belly, straight through mail and skin and sinew and flesh, and he ripped the sword up, grunting with the effort as he looked his enemy in the eye, and the blood was gushing with the man's guts as they spilled on Eads Byrig's thin turf. So died Haston the Dane. And Raniel was coming. He would be harder to kill. Chapter 6 We had taken too many prisoners, and too many of those prisoners were warriors, who, if they lived, were likely to fight us again. Most were Raniel's followers, a few had been Haston's men, but all were dangerous. If we had just let them loose, they would have rejoined Raniel's army that was already powerful enough. So my advice was to kill every last one of them. We could not feed almost two hundred men, let alone their families, and I had youngsters in my ranks who needed practice with sword or spear. But Ethelfled shrank from the slaughter. She was not a weak woman, far from it, and in the past she had watched impassively as other prisoners had been killed, but she was in a merciful, or perhaps a squeamish mood. So, what would you have me do with them? I asked. The Christians can stay in Mercia, she said, frowning at the handful who had confessed to her faith. And the rest? Just don't kill them, she said brusquely. So, in the end, I had my men hack off the prisoners' sword hands that we collected in Saxful. There were also forty-three dead men on the hilltop, and I ordered all of their corpses beheaded and the severed heads brought to me. The prisoners were then released, along with the older captives, all of them sent east along the Roman road. I told them they would find a crossroads a half-day's walk away, and if they turned north it would take them across the river and back into Northumbria. You'll meet your master coming the other way, I told them, and you can give him a message. If he comes back to Chester, he'll lose more than one hand. We kept the young women and children. Most would be sent to the slave markets of London, but a few would probably find new husbands among my men. We carted all the captured weapons to Chester, where they would be given to the feared, replacing hoes or sharpened spades. Then we pulled down Eads Byrig's newly made wall. It fell easily and we used the logs to make a great funeral pyre on which we burned the headless bodies. The corpses shriveled in the fire, curling up as they shrank, and sending the stench of death east with the plume of smoke. Raniel, I thought, would see that smoke and wonder if it was an omen. Would it deter him? I doubted it. He would surely realise that it was Eads Byrig that burned so fiercely, but his ambition would persuade him to ignore the omen. He would be coming. And I wanted to welcome him, and so I left forty-three logs standing like pillars spaced about Eads Byrig's perimeter, and we pegged a severed head to each of those, and next day I had the bloody hands nailed onto trees either side of the Roman road, so that when Raniel returned he would be greeted first by the hands, and then by the raven-pecked heads ringing the slighted fort. "'You really think he'll come?' Ethelfled asked me. "'He's coming,' I said firmly. Raniel needed a victory, and to defeat Mercia, let alone Wessex, he needed to capture a burr. There were other burrs he could attack, but Chester had to tempt him. Control Chester, and he would command the seaways to Ireland and dominate all of northwestern Mercia. It would be an expensive victory, but Raniel had men to spend. He would come. It was night time, two days after we had taken Eads Byrig, and the two of us were standing above Chester's northern gate, staring at a sky filled with bright stars. If he wants Chester so badly... Ethelfled asked after a moment's quiet. Why didn't he come here as soon as he landed? Why go north first? Because, 
By taking Northumbria, I said, he doubled the size of his army. And he doesn't want an enemy at his back. If he had besieged us without taking Northumbria, then he would have given Ingvar time to assemble troops. Ingvar of Jofferwick is weak, she said scornfully. I resisted the temptation to ask why, if she believed that, she had resolutely refused to invade Northumbria. I knew the answer. She wanted to secure the rest of Mercia first, and she would not invade the North without her brother's support. He might be weak, I said instead, but he's still King of Jorvik. Jofferwick, she corrected me. And Jorvik's walls are formidable, I went on and Ingvar still has followers. If Raniel gave him time, then Ingvar could probably gather a thousand men. By going north, Raniel panics, Ingvar. Men in Northumbria face a choice now, Ingvar or Raniel, and you know who they'll choose. Raniel, she said quietly. Because he's a beast and a fighter, they're scared of him. If Ingvar has any sense, he's on a ship now going back to Denmark. And you think Raniel will come here? She said. Within a week, I guess. Maybe as soon as tomorrow. She stared at the glow of fire on the eastern horizon. Those campfires had been lit by our men, who were still at Eads Byrig. They had to finish the fortress's destruction, and then, I hoped find a way to capture the handful of ships that Raniel had left on the Mercy's northern bank. I had put young Ethelston in command there, though I made sure he had older men to advise him. Yet, even so, I touched the hammer that hung from my neck and prayed to the gods that he did nothing foolish. I should make Eads Byrig a burr, Ethelfled said. You should, I said, but you won't have time before Raniel gets here. I know that, she said impatiently. But without Eads Byrig, I said, he'll be in trouble. What's to stop him making new walls? We stop him, I said firmly. Do you know how long it will take to make a proper wall around that hilltop? Not that fake thing Haston put up, but a real wall. It will take all summer. And you have the rest of the army coming here. We have the feared... We'll outnumber him within a week and we'll give him no peace. We raid, we kill, we haunt him. He can't build walls if his men are constantly in mail and waiting to be attacked. We slaughter his forage parties, we send big war bands into the forest, we make his life a living hell. He'll last two months at most. He'll assault us here, she said. Eventually he will, I said, and I hope he does. He'll fail. These walls are too strong. I'd be more worried about Brunnenburg. Put extra men there and dig the ditch deeper. If he takes Brunnenburg, then he has his fortress and we have problems. I'm strengthening Brunnenburg, she said. Dig the ditch deeper, I said again, deeper and wider, and put two hundred extra men into the garrison. He'll never capture it. It will all be done, she said then touched my elbow and smiled. You sound very confident. By summer's end, I said vengefully, I'll have Raniel's sword and he'll have a grave in Mercia. I touched the hammer at my neck, wondering whether by saying that aloud I had tempted the three Norns who weave our fate at the foot of Yggdrasil. It was not a cold night, but I shivered. Weird Bithful Arad On the night before the Ostra's feast, there was another fight outside the pisspot. A Frisian in Ethelfled's service was killed, while a second man, one of mine, lost an eye. At least a dozen other men were hurt badly before my son and Citric managed to end the street battle. It was my son who brought me the news, waking me in the middle of the night. We've managed to stop the fighting, he said, but it was damn close to being a slaughter. What happened? I asked. Muss happened, he said flatly. Muss? She's too pretty, my son said, and men fight over her. How many is it now? I snarled. Three nights in a row, my son said, but this is the first death. 
It won't be the last unless we stop the little bitch. What little bitch? Edith asked. She had woken and now sat up, clutching the bed pelts to her breasts. Muss, he said. Mouse? She's a whore, I explained, and looked back to my son. So tell Beardnoth that if there's another fight, I'll close his damn tavern down. She doesn't work for Beardnoth anymore. My son spoke from the doorway where he was just a shadow against the darkness of the courtyard behind. And Lady Ethelfled's men are wanting to keep the fight going. Muss doesn't work for Beardnoth now, I asked. I had climbed out of bed and was groping on the floor for something to wear. Not any more, Uhtred said. She did, but I'm told the other whores don't like her. She was too popular. So if the other girls don't like her, what's she doing in the piss pot? She's not. She's working her magic in a shed next door. Her magic? I sneered at that, then pulled on trues and a stinking jerkin. An empty shed? My son ignored the question. It's one of those old hay stores that belong to St. Peter's Church. A church building. That was hardly surprising. Ethelfled had granted half the city's property to the church, and half those buildings were unused. I assumed that Leofston would be putting his cripples and orphans into some of them, but I planned to use most to shelter the feared who would garrison Chester. Many of the feared had already arrived, countrymen and boys bringing axes, spears, hoes and hunting bows. A whore in a church building? I asked as I dragged on boots. The new bishop won't like that. He might love it, my son said, amused. She's a very talented girl. But Beardnoth wants her out of the shed. He says she's ruining his business. So why doesn't he hire her back? Why doesn't he smack the other girls into line and hire the bitch? She won't be hired now. She says she hates Beardnoth, she hates the other girls, and she hates the pisspot. And idiots like you keep her busy, I said savagely. She's a pretty little mouse, he said wistfully. Edith giggled. Expensive? I asked. Anything but? Give her a duck egg and she'll bounce you off the shed walls. Got bruises, have you? I asked him. He did not answer. So, they're fighting over her now. He shrugged. They were. He looked over his shoulder. She seems to favour our men over Ethelfled's, and that causes the trouble. Cedric has a dozen men keeping them apart for now, but for how long? I had covered my clothes with a cloak, but now hesitated. Godric! I shouted, then shouted again until the boy came running. He was my servant, and a good one, but he was of an age when I needed to find another so Godric could stand in the shield wall. Bring me my mail coat, my sword, and a helmet, I said. You're going to fight? My son sounded astonished. I'm going to frighten the mouse bitch, I said. If she's setting our men against Lady Ethelfled's, then she's doing Braniel's work. There was a crowd of men outside the pisspot, their angry faces lit by flaming torches bracketed to the tavern's walls. They were jeering Cetric, who, with a dozen men, guarded the alley that apparently led to the mouse's shed. The crowd fell silent as I arrived. Mirwala appeared at the same moment and looked askance at my mail, helmet and sword. He was soberly dressed in black, with a silver cross hanging at his neck. Lady Ethelfred sent me, he explained, and she's not happy. Nor am I. She's at the vigil, of course. So was I. The vigil? The vigil before Easter, he said, frowning. We pray in church all night and greet the dawn with song. What a wild life you Christians do lead, I said, then looked at the crowd. All of you, I shouted. Go to bed. The excitement's over. One man, with more ale inside him than sense, wanted to protest, but I stalked towards him with my hand on Serpent Breath's hilt and his companions dragged him away. I stood, malevolent and glowering, waiting until the crowd had dispersed, then turned back to Cetric. 
Is the wretched girl still in her shed? Yes, Lord. He sounded relieved that I'd come. Edith had also arrived, tall and striking, in a long green dress and with her flame-red hair loosely tied on top of her head. I beckoned her into the alley and my son followed. There had been a dozen men waiting in the narrow space, but they had vanished as soon as they heard my voice. There were five or six sheds at the alley's end, all of them low wooden buildings that were used to store hay, but only one showed a glimmer of light. There was no door, just an opening that I ducked under, and then stopped. Because, by the gods, the mouse was beautiful. Real beauty is rare. Most of us suffer the pox and so have faces dotted with scars, and what teeth we have left go yellow, and our skin has warts, wens and carbuncles, and we stink like sheep dung. Any girl who survives into womanhood with teeth and a clear skin is accounted a beauty, but this girl had so much more. She had a radiance. I thought of Frigg, the mute girl who had married Knut Ranulfsson, and who now lived on my son's estate, though he thought I did not know. Frigg was glorious and beautiful, but where she was dark and lithe, this girl was fair and generous. She was stark naked, her thighs lifted, and her flawless skin seemed to glow with health. Her breasts were full, but not fallen, her blue eyes lively, her lips plump, and her face full of joy, until I hauled the man out from between her thighs. Go and piss it into a ditch, I snarled at him. He was one of my men, and he pulled up his trues and scuttled out of the shed as if twenty demons were at his arse. The muss fell backwards on the hay. She bounced there, giggling and smiling. <laughs> Welcome again, Lord Uhtred. She spoke to my son, who said nothing. There was a shielded lantern perched on a pile of hay, and I saw my son blush in its dim and flickering light. Talk to me, I growled, not him. She stood and brushed pieces of straw from her perfect skin. Not a scar, not a blemish, though when she turned to me I saw there was a birthmark on her forehead, a small red mark shaped like an apple. It was almost a relief to see that she was not perfect, because even her hands were unscarred. Women's hands grow old fast, burned by pots, worn out by distaffs, and rubbed raw by scrubbing clothes, yet Muss had hands like a baby, soft and flawless. She seemed utterly unworried by her nakedness. She smiled at me and half bobbed down respectfully. Greetings, Lord Uhtred, she spoke demurely, her eyes showing amusement at my anger. Who are you? I'm called Muss. What did your parents name you? Trouble, she said, still smiling. Then listen to me, Trouble, I snarled. You have a choice. Either you work for Beardnoth in the plover next door, or you leave Chester. Do you understand? She frowned and bit her lower lip as she pretended to think then gave me her bright smile again. I was only celebrating Yostra's feast, she said slyly, as I'm told you like it celebrated. What I don't like, I said, biting back my annoyance at her cleverness, is that a man died fighting over you tonight. I tell them not to fight, she said, all wide-eyed and innocent. I don't want them to fight. I want them to... I know what you want, I snarled, but what matters is what I want. And I'm telling you to either work for Beardnoth or leave Chester. She wrinkled her nose. I don't like Beardnoth. You'll like me even less. Oh, no, she said and laughed. Oh, no, Lord, never. You work for Beardnoth. I insisted, or you leave. I won't work for him, Lord, she said. He's so fat and slimy. Your choice, bitch, I said, 
and I was having trouble from keeping my eyes from those beautiful plump breasts and from her small body that was both compact and generous, and she knew I was having trouble, and it amused her. Why, Beardnoth? she asked. Because he won't let you cause trouble, I said. You'll hump who he tells you to hump. Including him, she said. And it's disgusting. It's like being bounced by a greased pig. She gave a shiver of horror. If you won't work at the plover, I ignored her exaggerated shudder, then you're leaving Chester. I don't care where you go, but you're leaving. Yes, Lord, she said meekly, then glanced at Edith. May I dress, Lord? she asked me. Get dressed, I snapped. Cedric? Lord? You'll guard her tonight. Lock her up in one of the granaries and see her on the road south tomorrow. It's Easter tomorrow, Lord. No one will be travelling, he said nervously. Then keep her quiet till someone does go south. Then pack her off and make certain she doesn't come back. Yes, Lord, he said. And tomorrow, I turned on my son, you'll pull down these sheds. Yes, father. And if you do come back, I looked back to the girl, I'll whip the skin off your back till your ribs are showing, you understand? I understand, Lord, she said in a contrite voice. She smiled at Cetric, her jailer, then stooped into a gap between the piles of hay. Her clothes had been carelessly dropped into the gap, and she went down on all fours to retrieve them. I'll just get dressed, she said, and I won't cause you any trouble, I promise. And with those words, she suddenly shot forward and vanished through a hole in the shed's back wall. A small hand snaked back and snatched a cloak or dress, and then she was gone. After her, I said. She had wriggled through the mouse hole, leaving a small pile of coins and hack silver beside the lantern. I stooped, but saw the hole was too small for me to negotiate, so I ducked back into the alley. There was no passage to the rear of the shed, and by the time we had made our way through the neighbouring house she had long disappeared. I stood at an alley's mouth, staring down an empty street and swore in frustration. "'Someone must know where the bitch lives,' I said. "'She's a mouse,' my son said. "'So you need a cat.' I growled. At least I thought I had scared the girl, so perhaps she'd stop her nonsense.' And why did she favour my men over Ethelfled's? Mine were no cleaner or richer. I guessed she was just a troublemaker who enjoyed having men fight over her. You'll pull the sheds down tomorrow, I told my son, and look for the bitch. Find her and lock her up. Edith and I walked back towards our house. She's beautiful, Edith said wistfully. With that birthmark on her forehead... I asked in a hopeless attempt to pretend I did not agree. She is beautiful, Edith insisted. And so are you, I said. And so she was. She smiled at the compliment, though her smile was dutiful, even touched by sadness. She's, what, sixteen? Seventeen? When you find her, you should marry her off. What man would marry a whore like her? I asked savagely, thinking that what I truly wanted was to take the whore to bed and plough her ripe little body. Maybe a husband would tame her, Edith said. Maybe I should marry you, I said impulsively. Edith stopped, looked at me. We were just outside the big church where the Easter vigil was being kept, and a wash of candlelight came through the open door to shadow her face and to glint off the tears on her cheeks. She reached up with both hands and held the cheek pieces of my helmet, then stood on tiptoe to kiss me. God, what fools women make of us. I always liked to make something special of Eostra's feast, hiring jugglers, musicians and acrobats, but Raniel's appearance a few days before the feast had deterred such folk from coming to Chester. The same fear meant that many of the guests invited to Leofston's enthronement had also failed to appear, though St. Peter's Church was still full. 
enthronement. Who in the cloud-filled heavens did these people think they were? Kings sat on thrones. Lady Ethelfled should have had a throne, and sometimes used her dead husband's throne in Gloucester, and when, as a lord, I sat in judgment, I used a throne, not because I was royal, but because I represented royal justice. But a bishop? Why would some weasel-brained bishop need a throne? Wolfherd had a throne larger than King Edward's, a high-backed chair carved with gormless saints and bellowing angels. I asked the fool once why he needed so large a chair for his skinny backside, and he told me he was God's representative in Hereford. It is God's throne, not mine, he had said pompously, though I noted that he screeched in anger if anyone else dared park their bum on the carved seat. Does your God ever visit Hereford? I asked him. He is omnipresent, so yes, he sits on the throne. So you sit on his lap. That's nice. I somehow doubted that the Christian God would be visiting Chester because Leofston had chosen a milking stool as his throne. It was a three-legged stool that he had bought at the market, and it now stood waiting for him in front of the altar. I had wanted to sneak into the church the night before Eostra's feast, to saw a finger's width off two of the legs, but the vigil had thwarted that plan. A stool? I had asked Ethelfled. He's a humble man. But Bishop Wolford says it's your God's throne. God is humble too. A humble God. You might as well have a toothless wolf. The gods are the gods, ruling thunder and commanding storms. They are the lords of night and day, of fire and ice, the givers of disaster and of triumph. To this day I do not understand why folk become Christian, unless it's simply that the other gods enjoy a joke. I have often suspected that Loki, the trickster god, invented Christianity because it has his wicked stench all over it. I can imagine the gods sitting in Asgard one night, all of them bored and probably drunk, and Loki amuses them with a typical piece of his nonsense. Let's invent a carpenter, he suggests, and tell the fools that he was the son of the only god, that he died and came back to life that he cured blindness with lumps of clay and that he walked on water. Who would believe that nonsense? But the trouble with Loki is that he always takes his jests too far. The street outside the church was piled with weapons, shields and helmets belonging to the men who attended the enthronement. They needed to be armed, or at least to stay close to their weapons, because our scouts had come back from the Upper Mercy to tell us that Raniel's army was approaching. They had seen his campfires in the night, and dawn had brought the sight of smoke smeared across the eastern sky. By now, I reckoned, he should be discovering the remnants of Eads Byrig. He would come to Chester next, but we would see him approaching, and the neat piles of weapons and shields were ready for the men inside the church. When they heard the alarm they would have to abandon the bishop's sermon and take to the ramparts. There had been some good news that morning. Ethelston had succeeded in taking two ships from the holes Raniel had left on the Mercy's northern bank. Both were wide-bellied, high-proud fighting ships, one with benches for sixty oars and the other for forty. The rest of the ships were beached, Ethelston reported to me, and we couldn't drag them off. They weren't guarded. Probably sixty or seventy men there, Lord. How many did you have? Seven of us crossed the river, Lord. Seven? None of the others could swim. You can swim, like a herring, Lord. Ethelston and his six companions had stripped naked, and, in the dead of night, crossed the river at the height of the tide. They had managed to cut the lines of the two moored boats, which had then drifted down the Mercy and were now safely tied to the remnants of the pier at Brunnenburg. I wanted to put Ethelston back in charge of that fort, but Ethelfled insisted that Osforth, her half-brother, should command there, and that decision meant that Ethelston, poor boy, was now condemned to endure the interminable service that turned Father Leofston into Bishop Leofston. 
I peered into the church a couple of times. There was the usual chanting, while a dozen priests wafted smoke from swinging censers. An abbot with a waist-length beard gave an impassioned sermon that must have lasted two hours, and which drove me to a tavern across the street. When I next looked, I saw Leofston prostrate on the church's floor with his arms outspread. All his cripples were there, while the moon-touched lunatics gibbered and scratched at the back of the church, and the white-robed orphans fidgeted. Most of the congregation was kneeling, and I could see Ethel fled next to the bishop's wife, who, as usual, was swathed in layers of clothing and was now rocking backwards and forwards, with her clasped hands held high above her head, as though she was experiencing an ecstatic vision. It was, I thought, a sad way to celebrate Yostra's feast. I walked to the northern gate, climbed the ramparts, and stared at the empty countryside. My son joined me, but said nothing. He was in command of the guard this morning, which meant he was excused from attending the church service, and the two of us stood in companionable silence. There should have been a busy fair in this strip of pastureland between the city ditch and the Roman cemetery, but instead the few market stalls had been placed in the main street. Eostra would not be pleased, though perhaps she would be forgiving because she was not a vengeful goddess. I had heard stories of her when I was a small child, although the stories had been whispered because we were supposed to be Christians, but I heard how she skipped through the dawn, scattering flowers, and how the animals followed her two by two, and how the elves and sprites gathered around with pipes made from reeds and with drums made of thistleheads, and played their wild music as the Ostra sang the world into a new creation. She would look like Mus, I thought, remembering the firm body, the glow of her skin, the glint of joy in her eyes, and the mischief in her smile. Even the memory of her one flaw, the apple-shaped birthmark, seemed attractive now. Did you find the girl? I broke the silence. Not yet, he sounded disconsolate. We searched everywhere. You're not keeping her hidden yourself? No, father, I promise. She has to live somewhere. We've asked. We've looked. She just vanished. He made the sign of the cross. I'm thinking she doesn't really exist. That she's a night walker? Don't be an idiot, I scoffed. Of course she exists. We saw her. And you've more than seen her. But no one saw her last night, he said, and she was naked when she vanished. She took her cloak. Even so, someone would have seen her. A half-naked girl running through the streets. How could she just disappear? But she did. He paused, frowning. She's a night walker. A shadow walker. A shadow walker? I had scorned the idea, but shadow walkers did exist. They were ghosts and spirits and goblins, malevolent creatures who only appeared in the night. And Mus, I thought, was truly malevolent. She was causing trouble by setting my men against Ethelfled's warriors. And she was too perfect to be real. So was she an apparition sent by the gods to taunt us? To taunt me, anyway, as I remembered the lantern light on her plump breasts. She has to be stopped, I said unless you want a nightly battle between our men and Lady Ethelfled's. She won't appear again tonight, my son said uncertainly. She won't dare. Unless you're right, I said, and she is a shadow walker. I touched the hammer at my neck. And then I kept my hand on the talisman. Because, from the far woods, from the forest that shrouded the land all around distant Eads Byrig, Raniel's army was coming. Raniel's men came in a line, and that was impressive because the line did not trail out of the forest on the Roman road in a long procession, but instead appeared all together at the edge of the trees and so suddenly filled the land. One moment the fields were empty, then a great line of horsemen emerged from the woodlands. 
It must have taken time to arrange that display, and it was intended to awe us. One of my men hammered the iron bar that hung above the gate's fighting rampart. The bar served as a makeshift alarm bell, and its harsh sound was brutal and loud, summoning the defenders to the walls. Keep hitting it, I told him. I could see men pouring out of the church, hurrying to snatch up the shields, helmets and weapons that were stacked in the street. Five hundred of them, my son suggested. I turned back to stare at the enemy. I divided the far line into half, then half again, and counted the horses, then multiplied my answer by four. Six hundred, I reckoned. Maybe that's all the horses he has. He'll have more men, though. Two thousand at least. Six hundred horsemen were no threat to Chester, but I still kept the iron bar's clangor sounding across the town. Men were climbing the ramparts now, and Raniel would see our spear points thickening above the high stone walls. I wished he would attack. There is no easier way to kill an enemy than when he is trying to assault a well-defended rampart. He'll have been to Eads Byrig, my son suggested. He was staring eastwards to where the smoke of our corpse-burning fire still smeared the sky. He was thinking that Raniel would be enraged by the severed heads I had left to greet him, and hoping, I think, that those bloodied heads would prompt Raniel into a foolish assault on the city. He won't attack today, I said. He might be headstrong, but he's no fool. A horn sounded from that long line of men who now advanced slowly across the pastureland. The sound of the horn was as harsh as the clangor of my iron bar. I could see men on foot behind the horsemen, but even so there were not more than seven hundred enemy in sight. That was not nearly enough to assault our walls, but I was not summoning the defenders in expectation of any attack, but rather to show Raniel that we were ready for him. We were both making a display. I wish he'd make an assault, my son said wistfully. Not today. He'll lose men if he does. He was hoping I was wrong, hoping he would have a chance to kill men trying to scale stone walls. He has men to lose, I said dryly. If I was him, my son began, then checked. Go on. I wouldn't want to lose two hundred men on these walls. I'd raid deeper into Mercia. I'd go south. There are rich pickings down south, but here... I nodded. He was right, of course. To attack Chester was to assault one of Mercia's strongest fortresses, and the country around Chester would be poor territory for plunder or slaves. Folk had gone to their nearest burr, taking their families and livestock with them. We were ready for war even wanting battle, but a sudden march south into the heartland would find plump farms and easy plunder. He will raid deeper into Mercia, I said, but he still wants Chester. He won't attack today, but he will attack. Why? Because he can't be king of Britain without capturing the Burrs, I said, and because Chester is Lady Ethelfled's achievement. There are plenty of men who still think a woman shouldn't rule the land, but they can't argue with her success. She's fortified this whole district. Her husband was scared of the place. All he did was piss into the wind, but she drove the Danes out. If she does nothing else, then Chester stands as her victory. So, take this city from her, and you make her look weak. Take Chester, and you've opened up all Western Mercia to invasion. If Raniel wins here, he could destroy all Mercia, and he knows it. He won't just be king of Northumbria, but of Mercia too, and that's worth losing two hundred men. But without Eads Byrig, Losing Eads Byrig has made life difficult for him, I interrupted him, but he still needs Chester. The Irish are driving the Norse out of Ireland, and where will they go? Here. But they can't come here if we hold the rivers. Indeed, it was our failure to hold the rivers that had let Raniel into Britain in the first place. So, yes, I went on, the battle we fight here isn't just for Chester, but for everything. For Mercia, 
and in the end for Wessex too. The great line of horsemen had stopped, and a smaller group now rode towards the city. There were perhaps a hundred horsemen in the smaller group, followed by some footmen, all of them beneath two great banners. One showed the red axe of Raniel, the same symbol that his brother Seatrigger flew, but the second banner was new to me. It was a flag, a big flag, and it was black. Just that, a black flag, except it was made more sinister because the flag's trailing edge had been ripped to tattered shreds so that it blew ragged in the sea wind. Whose flag is that? I asked. Never seen it, my son said. Finnan, Mirwala and Ethelfled came to the rampart. None of them recognised the flag. What made it strange was that the flag was every bit as big as Raniel's axe, suggesting that whoever marched beneath the ragged black banner was his equal. There's a woman there, Finnan said. He had eyes like a falcon. Raniel's wife? Ethelfled asked. Could be, Mirwala said. They say he has four. It's a woman in black, Finnan said. He was shading his eyes as he peered at the approaching enemy. She's on a small horse right in front of the flag. Unless it's a priest, Mirwala suggested uncertainly. The great line of horsemen had begun beating their swords against their shields, a rhythmic and threatening sound, harsh in the day's warm sunlight. I could see the woman now. She was swathed in black, with a black hood over her head, and she rode a small black horse that was dwarfed by the stallions of the men who surrounded her. He won't have a priest with him, Finnan said. It's a woman, sure enough. Or a child, I said. The rider of the small horse was also small. The horseman stopped. They were some two hundred paces away, well beyond the distance we could hurl a spear or an axe. Some members of the feared carried bows, but they were short hunting bows that were not powerful enough to pierce mail. Such bows forced an enemy to keep his exposed face below his shield, and they were useful at very short distances, but to loose an arrow at two hundred paces was a waste, provoking the enemy to jeer. Two archers did loose, and I bellowed at them to put their weapons down. They've come to talk, I shouted, not to fight. Yet, Finnan muttered. I could see Raniel clearly enough. He was as flamboyant as ever, his long hair blowing in the wind and his inked chest bare. He kicked his stallion a few paces forward and stood in his stirrups. Lord Uhtred, he shouted, I bring you gifts. He turned back towards his standard as the men on foot threaded their way between the horses and came towards the ramparts. Oh no, Ethelfled said. No. Forty-three. I said bitterly. I did not even need to count. Play with the devil, Finnan said, and you get burned. Forty-three men carrying drawn swords were pushing forty-three prisoners towards us. The swordsmen spread into a rough line and stopped, then thrust the prisoners down onto their knees. The prisoners, all of whose hands were bound behind their backs, were mostly men, but there were women among them, women who stared in desperation at our banners that hung from the ramparts. I had no idea who the prisoners were, except they must be Saxon and Christian. They were revenge. Raniel must have been told of the forty-three heads waiting on the summit of Eads Byrig, and this was his answer. There was nothing we could do. We had manned the walls of Chester, but I had not thought to mount men on horses to make any sally out of the gate. We could only listen as the victims wailed, and only watch as the swords fell, as the bright blood splashed the morning, as the heads rolled on the thin turf.
Raniel mocked us with his handsome smile as the swordsmen wiped their blades on the clothes of their victims. And then there was one last gift, one last prisoner. That prisoner could not walk. He or she was brought draped over the back of a horse, and at first I could not see if it was a man or a woman. I could only see that it was a person dressed in white who was heaved off the horse onto the blood-wet grass. None of us spoke. Then I saw it was a man, and I thought him dead until he slowly rolled over and I saw he was dressed in the white robes of a priest. But what was strange was that the front of his skirt was panelled in bright red. Christ, Finnan breathed. Because the skirt was not panelled, it was coloured by blood. The man curled up as if to crush the pain in his groin, and at that moment the black-robed rider spurred her horse forward. She came close, careless of the threat of our throwing spears, our arrows or axes. She stopped just yards away from the ditch and pushed back the hood of her cloak and stared up at us. She was an old woman, her face lined and harsh, her hair sparse and white, her lips a thin grimace of hatred. What I did to him, she said, pointing at the wounded man lying behind her, I shall do to you, to all of you, one at a time. She suddenly produced a small curved knife. I shall geld your boys, your women shall be whores, and your children slaves, because you are cursed, all of you. She shrieked those last three words, and swept the gelding knife in a curve, as if to point to all of us watching from the ramparts. You will all die. You are cursed by day and by night, by fire and by water, by fate. She spoke our language, the English tongue. She rocked backwards and forwards in her saddle, as if gathering strength, and then she took a deep breath and pointed the knife at me. And you, Uhtred of Bebenburg, Uhtred of nothing, will die last and die slowest, because you have betrayed the gods. You are cursed. You are all cursed. She cackled then, a mad sound, before pointing the blade at me again. The gods hate you, Uhtred. You were their son. You were their favourite. You were loved by them, but you chose to use your gifts for the false god for the filthy Christian god, and now the real gods hate you and curse you. I speak to the gods. They listen to me, and they will give you to me, and I will kill you so slowly that your death will last till Ragnarok. And with that, she hurled the small knife at me. It fell short, clattering on the wall and dropping to the ditch. She turned away, and all the enemy went with her back to the trees. Who is she? Ethelfled asked, her voice scarce above a whisper. Her name, I said, is Breda. And the gilded priest turned an agonized face towards me and called for help. Father! He was my son. Lang thang trên bãi cát chiều hôm nắng nhạt vàng tình cờ ta quen nàng muôn mang trong giây lang bi 
chuyện gì sao cũng hát nghe hồn mà tình ta Part 2 The Ghost Fence Chapter 7 Breeder She was a Saxon who was raised a Christian a wild child my first lover a girl of passion and fire and breeder like me had found the older gods but where i have always accepted that the god of the christians has power like all the other gods breeder had convinced herself that the christian god was a demon and that christianity was an evil that must be eradicated if the world was ever to be good again she had married my dear friend ranya she had become more danish than the danes and she had tried to suborn me, to tempt me, to persuade me to fight for the Danes against the Saxons, and she had hated me ever since I had refused. She was a widow now, but she still ruled Rania's great fortress of Dunholm, which, after Bevenberg, was the most formidable stronghold in Northumbria. She had now sided with Raniel, and as I was later to learn her declaration of support, was enough to drive poor King Ingvar into exile. Breeder had bought Ranya's army south. She had added her men to Ranyal's, and the Northmen now had the strength to attack Chester and to accept the deaths that would soak the Roman walls with northern blood. Beware the hatred of a woman. Love curdles into hate. I had loved Breeder. But she possessed an anger I could never match, an anger she believed came directly from the rage of the gods. It had been Breeder who gave Serpent Breath her name, who had cast a spell on the sword because, even as a child, she had believed the gods spoke directly to her. She had been a black-haired girl, thin as a twig, with a fierceness that burned like the fire that had killed the elder Ranya and which we had watched together from the high trees. The only child Breeder ever bore was mine, but the boy was born dead, and she had never had another. So now her offspring were the songs she made and the curses she uttered. Ranya's father, the blind raven, had prophesied that Breeder would grow to be a scald and a sorceress, and so she had, but of the bitterest kind. She was an enchantress, white-haired and wizened now, chanting her scald songs about dead Christians and of Odin triumphant, songs of hate. What she wants, I told Ethelthed, is to take your god and nail him back to his tree. He came back to life once, she said piously, and he would rise again. I ignored that. And she wants all Britain worshipping the old gods. A stale old dream, Ethelfled said scornfully. Just because it's been dreamed before, I said, doesn't mean it can't come true. The old dream was the Northmen's vision of ruling all Britain. Again and again their armies had marched. They had invaded Mercia and Wessex. They had slaughtered the Saxons in battle. Yet they had never succeeded in taking the whole island. Ethelfled's father, King Alfred, had defeated them. He had saved Wessex, and ever since we Saxons had been fighting back, thrusting the Northmen ever further northwards. Now a new leader, stronger than any who had come before, threatened us with the old dream. For me, the war was about land. Perhaps that was because my uncle had stolen my land, had stolen the wild country around Bebenberg, and to take back that land I first needed to defeat the Danes who surrounded it. My whole life has been about that windswept fortress beside the sea, about the land that is mine and was taken from me. For King Alfred, for his son Edward, and his daughter Ethelfled, the war was also about land, about the kingdoms of the Saxons, Alfred had saved Wessex, and his daughter was now thrusting the Northmen from Mercia, while her brother, Edward of Wessex, took back the lands of East Anglia. 
but for both of them there was another cause worthy of death, their God. They fought for the Christian God, and in their minds the land belonged to their God, and they would only reclaim it by doing his will. England, King Alfred had once said, will be God's land. If it exists, it will exist because of him, because he wishes it. For a time he had even called it Godland, but the name had not stuck. For Breeder, there was only one cause, her hatred of that Christian god. For her, the war was a battle between the gods, between truth and falsehood, and she would happily have allowed the Saxons to kill every Northman if only they would abandon their religion and turn back to the old gods of Asgard. And now, at last, she had found a champion who would use sword and spear and axe to fight for her gods. And Raniel? I doubt he cared about the gods. He wanted land, all of it and he had wanted Breeders' hardened warriors to come from their stronghold at Dunholm to add their blades to his army. And my son? My son. I had disowned him, disinherited him, and spurned him, and now he had been returned to me by an enemy, and he was no longer a man. He was gelded. The blood on his gown was crusted. He's dying, Bishop Leofston said sadly, and made the sign of the cross over Uhtred's pale face. His name had been Uhtred, the name always given to the eldest son of our family, but I had taken the name from him when he became a Christian priest. I had named him Judas instead, though he called himself Oswald. Father Oswald, famous for his honesty and piety, and famous too for being my son, my prodigal son. Now I knelt beside him and called him by his old name. Uhtred. Uhtred. But he could not answer. There was sweat on his forehead and he was shivering. After that one despairing cry of, Father, he seemed unable to speak. He tried, but no words came, just a whimper of excruciating pain. He's dying, Bishop Leaveston said again. He has the death fever, Lord. Then save him, I snarled. Save him? That's what you do, isn't it? Heal the goddamned sick, so heal him. He stared at me, suddenly frightened. My wife, he began, then faltered. What of her? She heals the sick, Lord, he said. She has the touch of God in her hands. It is her calling, Lord. Then take him to her. Folkbold, one of my Frisian warriors, and a man of prodigious strength, lifted Uhtred in his arms like a baby, and so we took him into the city, following the bishop, who scurried ahead. He led us to one of the more substantial Roman houses on the main street, a house with a deep-arched gateway leading into a pillared courtyard, from which a dozen doors led into large rooms. It was not unlike my own house in Chester, and I was about to make some scornful remark about the bishop's taste for luxury, when I saw that the arcade around the courtyard was filled with sick folk lying on straw pallets. There's not room for them all inside, the bishop explained, then watched as the crippled gatekeeper picked up a short metal bar and struck a second bar that was hanging from the gateway ceiling. Like my alarm bell, it made a harsh sound, and the gatekeeper went on striking it, and I saw robed and hooded women scurrying away into the shadowed doorways. The sisters have abjured the company of men, the bishop explained, unless the men are sick, dying, or wounded. They're nuns, I asked. They are a lay sisterhood, he said, and one close to my heart. Most are poor women who wish to dedicate their lives to God's service, 
while others among them are sinners. He made the sign of the cross. Fallen women. He paused as though unable to bring himself to say the next words. D women of the streets, Lord. Of the alleyways. But all of them, dear creatures, we have brought back to God's grace. Whores, you mean? Fallen women, Lord, yes. And you live here with them? I asked sarcastically. Oh, no, Lord. He was amused rather than offended by the question. That would not be seemly. Dear me, no. My dear wife and I have a small dwelling in the alley behind the smithy. Praise God, I am not sick, dying or wounded. The gatekeeper finally put the small iron bar down, and the last echo of the clangour died away as a tall, gaunt woman stalked across the courtyard. She had broad shoulders, a grim face and hands like shovels. Leofston was a tall man, but this woman towered over him. Bishop? she demanded harshly. She faced Leofston squarely, arms crossed, glaring down at him. Sister Immer? Leofston said humbly as he pointed to the blood-drenched figure in Folkbold's arms. Here is a grievously wounded priest. He needs my wife's care. Sister Immer, who looked as if she might be useful in a shield wall, looked around and finally pointed to a corner of the arcade. There's space over... He will be given his own room, I interrupted her, and a bed. He will have his own room and a bed, I repeated harshly, unless you want my men to scour this damned place clear of Christians. I command in this town, woman, not you. Sister Immer bridled, and wanted to protest, but the bishop placated her. We shall find room, sister. You'll need room, I said. In the next week you'll have at least a hundred more wounded. I turned and poked a finger at Cedric. Find space for the bishop. Two houses, three. Space for the wounded. Wounded? Leofston asked, concerned. There's going to be a fight, bishop. I told him angrily, and it won't be pretty. A room was cleared, and my son was carried across the courtyard and through a narrow door into a small chamber where he was placed gently on a bed. He muttered something, and I stooped to listen, but his words made no sense, and then he curled himself by drawing up his legs and whimpered. Heal him, I snarled at Sister Emma. If it is God's will. It's my will. Sister Gomer will tend him, the bishop told Sister Emma, who, it seemed, was the one sister allowed to confront men, a task she evidently undertook with relish. Sister Gomer is your wife? I asked, remembering the strange name. Please God she is, Leofston said, and a dear darling creature she is too. With a strange name... I said, staring at my son, who moaned on the bed, still curled around his agony. The bishop smiled. She was named Sungifu by her mother, but when the dear sisters are born again into Christ Jesus, they are given a new name, a baptismal name, and so my dear Sungifu is now known as Sister Gomer, and with her new name, God granted her the power of healing. He did. Indeed, Sister Immer said grimly. And she will tend him, the bishop assured me, and we shall pray for him. As will I, I said, and touched the hammer hanging at my neck. I left. I turned at the gate and saw the cloaked, hooded sisters scurry out of their hiding places. Two went into my son's room, and I fingered the hammer again. I had thought I hated my eldest son, but I did not. And so I left him there, lying tight about his cruel wound, and he shivered and he sweated and he moaned strange things in his fever. But he did not die that day, nor the next. And I took revenge. The gods loved me, 
because that evening they sent grim clouds rolling from the west. They were sky-darkening clouds, heavy and black, and they came suddenly, building higher, looming in the evening sky to shroud the sunset, and with the clouds came rain and wind. Those grim clouds also brought opportunity, and with the opportunity came argument. The argument raged inside Chester's great hall, while the paved Roman street outside was loud with the noise of horses. It was the noise of great war stallions crushing their hooves on stone paving, horses whinnying and snorting as men struggled to saddle the beasts in the seething rain. I was assembling horsemen, warriors of the storm. It will leave Chester undefended, Mirwala protested. The feared will defend the city, I said. The feared needs household warriors, Mirwala insisted. He rarely disagreed with me. Indeed, he had always been one of my strongest supporters, even when he had served Ethelred, who had hated me. But my proposal that stormy night alarmed Mirwala. The feared can fight, he allowed, but they need trained men to help them. The city won't be attacked, I snarled. Thunder crashed across the night sky to send the dogs that lived in the great hall slinking off to the dark corners. The rain was beating on the roof and leaking through a score of places in the old Roman tiles. Why else has Raniel returned? Ethelfled asked, if not to attack us. He won't attack tonight and he won't attack tomorrow, I said, which gives us a chance to claw the bastard. I was dressed for battle. I wore a knee-length leather jerkin beneath my finest mail coat that was cinched by a thick sword belt from which hung serpent breath. My leather trues were tucked into tall boots reinforced by iron strips. My forearms were thick with warrior rings. Godric, my servant, held my wolf-crested helmet, a thick hafted spear, and my shield with the snarling wolf's head of Bebenberg painted on the iron-bound willow boards. I was dressed for a killing, and most in the hall were shrinking from the prospect. Kinlaf Haraldson, Ethelfled's young favourite, who was rumoured to be marrying her daughter, sided with Mirwala. So far he had taken care to avoid antagonising me, using flattery and agreement to avoid any confrontation, but what I was now suggesting drove him to disagreement. What has changed, Lord? he asked respectfully. Changed? When Ragnar was here before, you were reluctant to lead men into the forest. You feared ambush, Mirwala put in. His men were in Eidsbyrig, I said. It was his refuge, his fortress. What was the point of leading men through ambush to die on its walls? He still has, Kinlaf began. No, he doesn't, I snapped. We didn't know the walls were false. We thought it was a fortress. Now it's just a hilltop. He outnumbers us, Mirwala said unhappily. And he always will outnumber us, I said, until we kill enough of his men and then we'll outnumber him. The safe thing, Ethelfled began, then faltered. She sat in the great chair, a throne really, lit by the flickering fire in the central hearth. She had been listening carefully, her eyes looking from speaker to speaker, her face worried. Priests were gathered behind her and they too thought my plans rash. The safe thing, I prompted her, but she just shook her head as if to suggest she had thought better of whatever she had been about to say. The safe thing, Father Chulnoth said firmly, is to make certain Chester does not fall. Men murmured agreement, and Father Cholnoth, emboldened by the support, stepped forward to stand in the firelight beside Ethelfled's chair. Chester is our newest diocese. It controls great areas of farmland. It protects the seaway. It is a bulwark against the Welsh. It protects Mercia from the pagan north. It must not be lost. He stopped abruptly maybe remembering the savagery with which I usually greeted military advice from priests. Take note of the bulwark, his brother lisped through his missing teeth. 
that you can tell it to the next generation. I stared at him, wondering if he had lost his brains along with his teeth. But the other priests all muttered and nodded approval. The words of the psalmist, blind Father Cuthbert explained to me. Cuthbert was the one priest who supported me, but then he had always been eccentric. We cannot tell the next generation, Father Chulbert hissed, if the bulwarks are lost. We must protect the bulwarks. We cannot abandon Chester's walls. It is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord, Chulnath said. Kinlaf smiled at me. Only a fool ignores your advice, he said with patronizing flattery. And the defeat of Raniel is our aim, of course, but the protection of Chester is just as important. And to leave the walls undefended, Mirwala said unhappily, but did not finish the thought. Another rumble of thunder sounded. Rain was pouring through the hole in the roof and hissing in the hearth. God speaks, Father Chalmuth said. Which God? Thor was the god of thunder. I was tempted to remind them of that, but saying as much would only antagonise them. We must shelter from the storm, Chalbert said, and the thunder is the sign that we must stay within these walls. We should stay, Ethelfled began, but then was interrupted. Forgive me, Bishop Leifston said, dear lady, Please forgive me. Ethelfled looked indignant at the interruption, but managed a gracious smile. Bishop? What did our Lord say? The bishop asked as he limped to the open space by the hearth where rain spattered on his robe. Did our Lord say that we should stay at home? Did he encourage us to crouch by the cottage fire? Did he tell his disciples to close the door and huddle by the hearth? No, he sent his followers forth, two by two. And why? Because he gave them power over the overpowering enemy. He spoke passionately, and with astonishment, I realised he was supporting me. The kingdom of heaven is not spread by staying at home, the bishop said fervently, but by going forth as our Lord commanded. Saint Mark, a very young priest ventured. Well spoken, Father Albert, the bishop said. The commandment is indeed found in the gospel of Mark. Another peal of thunder crashed in the night. The wind was rising howling in the dark as the whole dogs whined. The rain was falling harder now, glinting in the firelight where it slanted down to hiss in the bright flames. We are commanded to go forth, the bishop said, to go forth and conquer. Bishop, Kinlaf began, the ways of the Lord are strange, Leofstan ignored Kinlaf. I cannot explain why our God has blessed us with the Lord Uhtred's presence, but one thing I do know. The Lord Uhtred wins battles. He is a mighty warrior for the Lord. He paused suddenly, flinching, and I remembered the sudden pains that assailed him. For a moment he looked in agony, one hand clutched to the robe above his heart. Then the pain vanished from his face. Is anyone here a greater warrior than the Lord Uhtred? He asked. If so, let them stand up. Most of the men were already standing, but they seemed to know what Leifston meant. Does anyone here know more of war than Lord Uhtred? Is there anyone here who strikes more fear into the enemy? He paused, waiting, but no one spoke or stirred. I do not deny that he is grievously mistaken about our faith, that he is in need of God's grace and of Christ's forgiveness, but God has sent him to us and we must not reject the gift. He bowed to Ethelfled. My lady, forgive my humble opinions, 
but I urge you to listen to the Lord Uhtred. I could have kissed him. Ethelfled looked about the hall. A spike of lightning lit the roof hole, followed by a monstrous clap of thunder that shook the sky. Men shuffled to their feet, but no one spoke to contradict the bishop. Mirhwala, Ethelfled stood to show that the discussion was finished. You will stay in the city with one hundred men. All the rest... She hesitated for a moment, glancing at me, then made her decision. We'll ride with Lord Uhtred. We leave two hours before dawn, I said. Vengeance is mine, the bishop said happily. He was wrong. It was mine. We were leaving Chester to attack Raniel. I led almost eight hundred men into the darkness. We rode out through the north gate into a storm as wild as any I remembered. Thunder filled the sky, lightning splintered across the clouds, the rain seethed and the wind howled like the shrieks of the damned. I led my men and Ethelfled's men, the warriors of Mercia, soldiers of the storm, all mounted on good stallions all in mail and armed with swords, spears, and axes. Bishop Leiston had stood on the gate's rampart, shouting blessings down on us, his voice snatched away by the gale. You do God's work, he had called. The Lord is with you. His blessing is upon you. The Lord's work was to break Raniel. And of course it was a risk. Maybe even now Raniel's warriors were filing through the wet darkness towards Chester, carrying ladders and readying themselves to fight and die on a Roman wall. But probably not. I needed neither omens nor scouts to tell me that Raniel was not ready to assault Chester yet. Raniel had moved fast. He had taken his large army and lunged towards Eofawick, and that city, key to the north, had fallen without a fight and so Raniel had turned back to make his assault on Chester. His men had marched unceasingly. They were tired. They had reached Eads Byrig to find it blood-soaked and ruined, and now they faced a Roman fort packed with defenders. They needed a day or two, more even, to ready themselves, to make the ladders, and to find forage, and to allow the laggards to catch up with the army. Mirhuala and the others were right, of course. The easiest and safest way to preserve Chester was to stay inside the high walls and let Raniel's men die against the stones. And they would die. Much of the feared had arrived, bringing their axes, hoes, and spears. They had brought their families and livestock too, so the streets were filled with cattle, pigs, and sheep. The walls of Chester would be well defended, though that would not stop Raniel making an attempt to cross the ramparts. But if we just stayed inside the walls and waited for that attempt, we would yield all the surrounding countryside to his mercy. He would make an assault, and the assault would probably fail, but such was the size of his army that he could afford that failure and attack again and all the time his troops would be raiding deep into Mercia, burning and killing, taking slaves and capturing livestock, and Ethelfled's army would be locked into Chester, helpless to defend the land it was sworn to protect. So I wanted to drive him away from Chester. I wanted to hit him hard now. I wanted to hit him in the dark of the night's ending, hit him in the thunder of Thor's providential storm, hit him under the lash of Thor's lightning, strike him in the wind and the rain of the gods. I would bring him chaos. He had hoped to have Eads Byrig as a refuge, but he had no refuge now except for the shields of his men, and those men would be cowering in the storm, chilled and tired and we rode to kill them. And to kill Breeder. I thought of my son, my gelded son, lying curled on his bed of pain, and I touched Serpent Breath's hilt 
and I promised myself her blade would taste blood before the sun was risen. I wanted to find Breeder, the sorceress who had cut my son, and I swore I would make that vile creature scream till her voice drowned out even Thor's loud thunder. Kinla fled Ethelfled's men. I would have preferred Mirwala, but Ethelfled wanted someone reliable to guard Chester's walls, and she had insisted Merhwala stayed, and sent Kinlaf in his place. She had told her favourite that he was to obey me. Ethelfled, of course, had wanted to come herself, and for once I had won that argument, telling her that the chaos of a fight in the half-light of a storm-ridden dawn was no place for her. It will be a killing, my lady, I had told her. Nothing but killing. And if you're there, I'll have to give you a bodyguard, and those men can't join the slaughter. I need them all, and I don't need to be worrying whether you're safe or not. She had reluctantly accepted the argument, sending Kinlaf in her place, and he now rode close to me, saying nothing. We went slowly. We could not hurry. The only light came from the intermittent flashes of lightning that streaked to earth and silvered the sky, but I did not need light. What we did was simple. We would make chaos, and to make it we only needed to reach the forest's edge and wait there until the first faint wolf light of dawn revealed the trees among the night's shadows and so let us ride safely to a slaughter. A bolt of lightning showed when we reached the end of the pastureland. In front of us all was black, trees and bushes and ghosts. We stopped, and the rain pounded about us. Finnan moved his horse next to mine. I could hear his saddle creaking and the thump as his stallion pawed the wet ground. Make sure they're well spread out, I said. They are, Finnan responded. I had ordered the horsemen to form eight groups. Each would advance on its own, careless of what the others did. We were a rake with eight tines, a rake to claw through the forest. The only rules of the morning were that the groups were to kill, they were to avoid the inevitable shield wall that would eventually form, and they were to obey the sound of the horn when it called for withdrawal. I planned to be back in Chester for breakfast unless the enemy knew we were coming, unless their sentries had seen us approach, had seen us silvered in the wet darkness by the bright streaks of Thor's lightning, unless they were already touching iron-rimmed shields together to make a shield wall that would be our death. It is during the time of waiting that the mind crawls into a coward's cave and whines to be spared. I thought of all that could go wrong and felt the temptation to be safe, to take the troops back to Chester and man the walls and let the enemy die in a furious assault. No one would blame me, and if Raniel died beneath Chester's stones, then his death would provide another song of Uhtred that would be chanted in mead halls across all Mercia. I touched the hammer hanging at my neck. All along the forest's edge, Men were touching their talismans, saying prayers to their god or gods, feeling the creep of fear chill their bones more thoroughly than the soaking rain and gusting wind. Almost, Finnan said in a low voice. Almost, I answered. The wolf light is the light between dark and light, between the night and the dawn, there are no colours, just the grey of a sword blade, of mist, the grey that swallows the ghosts and elves and goblins. Foxes seek their dens, badgers go to earth, and the owl flies home. Another bellow of thunder shook the sky, and I looked up, the rain pelting on my face, and I prayed to Thor and to Odin. I do this for you, I said for your amusement. The gods watch us, they reward us, and sometimes they punish us. At the foot of Yggdrasil the three hags were watching and smiling, 
and were they sharpening the shears? I thought of Ethelfled, sometimes so cold, and sometimes so desperate for warmth. She hated Edith, who was so loyal to me, and so loving, and so fearful of Ethelfled. And I thought of Mus, that creature of the dark who drove men wild. And I wondered if she feared anyone, and was instead a messenger from the gods. I looked back to the woods, and could see the shape of trees now, dark in the darkness, see the slash of rain. Almost, I said again. In the name of God, Finnan muttered. I saw him make the sign of the cross. If you see my brother, he said louder, he's mine. If I see your brother, I promised, he's yours. Godric had offered me the heavy spear, but I preferred a sword, and so I pulled Serpent Breath from her scabbard and held her straight out, and I could see the sheen of her blade like a shimmer of misted light in the dark. A horse whinnied. I raised the blade and kissed the steel. For Eostra, I said. For Eostra and for Mercia. And the shadows beneath the trees dissolved into shapes, into bushes and trunks, of leaves thrashing in the wind. It was still night, but the wolf light had come. Let's go, I said to Finnan then raised my voice to a shout. Let's go! The time for hiding was over. Now it was speed and noise. I crouched in the saddle, wary of low branches, letting Tintrig pick his own way, but urging him on. The small light grew. The rain was beating on the leaves. The woods were full of the noise of horses. The wind was tossing high branches like mad things in torment. I waited to hear a horn calling to summon our enemies, but none sounded. Lightning flickered to the north, casting stark black shadows among the trees. Then the thunder sounded, and just then I saw the first pale light of a fire ahead. Campfires. Raniel's men were in the clearings, and if he had set sentries they had not seen us, or we had passed them, and the flicker of fires fighting the drenching rain became brighter. I saw shadows among the fires. Some men were awake, presumably feeding the flames, and oblivious that we were riding to their deaths. Then, far off to my right, where the Roman road led into the forest, I heard shouts, and I knew our killing had begun. That dawn was savage. Ranul had thought we were sheltering behind Chester's walls, cowed there by his killings on Eostra's feast. But instead we burst on his men, coming with the thunder, and they were not ready. I crashed out of the trees into a wide clearing and saw miserable shelters hastily made from branches, and a man crawled from one, looked up and took serpent breath in his face. The blade struck bone, jarred up my arm, and another man was running and I speared him in the back with the sword's tip. All around me horsemen were wounding and killing. Keep going, I bellowed, keep going! This was just one encampment in a clearing. The main camp was still ahead. A glow above the dark trees showed where fires were lit on the summit of Eads Byrig, and I rode that way. Back into the trees. The light was growing, shrouded by storm clouds, but ahead I could see the wide swathe of land cleared of trees that surrounded the slopes of Eads Byrig, and it was there, among the stumps, that most of Raniel's men were camped, and it was there we killed them. We burst from the woods with bloodied swords, and we rode among the panicked men, and we cut them down. Women screamed, children cried. My son led men from my right, slicing into fugitives fleeing from our swords, Tintrick thumped into a man, throwing him down into a fire that erupted sparks. His hair caught the flames. He shrieked, and I backhanded Serpent Breath to chop down another man running with wide eyes, his mail coat in his arms, and ahead of me a warrior bellowed defiance 
and waited with a spear for my charge, and then turned, hearing hooves behind him, and died under a Frisian axe that clove his skull. Newly woken men were scrambling through the first ditch and all over the earth wall, and a horn was now sounding from the old fort's summit. I spurred into a group of men, slashing serpent breath down savagely as Godric rode in with his levelled spear to slice a man's belly open. Tintrig snapped at a man, biting his face, then plunged on as thunder ripped the sky above us. Berg galloped past me, whooping, with a length of entrails dragging from his sword. He chopped the weapon down, turned his horse, and chopped again. The man Tintrig had bitten reeled away, hands clutched to his ruined face and blood seeping through his fingers. The brightest thing in that wolf light was not the fires, but the blood of enemies reflecting the sudden glare of lightning. I spurred towards the entrance of the ruined fort and saw a shield wall had formed across the track there. Men were running to join it, pushing their way into the ranks and lining their round shields to make the wall wider. Banners flew above them, but the flags were so soaked by rain that even that dawn's strong wind could not lift them. My son spurred past me, riding for the track, and I called him back. Leave them! There were at least a hundred men guarding the entrance path. Horses could not break them. I was certain Raniel was there, as was Breeder, both beneath their waterlogged banners. But their deaths must wait for another day. We had come to kill, not to fight against a shield wall. I had told my men that each had only to kill one man, and that killing would almost halve Raniel's army. We were wounding more than we were killing, but a wounded man is more trouble to an enemy than a dead man. A corpse can be buried or burned, he can be mourned and abandoned, but the wounded need care. The sight of men with missing eyes, or with bellies welling blood, or with splintered bones showing through flesh will give fear to an enemy. A wounded army is a slow army, full of terror. And we slowed Raniel even more by driving his horses back into the forest. We drove women and children too, encouraging them by killing any that defied us. Raniel's men would know their women folk were in our hands, and their children were destined for our slave markets. War is not kind, but Raniel had brought war to Mercia in expectation that a land ruled by a woman would be easy to conquer. Now he was discovering just how easy. I watched Kinlaf hunt down three men, all armed with spears and all trying to gut his horse before killing him. He dealt with them easily, using his skills as a horseman as well as his swordcraft to wound two and kill the third. Impressive, Fennin said grudgingly as we watched the young West Saxon turn his stallion, cut fast with his blade to open a man's arm from elbow to shoulder, then use the horse's weight to drive the last enemy down to the turf, where he casually finished him off by leaning from the saddle and stabbing. Kinlaf saw we had watched him and grinned at us. "'Good hunting this morning, lord,' he called. "'Sound the horn,' I told Godric, who was grinning because he had killed and survived. It was time to leave. We had ripped Raniel's encampments apart, soaked the wolf light in blood, and hurt the enemy grievously. Bodies lay among the campfires that now died under the lash of rain. A good part of Raniel's army had survived, and those men were on the summit of Eadsbyrig, where they could only watch as our rampaging horsemen hunted down the last few survivors from the lower encampments. I gazed through the pelting downpour, and I thought I saw Raniel standing next to a diminutive figure cloaked in black, and that could have been Breeder. My brother's there, Finnan said bitterly. You can see him. See him and smell him. He rammed his sword back into its scabbard. Another day. I'll kill him yet. We turned away. We had come. We had killed. And now we left. 
driving horses, women and children ahead of us through the storm-drenched forest. No one pursued us. Raniel's men, imbued with confidence because of their leader's arrogance, had been sheltering from the storm, and we had come with the thunder, and now left with the dawn. We lost eleven men. Just eleven. Two, I know, drove their horses across the ditches and up into the shield wall on Eads Byrig's summit, but the rest? I never discovered what happened to those nine men, but it was a small price to pay for the havoc we had inflicted on Raniel's army. We had killed or wounded three or four hundred men, and once back in Chester, we discovered we had captured one hundred and seventeen horses, sixty-eight women and ninety-four children. Even Cholbert and Cholnoth, the priests whose hatred for me was so fierce, stood applauding as the captives were driven through the gate. "'Praise God!' Father Cholnoth exclaimed. "'Praise him in the highest!' his brother hissed through missing teeth. A captive woman screamed at him, and he stepped forward to slap her hard about the head. "'You're the fortunate woman!' he told her. "'You are in God's hands. You will be a Christian now.' "'All the little ones brought to Christ!' Bishop Leofston exclaimed, looking eagerly at the crying children. "'Brought to Frankish slave markets,' Fennan muttered. I dropped from Tintrig's saddle, unbuckled the sword-belt, and gave serpent breath to Godric. "'Clean it well,' I told him, "'and grease it. Then find Father Gladwine and send him to me.' Godric stared at me. "'You want a priest?' he asked in disbelief. "'I want Father Gladwine,' I said. "'So fetch him.' Then I went to find breakfast." Father Gladwine was one of Ethelfled's priests, a young man with a high, pale forehead and a perpetual frown. He was said to be learned, the product of one of King Alfred's schools in Wessex, and Ethelfled used him as a clerk. He wrote her letters, copied her laws, and drew up land charters, but his reputation went far beyond such menial duties. He was a poet, famed for the hymns he composed. Those hymns were chanted by monks in church and by harpists in halls, and I had been forced to listen to some, mainly when harpists sang in Ethelfled's palace. I had expected them to be dull, but Father Gladwine liked his songs to tell stories, and, despite my distaste, I had enjoyed listening. One of his better songs told of the woman blacksmith who had forged the nails used to crucify the nailed god. There had been three nails and three curses, the first of which resulted in one of her children being eaten by a wolf, the second doomed her husband to drowning in a Galilean cesspit, and the third gave her the shaking disease and turned her brain to pottage, all of which evidently proved the power of the Christian God. It was a good story, and that was why I summoned Gladwine, who looked as if his own brain had been turned to pottage when he came to the courtyard of my house where Godwin was plunging my mail coat into a barrel. The water had turned pink. That's blood, I told the nervous Gladwine. Yes, Lord, he stammered. Pagan blood. God be praised, he began, then remembered I was a pagan. That you live, Lord? he added hastily and cleverly. I struggled out of the leather jerkin that I wore beneath the mail coat. It stank. The courtyard was full of petitioners, but it always was. Men came for justice, for favours, or simply to remind me that they existed. Now they waited in the shelter of the roofed walkway that edged the courtyard. It still rained, though much of the storm's malevolence had faded. I saw Gerbrut, the big Frisian among the petitioners. He was forcing a prisoner to his knees. I did not recognize the man, but assumed he was one of Ethelfled's men who had been caught stealing. Gerbrut caught my eye and began to speak. Later, I told him, and looked back to the pale priest. You, 
will write a song, Gladwine. Yes, Lord. A song of Eads Byrig. Of course, Lord. This song will tell how Raniel the Sea King, Raniel the Cruel, came to Chester and was defeated there. He was defeated, Lord, Gladwine repeated. He blinked as the rain fell into his eyes. You will tell how his men were cut down, how his women were captured and his children enslaved. Enslaved, Lord, he nodded. And how the men of Mercia carried their blades to an enemy and made them crawl in the mud. The mud, Lord. It will be a song of triumph, Gladwine. Of course, Lord, he said, frowning, then looked nervously around the courtyard. But don't you have your own poets, Lord? Your harpists? And what will my poets chant of Eads Byrig? He fluttered his ink-stained hands, wondering what answer I wanted. They will tell of your victory, Lord, of course, and that's what I don't want, I interrupted him. This will be a song of Lady Ethelfled's victory, you understand? Leave me out of it. Say the Lady Ethelfled led the men of Mercia to their slaughter of the pagans. Say your God led her and inspired her and gave her the triumph. My God? he asked, astonished. I want a Christian poem, you idiot. You want a... the idiot began, then bit off the rest of his question. The Lady Ethelfled's triumph, yes, Lord. And Prince Ethelston, I said, mention him too. Ethelston had ridden with my son and acquitted himself well. Yes, Lord, Prince Ethelston too. He killed scores. Say that, that Ethelston made corpses of the pagans. This is a song of Ethelfled and Ethelston. You don't even need to mention my name. You can say I stayed in Chester with a sore toe. A sore toe, Lord, Gladwine repeated, frowning. You want this victory ascribed to Almighty God? And to Ethelfled, I insisted. And it's Easter tide, Gladwine said, almost to himself. The Ostra's feast, I corrected him. I can say it is the Easter victory, Lord. He sounded excited. It can be whatever you like, I snarled. But I want that song chanted in every hall. I want it shouted in Wessex, heard in East Anglia, told to the Welsh and sung in Francia. Make it good, priest. Make it bloody. Make it exciting. Of course, Lord. The song of Raniel's defeat, I said. Though, of course, Raniel was not defeated. Not yet. More than half his army remained, and that half probably still outnumbered us but he had been shown to be vulnerable. He had come across the sea and he had taken most of Northumbria with speed and daring, and the stories of those exploits would spread until men believed that Raniel was fated to be a conqueror. So now was the time to tell folk that Raniel could be beaten and that he would be beaten. And it was better that it was Ethelfled who was shown to be Raniel's doom, because many men would not allow songs of Uhtred to be sung in their halls. I was a pagan. They were Christian. They would hear Gladwine's song, though, which would give the nailed god all the credit and take away some of the fear of Raniel. And there were still fools who thought a woman should not rule, so let the fools hear a song about a woman's triumph. I gave Gladwine gold. Like most poets, he claimed he invented his songs because he had no choice. I never asked to be a poet, he had told me once, but the words just come to me, Lord. They come from the Holy Ghost. He is my inspiration. That might have been true, though I noticed the Holy Ghost was a lot more inspiring when it smelt gold or silver. Right well, I told him, 
then waved him away. The moment that Gladwine scuttled to the gate, all the petitioners surged forward to be checked by my spearmen. I nodded to Gerbrut. You're next. Gerbrut kicked his prisoner towards me. He's a Norseman, Lord, he said. One of Ranyos scum. Then why does he have both his hands? I asked. We had taken some men prisoner along with the women and children, and I had ordered their sword hands chopped off before we let them go. He should be back at Eid's by rig, I said, with a bloody stump for a wrist. I took a pot of ale from one of the maids and drank it all. When I looked back, I saw that the prisoner was crying. He was a good-looking man, maybe in his middle twenties, with a battle-scarred face and cheeks marked with inked axes. I was used to boys crying, but the prisoner was a hard-looking man and he was sobbing. That intrigued me. Most men face mutilation bravely or with defiance, but this man was weeping like a child. Wait, I told Gebrut, who had drawn a knife. I wasn't going to chop him here, Gebrut protested. Not here. Your lady Edith doesn't like blood all over the courtyard. Remember that sow we butchered at Yule? She wasn't happy at all. He kicked the sobbing prisoner. And we didn't capture this one in the dawn fight, Lord. He only just arrived. He only just arrived? He rode his horse to the gate, Lord. There were bastards chasing him, but he got here first. Then we won't chop him or kill him, I said, yet. I used my boot to raise the prisoner's chin. Tell me your name. Vida, Lord, he said trying to control his sobs. Norse? Dane? Norse, Lord. Why are you here, Vida? He took a huge breath. Gerbrut evidently thought he would not answer and slapped him around the head. My wife, Vida said hurriedly. Your wife? My wife, he said again, and his face crumpled into grief. My wife, Lord. He seemed incapable of saying anything else. Leave him alone, I told Gebrut, who was about to hit the prisoner again. Tell me about your wife, I ordered Vida. She's your prisoner, Lord. So? His voice was little more than a whisper. She's my wife, Lord. And you love her, I asked harshly. Yes, Lord. God in his heaven, Gebrut mocked. He loves her. She's probably been... Quiet, I snarled. I looked at Vida. Who has your oath? Yalranyal, Lord. So what do you expect me to do? Give you back your wife and let you go? He shook his head. No, Lord... A man who breaks his oath, I said, can't be trusted. I swore an oath to a scuttler too, Lord. A scuttler? She's your wife? Yes, Lord. And that oath is greater than the one to Jarl Ranyal? He knew the answer to that, and did not want to say it aloud, so instead he raised his head to look at me. I love her, Lord, he pleaded. He sounded pathetic, and he knew it, but he had been driven to this humiliation by love. A woman can do that. They have power. We might all say that the oath to our Lord is the strong oath that guides our lives, the oath that binds us and rules all the other oaths, but few men would not abandon every oath under the sun for a woman. I have broken oaths. I am not proud of that, but almost every oath I broke was for a woman. Give me one reason I should not have you taken to the ditch and killed, I said to Vida. He said nothing. Or oh, have you sent back to Jarl Raniel? I added. We dare not admit that women have such power, and so I was harsh with him. 
he just shook his head, not knowing how to answer me. Gerbrut leered happily, but then Vida tried one last desperate appeal. I know why your son came to Ranyo. My son? The priest, Lord. He gazed up at me, despair on his face. I said nothing, and he mistook that silence for anger. The priest the sorceress cut, Lord, he added in a low voice. I know what she did to him, I said. His face dropped. Spare me, Lord, he almost whispered the words, and I will serve you. He had intrigued me. I lifted his head with my right hand. Why did my son go to Raniel? I asked. He was an emissary of peace, Lord. An emissary? I asked. That made little sense. From whom? From Ireland, Lord, he said in a tone suggesting he thought I already knew. From your daughter. For a moment I was too astonished to speak. I just stared at him. The rain fell on his face, but I was oblivious of the weather. Stiora, I finally asked. Why would she send an emissary for peace? Because they're at war, Lord. They? Raniel and his brother. I still just stared at him. Vida opened his mouth to say more, but I silenced him by shaking my head. So Seatrigger was Raniel's enemy too. My son-in-law was an ally. I shouted to Godric. Bring me serpent breath, now. He gave me the sword. I looked into Vida's eyes, raised the blade and saw him flinch, then I brought the weapon down hard so that her tip stuck into the soft earth between two of the paving stones. I clasped my hands around the hilt. Swear loyalty to me, I ordered him. He put his hands around mine and swore to be my man, to be loyal to me, to serve me, to die for me. Find him a sword, I commanded Gebrut and a coat of mail, a shield, and his wife. Then I went to find my son, my eldest son. Weird bithful arad. <laughs>